Hi, I'm USA Today best-selling author Jennifer Youngblood. Thanks for joining me as I present Weddings, Lace, and Cake in the Face from my Good Girls Don't Come Last rom-com series. This unique video book featuring original video footage has been made especially for YouTube and is only available to enjoy here on my channel. Skeet was a hoot to write. She's so endearing with how she often mixes up her words. As I was getting into her character, an interesting thing happened. I found myself mixing up words. Skeet is fun, zany, and absolutely terrified to fall in love with her best friend Jasper, who happens to be a hunky firefighter. In the words of Skeet, What's Jasper's deal? He already told me in no uncertain terms that I'm not his type. I got the memo loud and clear. I'm moving on. I mean it. No backsliding, no drooping or er, drooling over his cut muscles or crooked grin. And most important, zero fantasizing about how it would be if the two of us could become more than friends. Get ready. This small town romp is packed with lots of misunderstanding, hair pulling angst, and love and laughter. You might even shed a tear or two along the way. Be sure and take a second to like the video and subscribe to my channel. Weddings, Lace, and Cake in the Face Good Girls Don't Come Last Written by Jennifer Youngblood Narrated by Lori West Chapter 1 One of the things I love most about baking is how if you follow the recipe with exactness, you can pretty much count on the loaf of bread coming out dang near perfect every time. If only my life were that simple. I wish somebody would have told me when I was a kid that the fateful day I decided to play truth or dare would ultimately lead to my recipe for disaster. You might be asking, how did this come about? I'll tell you right now that it all boils down to statistics. For example, do you know how many dogs get killed by cars each year? I read an article online that puts the number somewhere in the neighborhood of one million. Yikes! That's a lot of dead dogs and sad owners. The article had a number of suggestions for how to avoid the heartache of losing your dog. I know a surefire way that you can avoid any grief. Don't get a dog. I avoid a slew of pesky problems by analyzing the situation and taking every precaution to keep myself out of a bad spot. For example, the one thing I can't say no to is a fresh out of the oven gooey chocolate chip cookie. So what do I do? I clog afterward to burn up the calories. If an average cookie has anywhere between 80 to 100 calories, and if I can burn 400 calories for an hour's worth of clogging, that means that 25 minutes should do the trick. By following this regimen, I can eat a cookie a day without worrying that what goes in my lips will end up on my hips. As you've probably already guessed, this really isn't about cookies or weight gain or even owning a dog. Jasper tells me that my fixation on what could go wrong keeps me from living a full, productive life. A few weeks ago, I would have argued to the death that he was wrong. Now, however, well, I'm not so sure. I'm having to rethink everything because no matter how hard I've tried to avoid disaster, it's staring me in the face. I'm on the brink of losing the two things I want most in this world, and no amount of pre-planning on my part seems to have made a difference. Back to the truth or dare thing. You want to know how a simple child's game led to my demise? Well, I'm about to tell you. Chapter 2 I have needed this, I murmur as I sink my achy body deeper into the hot, soapy water. I inhale deeply, savoring the delicate scent of lavender. Hopefully, the combination of the bath bomb and bubble bath liquid will do the trick of easing the tightness of my muscles. I run a hand over the frothy layer of velvety bubbles before scooping up a handful into my palm and blowing them back into the water. 
It has been pandemonium at the bakery with us trying to get ready for the cutie pie dance, an annual event that takes place at the town hall. It's held on Valentine's Day, and the bakery is providing all of the baked goods. Valentine's Day is still two weeks away, and already I'm exhausted. We've baked dozens upon dozens of sugar cookies and stored them in the freezer. We'll take them out a couple of days before the holiday and let them thaw so they'll be ready to frost. I guess I should be grateful that business is ballooning. I frown. Is that right? Ballooning? I run the phrase through my head. Business is ballooning. Meaning that business is growing larger and expanding like a giant hot air balloon. I don't know if that's the proper phrase, but it works. If my cousin Presley were here, she'd set me straight in no uncertain terms. Presley is always accusing me of mixing up my words. I roll my eyes, thinking that there are worse offenses. So I mix up my words. whoopity do da day Anyway, back to the bakery. Not only are we taking care of the cutie pie dance, but orders for giant Valentine's heart cookies are already flowing in from the high school. It would seem that teenagers enjoy giving their crushes and significant others cookies in lieu of flowers. I can't say that I blame them. It's certainly cheaper and tastier. In addition to the planned events, we have droves of customers coming in on a daily basis and placing their orders for Valentine's Day, and we have our regular customers who expect to get their usuals fresh and on time. I've had to hire two extra workers, and we still can't keep up. I should probably be working today instead of taking the day off. However, I felt like if I didn't take some time to recoup, my head would explode. My mom and dad have been riding my cage, or er, riding my case, about working too hard on a business that isn't mine. I keep reminding them that Abigail, the owner, gave me her word that she would give me a year to earn the down payment money so I can purchase the bakery from her. A couple years ago, Abigail retired and moved to Florida to be with her daughter and grandkids. I'm squirreling away money as fast as I can. I've been taking on catering jobs to help earn money faster. If all goes according to plan... I should have enough for the down payment on the bank loan by the end of the year. My cell phone buzzes. I grab it from the lip of the tub where it's resting, wondering if I dare to answer it. It's probably someone from the bakery. I put Ellie in charge during my absence. Ellie started out as a bit of a stress case when she first came to work at the bakery, but she's really coming into her own. She can be a bit bossy at times, but at least I know that she'll make everyone toe the line while I'm absent. Looking at the screen, I see it's not Ellie calling, but Blakely, one of my closest friends. Hello? I chime into the phone. I look down, using my index finger to trace a pattern through the bubbles. They're so light and fluffy, reminding me of meringue. Skeet, Blakely begins in a breathy voice. Have you heard the news? I frown. What news? Are you sitting down? Sort of. I chuckle. Colette and Wade are no longer engaged, Blakely announces in a glib tone. My heart skips a beat as I sit up taller. What? I exclaim, unable to contain the ginormous grin that topples over my lips. What? What happened? I begin blinking fast, my brain whirling. This is stellar news. The best news ever. Right after Christmas, when I heard that Wade and Colette were engaged, my world came crashing down. Then I had to remind myself that I have no claim on Wade. Sure, I've had a thing for him for years, but it's been all one-sided. I could paint myself purple and do cartwheels in front of Wade, and he still wouldn't notice me. Blakely laughs. Are you ready for this? I read about it in Nellie Kinsey's blog. Evidently, Colette and Dottie were at some cake-tasting place in Mobile. I roll my eyes. 
That was their first mistake, going all the way to Mobile instead of coming to me. I'm not one to brag, but baking is my thing. I'd put my cakes up against anyone on this side of the Mississippi River. And I don't take kindly to Dottie and Colette going around me. Who are you kidding? Blakely counters. You wouldn't have taken Colette's job if she had come to you. You got that right. I punch out with a vengeance that leaves a sour taste in my mouth. Colette Williams is a yellow belly lizard. I think you mean yellow belly snake, Blakely giggles. That too. I narrow my eyes. Even if Colette weren't with Wade Claiborne, I would still despise her on account of my undying loyalty to Albany. My mama always says that if a girl can find one or two true friends in a lifetime, then she should count herself lucky. In that regard, I'm the luckiest girl on the planet. Albany, Penelope, and Blakely are the closest thing to sisters that I've ever had. We've been besties since junior high. I suppose while I'm counting besties, I have to add my cousin Presley into the mix. By the way, it was my allegiance to Presley that kept me from going after Wade Claiborne in high school. He and Presley were an item back then, so I backed off. Presley's happy as a clown. Or is it a clam? Anyway, she's happy, giddy even, to be with Bo. Things are looking up for Presley. Not only did she capture one of the most eligible bachelors in comfort, but she just signed a lucrative record deal with a new label that country music star Hartley Raines established. Here's hoping that some of Presley's good luck will rub off on me. My thoughts turn back to Colette Williams, who's turning out to be a thorn in my side. While Albany was away in New York struggling to make it in the fashion world, Colette tried to get her paws, or claws into Gavin. When that didn't work, she turned her sights to Wade. Of course, Wade's mom, Dottie, was thrilled. She's a hoity-toity diva like Colette. Tell me what happened between Colette and Dottie, I prompt, eager for Blakely to get to the part where Wade and Colette's engagement is off. Blakely's voice zings with amusement. According to Nellie's blog, Colette wanted red velvet cake and Dottie wanted double chocolate fudge. Colette lost her temper and shoved cake in Dottie's face. Laughter bubbles in my throat. Oh, to be a cockroach on the wall, I would have loved to see that. You mean to be a fly on the wall? Blakely corrects. I twirl my hand. You know what I mean. The engagement is off. She chuckles. You know what they say, nothing ruins a relationship faster than weddings, lace, and cake in the face. I scrunch my nose, trying but failing to connect the dots. I don't get it. All is well until the wedding planning starts, Blakely explains. Then everything comes crashing down. Oh, gotcha. Anticipation spritzes through me as a marvelous idea begins to take shape. You know what this means? Wade is officially off the market. You mean he's back on the market? That's what I said. He's officially on the market. You said he's officially off the market, Blakely counters. Did not. Blakely can be a bit of a know-it-all. Did too. Whatever, you know what I meant. Wade is available. I don't know what you see in him, Blakely scoffs. I tip my head, ticking off the items. Let's see. He's handsome, successful, has those adorable dimples. Should I go on? Disgust sits heavy in Blakely's voice. He's a veterinarian and smells like a barnyard. Giddy laughter bubbles in my throat. Duh, that's why they make cologne. He'll need a whole bottle and then some, Blakely retorts. Wade is available. Maybe the stars are finally lining up in my favor. Maybe I'll get the guy and the bakery. I want to jump up and down and squeal. You could do so much better than Wade Claiborne. The guy has no backbone. He's just blah. 
Irritation prickles down my spine. How do you know? Blakely is a college professor of psychology. She's smart, but not as smart as she thinks she is. Any guy who would get engaged to Colette Williams is a doofus. Also, look at Dottie and how controlling she is. Wade can't help who his mother is. I suppose you're right, Blakely sighs. All I'm saying here is that you need a real man, a guy who's down to earth, a guy who could eat Wade Claiborne for breakfast. I know where Blakely is going with this. And I suppose you have someone in mind, I ask dutifully. The guy for you is right in front of your face, disguised as your bestie, Blakely says in exasperation. If only you could see it. I take in a deep breath as I trail my hand through the remaining bubbles that haven't disintegrated. Jass is a great guy. I'll give you that. The water is now lukewarm and my skin is starting to shrivel. If I ever wondered what a hundred and twenty-something pounds of raisins look like, now I know. Exactly like my skin. Of course he's great, Blakely slings back. You might be a little biased, considering that he's your brother. Blakely's voice goes practical. Even you have to admit that he's easy on the eyes and a firefighter to boot. What more could a girl want? It certainly worked out well for Presley. Just because Presley is with Bo doesn't mean that I'm gonna go gaga over Jasper. We're friends. End of story. Are you telling me you don't think he's good looking? Heat flushes over my face. He's all right, I answer casually. It bothers me that I've had more than a few renegade thoughts about Jasper Donaldson over the past few months. It all started last summer when I stopped by his house and saw him washing his truck, shirtless. An image of his six-pack flashes through my mind, causing my mouth to go drier than a pan of overbaked cookies. I guess all that working out at the fire station has done him good. Wait, I can't go there. Jasper is my closest guy friend in the world. Not to mention the older brother of one of my best friends. I can't get involved with him. What happens if we do start dating and things don't work out? Then I lose a friend and things between us are forever awkward. I don't even want to think about the almost kiss that would have happened last week. If we hadn't gotten interrupted by my next-door neighbor, Laura Lee, who, bless her heart, was beside herself because her cat Alice had gotten out of the house and was nowhere to be found, I shake my head, frustrated that I let Blakely steer me off the topic of Wade Claiborne. I gnaw the inside of my cheek, my brain working a mile a minute. I should probably act fast. Now that word of Wade and Colette's engagement is out, the women will flock after him. Not if I get there first. You should give Jasper a chance. The last I heard, Jasper was still gaga over Renee Keith. I fire back, feeling a little pouty about the situation. How many times have I had to listen to Jasper crying on my shoulder over Renee? Too many times to count. That's for dang sure. What is it with men and their failure to recognize a catty woman? Renee has had sharp claws since kindergarten. Sure, she acts all sweet and proper around Jasper, but the woman is cutthroat. That was eons ago. Jasper is footloose and fancy free, Blankley chimes, looking for just the right girl to keep him straight. Uh-huh. Well, that girl ain't gonna be me. I grumble. A peculiar tingle runs down my spine. Should I take another look at Jasper? The two of us get along beautifully. But that's because we're friends with zero expectations. Could we be something more? The answer comes crashing down on me like a heavy fist. Heck no. Any attraction I have for Jasper needs to stay locked away in a sturdy metal box, never to be let out. I don't need that sort of complication. 
Besides, it's Wade I'm interested in, not Jasper. I don't know why Blakely feels the need to play matchmaker. Jasper isn't interested in me. He views me as a friend, and that's all. Wasn't Jasper going to your place today to work on your bathroom? Nope, that's tomorrow. My bathroom sink has a leak, and Jasper offered to take a look at it for me on his day off. Further proof that he's a stand-up guy. If only Jasper weren't my best guy friend and Blakely's brother, then the two of us might have stood a chance. If only. I could have sworn Jasper was going over to your place today. Tomorrow. I counter lightly, not wanting to argue about it. My house was built in 1947 and is a fixer-upper. I purchased it a couple of years ago and had grand aspirations of repairing it all at once. However, it didn't take long for me to run out of energy and money. My phone beeps. I've got a call coming in. I should probably let you go. Think about what I said about Jasper being a good fit for you. Have I ever steered you wrong? Do you really want me to answer that? The time I got you sent to detention doesn't count, Blakely chimes. You and Jasper would be perfect together. I roll my eyes. Good grief. You're like a dog who won't let go of a bone. Would you let it go, please? For now. Blakely chirps pleasantly. Goodbye, I huff as I click over to the other call. Skeet, Ellie cries. You won't believe what happened. Henry Roach came in and pitched a hissy fit in front of a room full of customers. The air leaves my lungs. Why? He said the key lime pie he picked up yesterday had a soggy crust and was too tart. Baloney. I made that pie myself. It was perfect. Her voice flutters with outrage. He asked if we used dill pickles in the filling instead of limes. Startled laughter blips through my throat. <laughs> you know Henry. He's always got his undies in a wad about something. I don't think the man can get through the day without causing some sort of ruckus. I guess, but Cynthia B. was one of the customers. She said that after hearing about Henry's experience, she'd just as soon get her pies from the Piggly Wiggly. Figures, I fume. More power to her. Cynthia B. is always looking for something to be disgruntled about. I tried calming Henry down. I told him we'd replace the pie, but he wouldn't have it. He said the only person he'll talk to is you, and then he stormed out. I push out a heavy breath. I'll take care of Henry. He's been a bear since Gladys passed. The man is a monster, Ellie raged. Did you hear what he told Mindy Patterson the other day? No, I answer, knowing that Ellie's about to tell me. She rushes on, her voice coated with outrage. Henry was buzzing around the grocery store in one of those electric wheelchair thingamadoos. Mindy happened to be standing in his way. He told her to move her fat butt, that it wasn't a cattle crossing. I sputter out a strangled snigger. It's not funny, Ellie counters. Poor Mindy cried for days. I'm sorry, I'm not laughing at Mindy. I'm laughing out of shock to keep from crying. Jeez Louise, I really need to work on controlling my reactions. It was tactless of me to laugh at that. Oh, Ellie says, somewhat mollified. There's more. Henry said that if you don't go and visit him today, that he'll call Nellie Kinsey and get her to do an expose on the bakery. Is that so? Now I'm getting ticked. I narrow my eyes. We'll just have to see about that. Nellie Kinsey has taken it upon herself to write a blog about the people and town of comfort. Basically, it's a gossip rag. I'm sure she'd love to dig up some dirt on the bakery. You'd better go and see him. Don't worry, I assure her. I will. I grit my teeth. Henry and I are gonna have a nice little talk. If the talk happens to involve you giving that ornery go-to-knuckle sandwich, you won't get any complaints from me.
I grin at the fire under Ellie's belt. I'll be sure to give him the smackaroo. How's everything else going? Fair to middling, she sighs. We're getting orders out the wazoo for Valentine's Day. At the rate the folks a comfort are ordering cookies, cakes, and pastries, Mindy Patterson won't be the only one Henry Roach is taking pot shots at about weight. I click my tongue. Don't be saying that too loud. We want people to order from us, remember? Yeah, I know. She heaves out another long sigh. Sorry, I'm just peeved at Henry Roach. The man is intolerable. I hear a noise and look up as the door bursts open. Jasper! I screech, sinking deeper into the water and throwing my arm over my chest to cover myself. What are you doing here? Jasper hasn't come in today, I hear Ellie say, her voice washed in confusion. Jasper goes bug-eyed. What are you doing here? I live here. Seriously? I mutter. What kind of lame brain question is that? Sorry, Ellie says. I thought you were asking about Jasper. A high-pitched giggle riddles my throat. No, sorry. I shake my head, my brain swirling like a tornado. Ellie, I'm not talking to you. Jasper is here, in my bathroom. Ellie's voice goes high. In your bathroom? Why? Gotta let you go. I end the call and place my phone on the lip of the tub. I glance down, relieved to note that the bubbles, although thinning, are still covering everything. Jasper folds his arms over his chest and leans against the doorframe. A grin tugs at his lips. This is a mighty interesting situation. He drawls, doing a darn good imitation of Jimmy Stewart. It's a Wonderful Life is one of Jasper's favorite movies. He's got Jimmy Stewart down to a T. I'm mortified to be in this situation. Buck naked with Jasper here? I don't even want to think about why my blood is running hotter and faster through my veins, because that would mean that I'm attracted to the one guy who's off limits. Are you just going to stand there gawking? Why does he have to be so boyishly cute with his curly dark hair and hunky firefighter body? I think Jasper is the fittest man I've ever seen. He laughs easily. Maybe I would gawk if there was anything to see. My cheeks glow hot from the insult. I narrow my eyes. You barge into my bathroom and insult me? Jasper doesn't think I have anything worth seeing? That stings. His ex-girlfriend Renee is a tall, lanky blonde. I couldn't be any more different. I guess I can't fault him for not thinking that a petite, curvy girl is attractive. He chuckles, holding up his hands. I only meant that I can't see a thing. A wicked glint fires his eyes. Now, if you'd like to clear away a few of those bubbles. My eyes nearly pop out of their sockets as a startled guffaw falls from my lips. You really know how to eat my goat. He laughs. I think you mean get your goat. Whatever. You're supposed to be here tomorrow. I pout. He tips his head. No, ma'am. It's today. I clench my jaw. You said you were coming on Friday. Amusement flashes over his chiseled features. It's Friday. All day long. My mouth drops. Is not, I protest. It's Thursday. My brain does a quick rewind. I talk aloud to myself, mumbling under my breath. Let's see. Monday, I worked late to get Margaret Blevins' order out. Three specialty cakes and five dozen cupcakes for her husband Johnny's 50th birthday party. Tuesday was a normal work day, and then I went and helped Susie choreograph the tri-county competition routine for the comfort cloggers. Jasper interrupts. I didn't realize you were still clogging. I thought you quit the group last year. I did, but Susie needed my help with the routine. 
The comfort cloggers have a lot riding on this. I'm sure. Amusement zings in his deep chocolate eyes. Jasper's eyes are the exact color of his hair, and he has these thick, dark lashes that make me green with envy. Don't laugh. I throw him a reproving look. It's a big deal. You don't know how hard it was for me to quit the clogging team. I do, he acknowledges, but I get the feeling that he's poking fun at me. Jasper's like a brother. Razzing each other is what we do. I glance him over from head to toe. His nose is slightly too large to consider him classically handsome. He has an inch-long hairline scar on his chin. He got that war trophy in a bar fight defending Beau Primrose. It really ate my goat. Er, got my goat. That Jasper would be the one to get injured because of Beau and his escapades with his numerous women. Of course, Bo is a changed man now, thanks to my cousin Presley. The two are thick as molasses. I still grin thinking about how their fake engagement became real. To hear Jasper tell it, Bo gets down in the mouth every time Presley has to leave comfort to do a recording or a performance. Jasper figures it won't be long before Bo and Presley get married. I suppose Jasper would know. He's tight with Bo. I shake my head, trying to focus. My thoughts are flying all over the place today. Focus, Skeet, I command myself. I've always struggled to maintain focus. I suppose it comes from me being dyslexic. School was a beast for me. I've always wished that I had a brain like Blakely, who processes facts and figures as easily as breathing. I guess everyone has their talents. I shine in the kitchen. Cooking and baking for other people brings me a huge sense of satisfaction. Something comes over me when I get into the kitchen of the bakery. It's my domain, and I'm king. Or queen. Her to skeet, Jasper prompts gently. I jerk. Oh, sorry. It has been such a crazy week that my brain is scrambled. He grins. Speaking of scrambled, I was hoping that you might scare us up some breakfast. Ah, I see how you are. Now I know the real reason why you hightailed it over here on your day off. We share a smile that does strange things to my insides. I remind myself for the umpteenth time that I cannot and will not fall for Jasper. No way, no how. It's no wonder that I'm struggling. Jasper has something that goes beyond mere good looks. He's a good guy, one of the best. His appeal is that he's so rugged and manly. The guy next door meets G.I. Joe. His slate gray thermal shirt fits him snugly enough for me to see the rock-solid definition of his pecs and abs. His powerful shoulders are impressively wide. His waist tapers with such precision that he could pass for one of those Bowflex models. My mouth starts moving at warp speed, the way it always does when I get nervous. About the clogging. There simply wasn't enough time in the day for me to devote to it when I needed to focus on catering so that I can earn the down payment to buy the bakery. God, that was a mouthful. I sound like I'm on a talk show and giving a soundbite of my life. How's that going? Slow, but good. I'm just glad that Abigail's willing to work with me. I go back to listing the events of the week. Wednesday, I had dinner with my parents and Raul. Raul is my younger brother, who's named after my dad. He's attending college at the University of Alabama, so I don't see him that often. Raul coming to town last week was a rare experience, which is why we all had dinner together. My dad is from Merida, Mexico, and my mom is from Comfort. Raul got named after dad, and I got named after my grandfather, Skeeter. We're definitely what people would call a hodgepodge family. My dad holds to his Latin roots, and my mom is about as southern as you can get. Our Christmas dinner consisted of cornbread, dressing, turkey, ham, 
tamales, refried beans, rice, and salsa. My dad still speaks with an accent and lets the Spanish fly when he gets mad. However, my brother Raul and I hardly know any Spanish and talk like everyone else in comfort. I suppose I look a little Hispanic with my olive-toned skin and dark eyes, but my hair is a mid-toned brown that goes blonde on the ends in the summer. I've been told that I look like the actress Sofia Vergara, which I consider to be a huge compliment. Jasper pipes in. Last night, you went to dinner with Albany, Penelope, and Blakely. A hot blanket of embarrassment covers me. Yikes, I goofed. It is Friday. I throw him an apologetic grin. Sorry. Oh, don't apologize. I wouldn't have missed this for the world. He makes a point of looking at me with a smolder that tingles aliveness over my skin. I force my tone to go pragmatic. Well, if you want breakfast, you're gonna have to leave while I get out and get dressed. The corners of his lips turn down as he exhales a long breath. If I must, I must. I shake my head. You're such a tease. He raises an eyebrow. I'm a tease. I'm not the one naked as a jaybird and frolicking in bubbles. Ha ha, I say dryly. You know, he muses, if I didn't know better, I'd say that you got your days mixed up on purpose. Yeah, right, I roll my eyes. Why in the world would I do that? His eyes deepen with something I can't quite discern. To drive me mad, he utters so softly that I wonder if I heard him correctly. To remind me of how tempting the forbidden fruit truly is. My pulse begins to pound as I blink, feeling like a bird trying to take flight. Only I can't because my wings are mired in sticky goo. I swallow hard, reminding myself of the need to keep a level head. Don't go there, I warn. There's too much at stake. The insides of my throat turn to sandpaper as I swallow. A second later, my words rush out in a jumbled heap. Aside from Albany, Penn, Blakely, and Presley, you're my best friend in the world. I don't want to do anything to jeopardize that. Rich, mellow laughter flows from his lips. I'm just glad I made the list. Barely, I harumph. We lock eyes as time slows to a screeching halt. I become aware of subtle things like how the air moves in and out of my body, how the bubbles are popping softly against my skin. Finally, Jasper sighs. I hear what you're clucking, little chicken, he says gently. Remember when I said that Jasper wasn't classically handsome? Well, he's certainly stirring my heart right now. I've never seen another guy who looks so fantastic. Regret knots my stomach. Am I making a huge mistake? Will I ever find another guy that I gel with like Jasper? He actually sat through the Kira Knightley version of Pride and Prejudice. Granted, he poked fun of it the entire time, but at least he watched it with me. I tried to get him to sit through the Colin Firth version, but it's nearly twice as long as the one we watched. Jasper argued that if he had to sit through that one, he'd poke out his eyes with a toothpick. My chest rises and falls like I'm riding back-to-back -back roller coasters, and it's on the tip of my tongue to retract everything I just said. Before I can so much as utter a blip, Jasper speaks. Don't worry, you're not my type. He gives me a reassuring smile that crinkles the edges of his eyes. See you downstairs. He straightens to his full height and turns on his heels, closing the door behind him. My face burns with a scald so hot that I swear I could peel the skin right off my bones. Not his type? Seriously?
Just because I'm not a stick and six feet tall like Renee doesn't mean that I'm not desirable. I seethe. Even as the words leave my mouth, I snigger at my foolishness. I should be elated that Jasper's not into me. Problem solved. I can keep him safely parked in the friend zone, never to open that ominous metal box. I should be ecstatic that our relationship has shifted back to a comfortable position. Think of Wade Claiborne, I order myself. He's the man for me. I know it. With Wade, there are no strings. Either he'll like me or he won't. My spirits lift, and I'm grateful to have another avenue in which to channel my attention. I should be on top of the world right now. I've had a crush on Wade for eons, and he's now available. Happy days are here at last. I push aside the dark clouds of gloom squeezing me like a new pair of skinny jeans. Wade is the ticket, the man of my dreams. As I live and breathe, I won't let him slip through my fingers this time. I picture Scarlet O'Hara when she was holding up that pathetic bunch of limp carrots to the sky and vowing that she would never go hungry again. I'm the captain of my feelings. I'll squash this idiotic fascination with Jasper. Curse the day that I saw him washing his blasted truck. The guy needs to learn to wear a freaking shirt. Women are required to wear shirts in public. Shouldn't the same hold true for men? As I get out of the tub and reach for a towel, a single thought runs through my mind. If Wade is such a dreamboat, then why in the devil do I feel so dejected right now? Chapter 3 after getting dressed and taking a little extra time to fix my hair and makeup to show Jasper Donaldson exactly what he's missing, I pad downstairs to the kitchen, where I'm assaulted by the stench of burnt toast. What are you doing? I demand, my hand going to my hip. He turns, giving me a sheepish grin. Attempting to make breakfast, but I'm not having much luck. Shaking my head, I move to his side. My eyes widen when I see the eggs that he's scrambling over the stove. He stirred them so much that they've turned into small balls. Ew, what did you do? I made eggs, he says with a touch of pride. I wrinkle my nose. Those aren't eggs, they're marbles. Hey, he protests with a wounded expression. I did the best I could. He rolls his eyes. A man could starve to death in the time it took you to get ready. I use my elbow to push him away from the stove. Go sit down and I'll make you some real food. You don't have to tell me twice. He chimes as he trots over to the table, pulls out a chair and plops down. He wags his eyebrows. So, what's it gonna be? Your blueberry pancakes or biscuits and sausage gravy? I can't help but chuckle at his enthusiasm. Jasper has a huge appetite. He can eat everyone I know under the table. Which would you prefer? He presses his lips together. Biscuits and gravy. Biscuits and gravy it is. I point at the fridge. Grab the sausage, would you? His face falls. But I thought you didn't trust me in the kitchen. My eyebrow slides up. Uh-huh, just as I suspected. You want me to think that you're helpless in the kitchen so you won't have to lift a finger. Amusement colors his features. Is it working? Not a chance. Go, I order. His eyes twinkle in amusement. Did anyone ever tell you that you're a tyrant? A smile tugs at my lips. All the time. You should hear my employees. Now go. Yes, ma'am, he quips as he gets up to do my bidding. I pull the flour, baking powder, salt, and oil from the cabinet. 
Oh, grab the buttermilk, too, I direct Jasper as I take the skillet of pellet eggs and dump them into the garbage. Hey, I was gonna eat those. Oh, no, you weren't, I harumph. Not on my watch. Scrambled eggs should be light and fluffy, not rocks. What's on your agenda today? I pull out measuring cups from the drawer, grab a large bowl from the bottom cupboard, and begin scooping out flour and dumping it into the bowl. This is it. Jasper places the sausage and buttermilk on the counter and goes and sits back down. I'm all yours. The air in the room takes on a charge as I turn to look at him. Huh? He throws me a cheeky grin, his eyes lighten with a devilish glint. You heard me, since I made your top five friend list. I figure the least you can do is spend the day with me. His gaze sweeps over me, warming my skin. I don't mind hanging with someone who cleans up so nicely. Did Jasper just give me a compliment? Is that appreciation I see in his expression? I thought I wasn't your type, I sass. He doesn't skip a beat. You're not, he says lightly. Does that stick in your crawl? I stifle a giggle. My what? Your crawl. It's an expression similar to you really get my goat. His eyes dance. Or in your case, eat my goat. I grab a wooden spoon from a nearby container and wave it at him. I'll show you eat my goat. His eyes hold mine. I'd love to see that. I have no idea what Jasper means by that sly comment, but something in his tone rustles heat through my stomach. Being here with Jasper is so comfortable, so right, like we were meant to be together. Don't go there, I warn myself. The rational side of my brain reminds me that I need to steer the conversation to safe territory. I lift my chin. Truthfully, it's a relief that I'm not your type. Why is that? He asks warily. Because you and I would never work. He tips his head in amusement. Why is that? For starters, you leave the toilet seat up every time you're here. Ouch, he rocks back. That's hidden below the belt. You do, I chuckle. He eyes me in a challenge. What else? I shrug. Well, I'm not a hundred feet tall like Renee, and I'd venture to say that even with my five feet three inches of height, I outweigh her by a good twenty pounds. He makes a face. Who said anything about Renee? I wave the spoon. You were over the moon for Renee. Remember all those nights you spent crying on my shoulder? Was is the operative word here. I've long since moved on. His voice holds a clear tone of reproof. And if I remember correctly, I wasn't the only one crying over a breakup. Oh, please, don't even try and act like my brief infatuation with Spencer Irwin was anything compared to your whining over Renee. I went out with Spencer a few times, but nothing ever came of it. When he ghosted me, I felt more relieved than anything. The only reason I harped about it was because Jasper kept going on and on about Renee, and it got on my nerves. He pushes his hands through his hair. Moving on, what are the other reasons why you and I would never work? I chew the inside of my cheek, sensing that the conversation is getting serious. Maybe it's good that we're clearing the air. You're Blakely's brother. So? Let's say we do get involved and things go backwards. Laughter rumbles from his throat. You mean sideways? Yeah, sideways. What happens then? He looks thoughtful. I suppose we go back to being friends. Wrong, 
I ding like he's on a game show. It could get painfully awkward between us. Before he can argue, I rush on. Think about our kiss. My face flames as I speak the words. Jasper was my first kiss. It didn't end well. You were 12 and I was 14. He throws up his hands. It was truth or dare. Let it go. All the old angst comes flooding back. You just had to take the dare, didn't you? I goofed. Exasperation flits over his features. Do we have to revisit that? Yes, I nearly shout. Think about how awkward that was. We tiptoed around each other, avoiding having a conversation for over a year. I'm unprepared for the emotion that rises in my throat. I swallow it down, willing myself to get a grip. Like I said, you're one of my closest friends. I don't want to lose us. I wrap my hands around the spoon, squeezing it like there's no tomorrow. What if we're better together than we ever could be apart? He utters, his expression achingly serious. He searches my face as if to uncover some valuable secret. My voice trembles. What if we're a colossal disaster? Blakely said something earlier that makes a lot of sense. He raises an eyebrow. Are you really bringing my sister into this? I hold up the spoon, waving it back and forth. Hear me out. Blakely said that nothing ruins a relationship like weddings, lace, and cake in the face. His eyes go round. Who said anything about a wedding? Ugh, I'm digging myself in deep here. The point is that a relationship can be going great, and then when you start bringing all of the pressure into it, things fall apart. We lock eyes. I feel so conflicted, so vulnerable, so stupid. I hate having this wretched conversation with Jasper. I don't like that things have gotten confusing between us. An easy smile stretches over Jasper's lips. Where's this coming from? Are you jolted because I saw you in the bathtub? He scalds me. N no, I stutter. Never mind. I turn away from him to face the counter as I place the spoon down. I busy myself with making the biscuits in hurried, jerky movements. I've just gotten the last biscuit placed on the sheet when Jasper comes up from behind. Tingles circle around my spine as he trails his fingers over my arm. Even through the thin fabric of my shirt, his touch ignites my cells. Hey, he murmurs softly, turning me around to face him. My hands are covered in biscuit dough. I hold them stiff so that I won't get the dough on Jasper. He searches my face. I would never hurt you. You know that, right? I know you would never intentionally do anything to hurt me. I counter, forcing a smile. Things are good. Why do we have to mess it up? My voice sounds screechy in my ears. A corner of his mouth tugs up in a lopsided grin. Who said anything about messing things up? His eyes rove over my face as he pushes a lock of hair from my face. Awareness ripples through me, soft as silk and powerful as a jet engine. My throat goes drier than a creek bed in a drought as I swallow. Seeing the need in his eyes stokes something hot and powerful inside of me. And then I panic. Wade and Colette broke up, I blurt. Surprise flashes through his eyes before the corners of his mouth go hard. He steps back, his arms fallen to his side. Is that what this is about? Wade Claiborne? Please don't tell me that you're still carrying a torch for that cream puff. He's not a cream puff, I shoot back. 
Just because he's not a man's man like Jasper doesn't make him subpar. Jasper shakes his head in disgust. Skeet, you're better than this. Wade Claiborne is a shallow putz. Why don't you tell me how you really feel? He narrows his eyes. Trust me, I will. Wade's a respectable guy, I counter. He has a good career. A hard amusement cloaks his features. Is that what this is about? Money? Indignation flares over me. How could you even suggest such a thing? You know I'm not concerned about his money. He gives me a doubtful look. Not even for the bakery? Especially not for the bakery, I retort. Outrage burns through me like wildfire. Are you seriously suggesting that I would try to get with Wade in the hope that he would help me purchase the bakery? What kind of person do you think I am? Jasper's eyes spark hot as he arches an eyebrow. Then what? His looks and charm? Actually, yes. Is that so bad? He's a pretty boy, soft around the edges. You can do so much better, he states emphatically. Why are you getting so bent out of shape about it? It's not like you care about me that way. I'm not your type, remember? The words leave a sour taste in my mouth. Hurt flicks in his eyes. You can't have it both ways, Skeet. You can't push me away with one hand and pull me to you with the other. I blink. I'm not pulling you to me. Equal parts of guilt and shame roll a tidal wave over me. Jasper can see right through me. He knows I'm attracted to him. So what if I am? Big whoop. That doesn't mean that the two of us stand a chance. What I am mostly right now is petrified. Jasper's friendship means the world to me. Why can't he just leave things be? My voice goes shrill. Did you not hear a thing I just said? The two of us won't work. I got that. Loud and clear. He takes in a breath, shaking his head. You know what? I just realized there's someplace else I need to be. My chest squeezes. I don't want him to leave like this. What about the leaky sink? I can come back next week and fix it when you're at work. But I'm making these biscuits for you, you stubborn moron. Frustration masks his features. I can't do this with you, Skeet. Do what? I growl. He throws up his hands in exasperation. This! One minute you're hot, the next you're cold. That's not true. It is. He pushes out a short breath. Look, I get that you're scared. I don't want to do anything to mess up our friendship either. He pauses. But don't you think we've spent far too much time tiptoeing around the elephant in the room? We either have to explore this thing between us or cut bait and move on. Alarm races through my veins. Are you giving me an ultimatum? I can't imagine my life without Jasper. Truth be told, he's probably my closest friend. Wild horses couldn't drag that admission from me. I would never want to hurt Albany, Penn, or Blakely. However, Jasper and I spend a lot of time together. I'm just calling a spade a spade, he answers wearily. The anger explodes, sending my words flying out. How dare you, I seethe. Confusion clothes his features. How dare I what? I get up in his face. How dare you act so piteous, like you somehow know what's best for me. He sniggers, sending a jolt of outrage through me. Are you seriously laughing at me? Laughter simmers in his eyes, washing them in gold. I think the word you're looking for is 
pious, not piteous. You are piteous, I lash out. I expect him to get even more irate, but instead his smile widens. What? I bark, but my annoyance is waning. Mostly I'm relieved that he's still here and that things are mellowing between us. He points to my cheek. I'm sorry, it's hard to take you seriously with that streak of biscuit dough on your face. Really? He nods. Where? Automatically, I touch my cheek. Lyrical laughter flows from his throat. You made it worse. Oh, yeah? I guess it's not smart to try and wipe off dough with fingers that are covered in it. I pin him with a saucy look. Well, I'm not the only one with biscuit dough on the face, Mr. Smarty Pants. Amusement crosses his features. I don't have biscuit dough on my face. I swipe my hand across his jaw. You do now, I taunt. His eyes widen. You didn't just do that. I did, I smirk. What are you going to do about it, Jess? He encircles my wrists and forces my hands to my face, where he makes me touch myself, smearing dough all over. Stop! I giggle, averting my sticky face as I spit out dough and flour. The instant he releases my wrists, I go on the attack and rub my hands over his face. There! I say with a dart of satisfaction as I take a look at my handiwork. His face is sufficiently smeared. I even managed to get some in his hair. Now we're even. <laughs> oh, no, he laughs, mopping a hand over his face. We're just getting started. With lightning speed that causes me to yelp, he lunges for the counter and grabs the mixing bowl containing the leftover flour. He holds up the bowl and ceremoniously scoops up a handful of flour that's mixed with globs of dough. I shrink back. You wouldn't. <laughs> oh, but I would. He chuckles as he throws the flour into my face. It plumes over me tickling my nose and throat as I sputter out a few coughs. You're a Neanderthal, I laugh as I rush at him. We scuffle around. I can tell that Jasper is only exerting a tenth of his strength, whereas I'm going on full attack mode. Jasper drops the bowl where it makes a loud clang on the wooden floor, but not before I manage to get a fistful of flour. I hold up my hand, waving it like a trophy before tossing the flower into his face. It's his turn to sputter and cough. Before I can bask in my victory, he steps forward and manacles my wrists, holding them behind my back. Now what you gonna do, shorty? Jasper taunts. I look up at him, feeling dainty and feminine compared to his muscular frame. Desire whooshes through me like a flame as the moment slows. My heart hammers against my ribcage. Instinctively, my lips part as I move closer. Jasper's eyes deepen, turning them a polished walnut as his gaze goes to my lips. Stop me at any time, he murmurs. I close my eyes as his lips crush mine. Adrenaline pulses through my veins as I welcome the insistence of his mouth. I'm no longer thinking about the goo, the flour, the mess. All I can think about are the spirals of ecstasy circling my spine. This is good. Even better than I'd imagined. My mind tumbles and soars as Jasper releases my wrists and slides his arms around my waist. I've wanted this for so many months. Who would have guessed that my best friend was such an extraordinary kisser? At the word friend, ice encircles my heart, causing my body to stiffen. What the freaky Frankenstein am I doing? Ruining a beautiful friendship, that's what. I pull back. 
Jasper, I utter, my chest heaving as I fight to catch my breath. We can't. He keeps his hold on my waist as a quirky grin tilts his lips. Looks like we just did. Heat blasts over my cheeks. You know what I mean. My eyes grow moist. I've never had a relationship that lasted more than four months, I say miserably. I can't lose you. I'm not going anywhere, he promises, his expression going fierce. Of course he would say that now, but what about four months from now after the honeymoon phase is over? One of us has to keep a clear head here. Our friendship needs to come above all else. You say that now. My voice sounds small and insignificant in my ears. The pounding at the front door causes me to jerk. Skate! A woman yells. Help! I recognize the voice instantly, and so does Jasper. Laura Lee, he grumbles. What does she want this time? The woman has impeccable timing. Evidently, I laugh. Laura Lee must have us on some sort of a radar. She interrupted our near kiss last month. Too bad she couldn't have knocked on the door a few minutes earlier. I'm grateful for Laura Lee's interruption. I need some space from Jasper to collect myself. Being in his strong arms certainly isn't helping my resolve to keep him in the friend zone. I extricate myself from his grasp. I'd better go and see what she needs. The air is charged with so much electricity that I half expect to get shocked to my core if I touch anything metal. I don't know which freaks me out more, the fact that Jasper and I kissed or the fact that I enjoyed it so much. I feel his eyes on me and give him a questioning look. He's grinning like a fat cat who just gulped down a canary. I can almost see feathers dangling from his lips. What? You're going to the door like that? My hand goes to my hair. It's stringy from the flower. I touch my grainy face. Strange. I forgot all about the flower. I look at Jasper's lips, thinking of that kiss. Great. How am I supposed to be around him now and not think about how his lips felt on mine? Talk about a rush of adrenaline. My cheeks flush hot. I hope Jasper won't notice. The beating on the door continues, giving me a much-needed reality check. Skate! Laura Lee wails. Moving myself to action, I dust the flower off the front of my blouse and reach for a nearby kitchen towel. Quickly, I rub my face before holding it up for Jasper's inspection. Did I get it all? <laughs> Not even close, he chuckles. It'll have to do. I toss him the towel and trail a hand through my hair. Your turn, I sing. Ugh, I need another bath. His gaze locks with mine. Bubbles and all? My face is now roasting. Look at you blushing. Am not, I snip as I glance around at the mess, mostly so I can steer the conversation away from the bath. Now you have to stick around to help me clean up. I must be a glutton for punishment. What's going to happen between Jasper and me now? Will our friendship be totally wrecked? I'm a stupid, stupid woman. There's more pounding on the door. You know my motto. I don't do dishes, Jasper teases. You'd better get out there before Laura Lee blows her cork. I place a hand over my mouth to squelch a giggle. At least he's still joking around with me. Maybe all is not lost after all. It sounds like Laura Lee already has blown her cork. He rolls his eyes. I heard that. Be a dear and pop the biscuits into the oven, would you? You sure you trust me with that? Well, seeing as I have no other choice. 
We share another look before I dash to the door. Chapter 4 Coming! I call, walking briskly. I open the door as Laura Lee practically falls into the foyer. She's wearing a light blue house coat that has seen better days, men's tube socks, and tennis shoes. Alice is stuck in a tree, she cries, flailing her arms and sending her steel gray hair flying all over the place. I told John Roper to keep his mongrels in his yard, but they jumped the fence. She clasps her hands together, tears bubbling in her eyes. I can only imagine what p poor Alice is thinking. I swallow the clip of laughter in my throat. Thinking? Alice is a cat. She's probably not thinking much. Or maybe I'm wrong. What do cats think about? Mice? A warm place to sun themselves? How to be more finicky than ever and make their owners work harder for their affection? She has to be mortified, Laura Lee continues. And freezing, she's not wearing her sweater. This time I can't help but grin. Good thing she has a built-in furry coat. Alice is portly with a thick coat of snow-white fur. I'm surprised she was able to make it up the tree. When she splays across Laura Lee's ottoman, she nearly takes up the whole thing. I don't know what I would do if I lost Alice, Laura Lee whimpers. With her square glasses and page boy haircut that has bangs cut straight across, Laura Lee reminds me of an elderly Thelma from Scooby-Doo. Her lower lip trembles as she gives me a pleading look. Her eyes are etched in deep wrinkles and a network of faint spider veins are cross-stitched over her flushed, puffy cheeks. I doubt very seriously if Laura Lee has ever put on a speck of makeup. She probably wouldn't even know how. Compassion wells in my breast. Laura Lee has never married. Her cat is her entire world. I saw Jasper go into your house earlier. She shifts from side to side, wringing her hands as she looks past me into the house. Can he help me rescue Alice? Her chest heaves as she gulps in a breath. I would call the fire department, but Captain Hill said if I called one more time, the city might have to start charging me. She breaks into tears, her shoulders shaking. There was a time when Alice was calling the fire department on almost a weekly basis. No wonder Captain Hill tried to put a stop to it. Have you tried opening a can of tuna and putting it at the base of the tree? I ask kindly. Yes, she blurts. That and a big bowl of milk. A sob wrenches her throat. Nothing works. What am I going to do? If this were anyone else, I'd point out that most likely Alice will climb down the tree if she gets hungry enough. However, it's Laura Lee I'm talking to. Alice is her baby. Can Jasper help? She gives me a desperate look. I bite down on my lower lip, clasping my hands. Um, I'm not sure, I hedge. I know something about Jasper that few others do. He has a phobia about heights. There was a time when Jasper was fearless. However, that changed a year and a half ago when he got trapped in a burning building. His fellow firefighters rescued him and Mary Fremont, whom he was attempting to save. Both were taken to the hospital and treated for smoke inhalation. Jasper does a good job of covering up his jitters. To my knowledge, he hasn't confided his apprehension to Bo or any of the other firemen. Jasper claims he doesn't want everyone to think he's a wuss. However, I'm sure his concern runs deeper. He's probably worried that his job would be in jeopardy. After all, it could get sticky for a fireman who's afraid of heights. Thankfully, in comfort, most of Jasper's calls are related to car accidents and health issues, rather than actual fires. 
I've tried to get Jasper to see a counselor, but he refuses. He's a man's man who thinks he can handle it on his own. Maybe that's true. At any rate, I don't want to put him on the spot in front of Laura Lee. If news of Jasper's fear got out, it could do a lot of damage. Maybe we should call the fire department, I suggest. I don't know that Jasper could handle this on his own. My voice dribbles off when I see Laura Lee looking at me like I've sprouted wings. He's the expert, she protests. Why won't you just ask him? She grabs my arms and pulls me out onto the front porch. There she is. She glances toward the massive magnolia tree in her front yard, her voice tremulous. As you can see, we're running out of time. Laura Lee's breath is coming fast, and her chest is moving up and down like a bellow. I worry that she'll start hyperventilating. Jasper might end up treating her before we even get to Alice. I look over at the tree in question. There are no leaves, making it easy to spot Alice, hunkered down on one of the upper branches, her voluminous body bulging on each side of the skinny branch. From this distance, she reminds me of a glob of glue. Oh, dear. The branch looks like it could break any second. Cats generally land on their feet, but it would be a hard 30-foot fall, and Alice's massive weight will certainly not work in her favor. I could try to coax Alice down, I offer. Do you have a ladder? No, I don't relish climbing up in that tree. I'm not a fan of heights either, but I'd rather me do it than Jasper. Laura Lee gives me a disbelieving look. You? She shakes her head. Thanks, but I need Jasper. She points. You have white stuff in your hair and on your face. Is that flour? Yeah, I was making biscuits when you knocked. Oh, she frowns. You certainly got a lot of stuff on you. Did he get any in the bowl? A ghost of a smile passes over her lips. Her comment isn't even worth responding to. I take in a quick breath. Let me just go and get Jasper so we can talk about what to do. Hang on a sec. I whip around, take a step forward, and run smack dab into him. It's like hitting a brick wall. He's all muscle. He catches my arms to steady me. Our eyes meet as a dart of warmth shoots through me. Hey, I stutter. I was just coming to get you. I heard and thought I'd save you the trip, he says dryly. Jasper doesn't have a trace of flour or dough on him. Of course, he had more time to clean himself up than I did, and he probably went into the guest bath and looked in the mirror. Laura Lee's cat, Alice, is stuck up in the tree, I explain. She needs help getting her down. Jasper nods, his jaw tightening. She's up there! Laura Lee turns and points. I can help with that, he says resolutely, but I can feel his angst as if it were my own. I touch his arm. I can do it. He offers me a tight smile. I'll need to borrow your ladder from the garage. Sure, I'll help you. Laura Lee, you stay here and keep an eye on Alice. I want to talk to Jasper alone. Okay. Laura Lee agrees. Please hurry, she admonishes breathlessly. I follow Jasper around to the garage. He's walking so fast that I have to practically jog to keep up. He goes in through the side door as I grab his arm and turn him. I search his face. Hey, you don't have to do this. I'm afraid I do, he says tersely, pressing his lips together in tight lines. He removes his arm from my grasp and strides over to where the ladder is hanging on the wall. It used to be on the cement floor, until Jasper installed the hooks and hung it for me. He did it last summer when he organized my garage. He claimed he couldn't handle seeing my piles anymore, but I know he did it to help me out. 
Let me get Alice out of the tree, I plead as he lifts the ladder off the hooks. I don't mind at all. Before I'm even conscious of what I'm doing, my gaze traces the outline of his strong, wide shoulders, going down to his tapered waist and long legs ensconced in faded jeans. Heat scalds my cheeks. Good grief, I shouldn't be checking him out at a time like this. What's the matter with me? He turns to face me. I appreciate it, but I can't keep tiptoeing around the bear. He squares his jaw, eyes narrowing. Pretty soon you've got to face it head on. Might as well be today. His expression is perturbed. No, that's the wrong word. He looks like he's in agony, like someone is hammering a nail through his foot. I admire Jasper for his grittiness, but some fears can be tough to overcome. I wish I could read the thoughts running through his head. Is he thinking about the burning building? It must have been terrifying for him to stare death in the face. Carrying the ladder, he walks past me, brushing my arm with his in the process. Awareness rustles through me. A second later, I rouse my feet into action to catch up. Jasper's strides are swift and obstinate as he cuts across my yard to get to Alice. He raises the ladder and props it against the tree. Laura Lee trots over to join us. Nervous energy radiates off her as she looks up and calls to Alice. Hang on, princess! Help is on the way! The incredulous look on Jasper's face raises a giggle in my throat. I place my hand over my mouth to stifle it. I don't have to be a mind reader to know that he thinks Laura Lee is loony. I suppose she is a little touched. Then again, no one can ever go wrong loving and caring for someone or something else. I've got my family, the bakery, my employees, dear friends. I can't exactly fault Laura Lee for having only Alice to look after. My throat constricts when I see Jasper's tight expression as he looks up at Alice. You sure you don't want me to go up? A slight annoyance crosses his features. I told you I'll be fine. Laura Lee gives me a funny look. Of course he'll be fine. He's a fireman. This is what he does. He does a lot more than just rescue cats from trees. I counter with more bite in my voice than is necessary. Laura Lee blinks several times. Of course, I meant no disrespect. None taken, Jasper says easily, throwing me an appreciative grin. My chest expands a little at the knowledge that Jasper noticed my effort to defend him. Hold the ladder for me, he directs. Sure thing. He glances around before bending down and picking up the can of tuna. Smart idea. If he can get it close enough for Alice to smell it, then she might come to him. Taking in a quick breath, Jasper looks up the length of the ladder and squares his jaw. I don't know that his demeanor would be any fiercer if he were about to scale Mount Everest. For Jasper, it might as well be scaling Mount Everest. Trembles run through my body. Good grief, I'm a bundle of nerves. My hands are even sweating. I hold my breath as Jasper climbs up the first several rungs. The second he moves over my head, I slip into position and grip the ladder, determined to not let it move so much as an inch. Jasper's movements are smooth and controlled. If I didn't know him so well, I wouldn't realize how nervous he is. My mind works through the configuration. The ladder is about three feet shy of where Alice is perched, meaning that unless Jasper can coax Alice to where he is, his only other option will be to climb the tree. A prayer goes through my mind. Please let Alice come down so Jasper won't be forced to leave the ladder. Almost there, I murmur when he reaches the top. Hey, Alice, Jasper begins in a sing-song voice. How about some tuna? He holds it up. 
Alice's ears flick with interest. Good, that means she smells the tuna. Come on, kitty, Jasper continues in the soft, sweet tone that one often uses to talk to cats. You got this. Alice eyes the can of tuna with only a mild interest before looking away. Desperation seeps through me. I don't see how this could possibly work. If Jasper does venture onto the branch, then there's a good chance that Alice will only climb higher up the tree to get away from him. Come on, girl, Jasper urges. You know you want some. He waves the can in the air. I suspect that he's trying to get the scent to Alice. She watches him with a new interest. Hope rises in my chest. Laura Lee's hopeful eyes are glued to Alice. Come on, baby, get the tuna. Alice watches Jasper with suspicion. Clearly, she wants the tuna, but isn't sure if she's willing to come near Jasper to get it. Jasper must be getting the same impression, because he places the can in the crook where the branch offshoots from the main body of the tree and then climbs down several rungs. I wait with bated breath, not daring to move a muscle. Then it happens. Ever so slowly, Alice begins inching her way down the branch. Come on, girl, I silently urge. For such a large cat, she's surprisingly agile. It dawns on me that Alice is perfectly capable of holding her own in the tree. As nimble as a tightrope walker, she goes from one branch to another until she gets to the tuna and begins lapping it up with her tongue. Jasper stealthily moves up the rungs. When Alice realizes he's nearby, she freezes. It's okay, Jasper soothes. Come here, girl. In a flash, he reaches out to grab her. Alice lets out a screech and topples from the tree. Laura Lee cries out in distress as Alice falls. Just before she hits the ground, Alice contorts her body and lands on her feet, then scampers across the yard and up onto Laura Lee's porch. My poor baby! Laura Lee whimpers as she runs in the direction that Alice went. I continue to hold the ladder as Jasper climbs down, holding the can of tuna. It's not until his feet touch the ground that I breathe a sigh of relief. Are you okay? I ask, noting that his face is pale. He throws me a wry grin. I survived. Yes, you did, I sigh. Thank goodness. I don't know who was more jolted by this experience, me or Jasper. He looks toward Laura Lee's porch, regret pinging in his eyes. I was so close to nabbing her. I know, I say remorsefully. Do you think she's okay? Jasper's caveman tough on the outside, but a softy on the inside. I offer him a reassuring smile. Well, the good news is that she landed on her feet, and thanks to you, she only fell 20 feet instead of 30 or more. I guess that's true. A grim smile touches my lips. I don't think it's Alice we need to worry about, but Laura Lee. Agreed. Let's go check on her, and then I'll put the ladder away. Jasper holds up the can of tuna, his eyes playful. Hungry? My eyes fly open wide. The biscuits! Crap! Jasper exclaims. Be right back! I say as I dart over to my house. I run inside, halfway expecting the smoke alarm to be going off. However, all seems to be okay. That is until I open the oven door and smoke billows out. Quick like a flash, I slam the door and then turn on the vent hood fan. Next, I grab an oven mitt from a nearby drawer and slip it over my hand. I turn off the oven, throw open the door, snatch the sheet of biscuits, and quickly close the door. The sting of smoke fills my nostrils as I drop the sheet onto the stovetop. Sliding off the oven mitt, I wave my hand back and forth, 
trying to clear the smoke so the alarm won't go off. The biscuits are charcoal briquettes. A dry laugh riddles my throat. <laughs> well, this is a first. I don't ever remember burning biscuits. Or anything else to this degree. I fan the smoke several more times. When it seems to be adequately dissipating, I go back outside to where Laura Lee and Jasper are talking on her front porch. Laura Lee is cradling Alice in her arms. How is she? Laura Lee frowns. I'm not sure. She seems okay to me, Jasper pipes in. Maybe a little scared, but I think she's going to be okay. I can tell from Laura Lee's glum expression that she's not convinced. How were the biscuits? Jasper asks. Charred, he winces. I was afraid of that. How's my princess? Laura Lee coos, studying Alice in concern. She seems lethargic. Amusement flicks over Jasper's face. You mean more so than normal? We share a quick grin. Alice is typically a slow-moving cat. She's not behaving much differently than usual. However, what do I know? It's not like I'm an expert. She landed on her feet, I reminded Laura Lee. That's a good thing. Yeah, I guess. Her eyes are shrouded in worry. I step closer and nuzzle Alice's head. Hey, girl, I begin. How are you? Alice lets out a disgruntled meow in response. I think she's trying to tell us that she's hurt. Fear fills Laura Lee's eyes. If only I didn't have to go into work at noon, I could take her to the vet. Laura Lee is the assistant to Clark Sanderson, a semi-retired accountant, which is probably why she goes into work at noon. Is fate trying to tell me something here? I'm being handed an excuse to go and see Wade Claiborne on a silver platter. Jasper's not gonna like it. But it's best for both of us if we nip this attraction thing in the bud. As amazing as that kiss was, I won't risk losing him as a friend. Not just a friend, but my best friend. My heart picks up several beats as I fight to keep my tone casual. I have the day off. I could take Alice to the vet, if you'd like. That would be wonderful. Laura Lee gushes, tears spring into her eyes. Thank you. I would feel so much better knowing that she's been checked. She's looking at me with such adoration that I almost feel guilty. Laura Lee stops, giving me a probing look. I tense, fearing that she somehow knows that my intentions aren't purely altruistic. Are you sure it's no trouble? I wave a hand, laughing at myself for being so paranoid. None at all. You have a tote thingamajig for her, right? A carrier? I do, Laura Lee answers. She rushes on. I'll go and make an appointment right now. She opens the door and ambles in. The heat from Jasper's glare could melt metal. What? I harumph, my hand going to my hip. He smirks in disgust. You just can't wait to scurry over and see Wade. His derisive tone pricks down my spine as my words come flying out in razor-sharp tips. First of all, I don't scurry anywhere. Second, one of us has to be the adult here. A hard amusement zips over his features as he gets up in my face. Is that what you call this? He narrows his eyes. I call it running away. I rock back, my insides boiling. I told you the two of us won't work, I seethe. We shared one kiss, and already we're fighting. I blink to clear the moisture from my eyes. This is like junior high all over again. I cough to clear the frog in my throat. You're scared. I get that. 
His eyes burn with a warrior-like fierceness that cuts me to the quick. We have to face this, Skeet. Running from it won't work. On some level, I wonder if he's right. No, I can't open that box. I stink at long-term relationships. The edges of his eyes soften. Skeet, what are you so afraid of? It's me, remember? You're my best friend. Don't you think I know that? Haven't you heard? Best friends make the best lovers. He winces. Man, that sounded cheesy. Strike that comment. A smile tugs at his lips. You know what I mean. I've never had a relationship that has lasted longer than four months. God, I sound so pathetic. A corner of his lips lifts up in amusement. That's because you never had a relationship with me. The temptation to give in is so strong I can taste it. Even Jasper knows how close I am to Caven. Triumph flashes in his eyes. Give us a chance. I promise you won't be disappointed. That's just it. Jasper can't make that promise. No one can predict the future. My heart twists. I can't, I utter. His eyes go dark and stormy. You're making a mistake, he utters. I lift my chin. On the contrary, I'm saving our friendship. I fire back with a conviction that stamps clear through to my soul. Skeet. You can't keep running from everything because you're afraid. Irritation fires through my blood. You don't have a clue what you're talking about. I fume. Don't I? What about Trotter? I rock back. That's not fair. I clench my hand, my fingernails digging into my palm. That's the problem with Jasper knowing me so well. Trotter, my first and only dog, was a Scottish terrier. He ran into the road and got hit by a car. I was devastated. My parents tried to buy me another dog, but I wouldn't have it. I was too afraid that the next dog would get killed, and I didn't think I could handle it emotionally. You know I'm right, he challenges. You've let fear rule your life on so many levels. That's why you haven't gotten another dog. I grunt. As if I have time for a dog. Jasper's right. I still have nightmares about Trotter getting hit. Even though it happened when I was 12, I have zero intention of getting another dog. So what if I want to keep from getting hurt? Does that make me a terrible or flawed person? His eyes cut into mine. What about culinary school? I glare back at him as he continues. You had a chance to study in New York under one of the top chefs in the nation. His voice is coated with exasperation. And yet you turned it down because you were too afraid to leave comfort. Ouch. I don't like the picture Jasper is painting of me. Okay. I'm a coward. Plain and simple. I was afraid to leave home. So what? I grit my teeth. The decisions I've made for my life are my business. He gives me a superior look. What about your clogging? I furrow my brow. What about my clogging? You can't so much as eat a bite of something that's high calorie without trying to immediately burn it off by clogging. Sometimes you just need to eat a cookie and enjoy it without freaking out over the after effects. I can't believe what I'm hearing. My voice pitches high. So now you're judging me over clogging? Unbelievable! You're the one who's unbelievable. Eventually, you have to face life instead of running from everything. He shakes his head in disgust, and I assume he'll walk away. 
Instead, he encircles my waist with his arm and pulls me roughly to him. I utter a soft gasp of surprise as his lips come down on mine, angry and punishing. Even so, fire licks through me, circling down to my toes. He ends the kiss as quickly as it began, and he pulls back and releases my waist. How's that for friendship? He grunts as he stalks off the porch and goes to retrieve the ladder. Chapter 5 Jasper I punch the bag again and again, ignoring the sweat stinging my eyes. It feels good to vent my frustration. Two things are eating at me. Skeet and my phobia of heights. In that order. I'm slowly getting a handle on the height thing. Once I made myself start up the ladder, I was okay. The situation with Skeet is an entirely different story. Easy, Memphis cautions. You're gonna beat that thing to smithereens. Something's eating at him, Bo jeers. Must be a woman. Must be, Memphis agrees. Women, he exclaims grandly. Can't live with them and can't live without them. Amen, Bo chuckles heartily. I scowl, punching harder. That's easy for those yeehaws to say. They have their women. Memphis is happily married to Penelope, and Bo is fast going in the same direction with Presley Madison. Then there's me, mired in the dreaded friend zone. After leaving Skeets, I went through a drive through and grabbed a sandwich. I figured I'd go home and mope around the house, maybe catch a basketball game or two. However, Bo called and asked me to hang out with him in Memphis. I had hoped their company would be a diversion from the dark thoughts looming inside me. But then what do they want to talk about? Women. After I've expended my energy, I go over and collapse on the picnic bench beside Bo. He makes a fist and gives me a soft shove in the arm. You pack a mean punch. Remind me not to get on the receiving end of those hammers. He reaches for his can of Coke, drains it down with a few swigs and crushes the can in his fist. Memphis is sitting across from us. We're at the outside home boxing gym located beside Memphis's Airstream trailer, where he lived when he first moved to Comfort. To hear Memphis tell it, Penelope isn't happy about him keeping the Airstream parked beside the bed and breakfast because she thinks it's an eyesore. Penelope's going along with it for now because Memphis uses it for his office. This summer, Memphis plans to build a guest house on the lot that will double as his office. I'm not really sure what Memphis does exactly for a living, but I know it has something to do with online marketing. For the past several months, Memphis has been teaching Bo and me to box, a skill that came in handy when Bo was chasing all the skirts. I haven't been in a bar fight since he settled down with Presley. The last fight Bo got me into landed me with a hairline fracture in my hand. I guess I should be glad that Bo's a changed man, but it's a stark reminder that my life is going nowhere fast, whereas everybody else has things figured out. The wind picks up, raising goosebumps over my damp skin. When I was in a rage, I was oblivious to the cold. However, having physically expended myself, I'm getting chilled. I left my sweatshirt resting over the back of one of the outdoor plastic chairs. I get up to get it. A second later, I slide it over my head, grateful for the warmth. The high today is supposed to be 61 degrees, but the sun has vanished behind a haze of clouds making it feel more like it's in the low 50s. Down here in lower Alabama, the temperature stays moderate even during the winter. Well, most of the time. The snowstorm we had right before Christmas was an anomaly. It certainly worked in Bo's favor. 
He rescued Presley from a car accident that took place near the Crosswater Creek Bridge. All right, spill it, Memphis demands as I sit back down at the table. What happened with Skeet? What does Skeet have to do with anything? I mutter. The look of amusement that passes between Bo and Memphis causes my spine to go ramrod straight. Do y'all have a problem? Down, boy. Bo laughs easily. You gonna take us both on? He glances at Memphis. If that's what it takes, I assert, eyeing them so that they know I mean business. I know I'm acting out, but I can't stand the thought of Skeet chasing after Wade Claiborne. How could she not feel the same fire raging through her veins that I felt when we kissed? He's got it bad, Memphis chuckles, talking to Bo. It was hard enough to get shot down by Skeet. I don't need these morons having a few laughs at my expense. Bo turns and places a hand on my shoulder. Take a deep breath and count to ten, he admonishes, his eyes bright with laughter. I shove his hand away from my shoulder. Just because you were finally able to snag a woman doesn't mean that you can sit there and act all pious. As soon as the word pious leaves my lips, I think of my conversation with Skeet, where she called me piteous. I know I razz her about mixing up her words, but her goodness and childlike naivety are two of the things I love most about her. You do have it bad. Want to tell us what happened? Bo pins me with a probing gaze. I let out a long breath, figuring I've got to tell someone my woes before I erupt. Skeet's afraid to take our relationship to the next level. I tighten my jaw. She's worried that if things go sideways between us, then it'll wreck our friendship. Bo strokes his chin thoughtfully. Makes sense. She's probably right. My words come flying out. So now you're taking her side? I'm not taking anyone's side, Bo counters. And if I were to pick a side, it would be yours. You know I've got your back, he says in all seriousness. I relax my shoulders a fraction as I give him a curt nod. I know that about Bo. He's like a brother to me. That's probably why I don't think twice about taking out my frustrations on him. The two of us have been through some tough times together. We see things in our profession that no person should have to witness. The camaraderie that we share with our fellow firefighters is what gets us through. Maybe Skeet just needs time, Memphis offers. Y'all spend so much time together that she's bound to come around. I'm not holding my breath on that one. An invisible fist squeezes my gut. Did you and Skeet have a falling out? Bo asks. Of sorts. No way am I gonna tell these guys that I kissed Skeet. There are some things that a man needs to keep to himself. Memphis pedals his hand. Don't leave us hanging here. Wade Claiborne and Colette Williams broke off their engagement, I mutter. What does that have to do with anything? Memphis demands at the same time understanding registers in Bo's eyes. Oh, man, Bo begins. That's rough. What's rough? Memphis asks dubiously. Skeet has always had a thing for Wade Claiborne. Bo explains. A grin of amusement crosses Memphis's lips. Should I ask how you know this? Skeet and Penelope are tight. Bo rolls his eyes. If I had a nickel for every time I heard Skeet crushing on Wade, I'd be a rich man. He grimaces as if realizing what he just said. Sorry he says, throwing me an apologetic look. I wave a hand. It cuts to hear Bo speak those words because everything he's saying is spot on. I don't get it, Memphis says. 
Why would Skeet be interested in a panty waist like Wade? Why does any woman like Wade? I grumble. They can't see past his shiny exterior. Yeah, right on. So what if the old Ford is a bit rusty? A woman should be able to look past a few dings and see the strength of the engine. Bo shoves me in the arm. Right, Jess? Very funny, I say dryly. All right, Bo sighs. I can tell this thing is eating you alive. What can we do to help? He looks at Memphis. Yeah, Memphis pipes in dutifully. How can we help? You can start by knocking Wade Claiborne into next week, I growl. Bo wrinkles his nose. I would do that, man, but I promised Presley that I'd keep my nose clean. His voice is coated with laughter as he motions at Memphis. You could do it. It wouldn't take much for you to wipe the floor with that pansy. You could show him some of your fancy schmancy moves. Memphis tips his head like he's considering Bo's suggestion. I could, he wrinkles his brows. No, nah, Penn would hang me up by my toenails. You know how your sister is, he says to Bo. Cut it out, I bark, knowing that the two of them have no intention of doing a dang thing to Wade Claiborne. Sorry, man, we're just teasing, Bo counters. A second later, his voice goes practical. Look, you knew you were taking a risk when you became best buds with Skeet. Once you get put in the friend zone, it takes an act of Congress to get you out. I wasn't pretending to be Skeet's friend. I heave back. Everything I feel for her is painfully real. I shouldn't have brought up Trotter or culinary school. The last thing I want to do is to hurt Skeet. I just want her to give us a chance. Bo holds up a hand, his voice calm and reasonable. I know. You care about her. You always have. I haven't always felt this way, I argue. This only came up a couple years ago. Bo's eyes ping with amusement. This is me you're talking to, remember? You've had a thing for Skeet ever since y'all kissed in junior high. That's why you gave her the cold shoulder. Because you didn't know how to deal with your attraction. Bo's voice reeks with such an all-knowing confidence that it strips me clean to the bone. Sometimes I hate that he knows me so well. Why do you think it didn't work out with Brene? Bo continues. Okay, he's going too far. You know why, I huff. Renee wanted to get serious and I wasn't ready. Exactly, Bo flings back with a hint of exasperation. You weren't ready because she wasn't the one. This is ridiculous, I mutter. You don't have a clue about women. Your relationship with Presley was blind luck. You keep telling yourself that. Bo quips in amusement. Enough of this crap. If I wanted to get chomped down to the size of an anthill, I could have spent the day with Skeet. I rise to leave. Hold it, Bo insists. Don't rush off. I just might have a solution for you. A mild interest prickles through me. I'm listening. Part of the reason why Skeet's giving you the cold shoulder is because you've made it too easy for her. That's absurd. I shoot back reflexively before my mind can fully process what Bo even said. Memphis tips his head. You may be right. Bo sticks out his chest. Of course I am, he brags. I smirk. Yep. You're always the smartest person in the room. Yeah, yeah. Bo flashes a taunting grin. It's just good to hear you say it, brother. According to you, I add. Bo rolls his eyes. As I was saying, you've made it way too easy on Skeet. 
His voice goes soft and whiny to mimic a woman. Jasper, come and fix my sink, change the light bulbs, organize my garage, alphabetize my spices. Jasper, come over and hang out so we can watch a chick flick. A geyser of heat spews up my neck as I pop Bo in the arm. Ouch, he yowls. Was that really necessary? You got off easy, I warn. And for the record, I did not alphabetize Skeet's spice rack. Well, you did everything else, Bo counters. I can't refute that. So what if I help Skeet out on occasion? Is that a crime? Memphis hoots. Do I need to separate y'all? His eyes flick with adventure. Or better yet, y'all could box it out. I'm ready when you are. I growl, throwing Bo a heated glare. Hold your horses, Bo laughs. I'll fight you, but first you need to hear me out. I clamp my arms over my chest. Every time Skeet so much as flicks her finger, you come running. He shakes his head. That's poor form, man. You want her to respect you. Not true. I mumble, his words digging into me. Is it so terrible that I'm a loyal friend to Skeet? Bo makes me sound pathetic. You need to take the bull by the horns here, Bo insists. Show Skeet who's boss. A hard amusement simmers in my chest. Like you do to Presley? The look on Bo's face is priceless. He knows I've got him. Bo's a sucker for Presley. She's got him wrapped around her little finger. He has been counting the days until she gets back from her tour with Hartley Reigns. Bo holds out a hand. All I'm saying here is that you need to make Skeet work for your affection. I have to admit that I'm semi-intrigued by that idea. Continue. As long as Skeet thinks you're pining away for her, she'll never recognize your value. You need to make her jealous by flaunting another woman in front of her. Disappointment sinks like lead in my gut. That's your big idea? I should know better than to listen to Bo's advice on women. Yeah, Bo fires back like he's stating a well-known fact. Women want what they can't have. Why am I wasting my time listening to this nonsense? I know Bo means well, and I appreciate that he cares. However, this is rotten advice. A wave of weariness settles over me as my words come out flat. You're assuming Skeet will care that I'm with someone else. She certainly didn't seem to mind that I was with Renee. In fact, she was always giving me advice on ways to improve my relationship. A knowing grin slides over Bo's face. Oh, she'll care. Skeet cares about you more than she would ever admit. Maybe even more than she realizes. You just have to paint a picture for her. Hope kindles in my chest. Is Bo right? Does Skeet care? Do I dare take advice from Bo about women? To Bo's credit, he did have a lot of skirts chasing him. Maybe there is some merit to his words. Once Skeet realizes that she could lose you, she'll come around. I guarantee it. Bo's voice rings with conviction. I look at Memphis. What's your take on the situation? He blinks like he's surprised that I'm getting his input. Well, I think Bo has a point. People do normally want what they can't have. Uncertainty stabs through me. What if I go along with this plan and Skeet's not even remotely jealous? That would mean that she really doesn't care. Am I prepared to accept that? I don't know. I hedge. Look at it this way, Memphis points out. At least you'll know how Skeet feels about you. That's true, I concede. 
The biggest problem with Bo's little plan is that I've always prided myself on being a straight shooter, one who has no patience for silly games, especially when it comes to the opposite sex. I don't want to toy with Skeet's affections. I want to cut to the chase and have a bona fide relationship with her. You should ask Renee to go to the town Valentine's dance with you, Bo suggests. A checkmate grin curves his lips. When Skeet sees you with your ex, it'll drive her crazy. I jerk, my eyes flying open wide. No way. I made it clear to Renee that the two of us are through. I don't want to confuse things. Renee would jump at the chance to go to the dance with me, which is why I have no intention of asking her. It wouldn't be fair to lead Renee on. I think it's a good idea, Memphis interjects. My jaw hardens. Well, I don't. Bo gives me a speculative look. Let me ask you a question. I'm listening, I say, wariness seeping through me. Do you want Skeet or not? Irritation crawls down my spine. You know the answer to that. Okay, then you need to step up to the plate. Now that Wade Claiborne's in the picture, the stakes are bound to get high. I hate the words coming out of Bo's mouth. He's right, of course. Why does everything have to be so dang complicated? Shouldn't the fact that Skeet and I are already so close give me the upper hand? The way I see it, you got two choices. You can sit around and do nothing. Hope that the thing with Wade and Skeet will fizzle out. Or, I never said Skeet was going after Wade, I say hotly. Bo gives me a pointed look, ignoring my outburst. Or, you can take the bull by the horns and give yourself a fighting chance to win Skeet. Your decision. I glance at Memphis and can tell that he wholeheartedly agrees. I'm caught between a rock and a hard place. The sinking feeling in my gut tells me that Skeet and Wade will become an item. I know it as well as I know that the sun will set this evening. How could any guy resist Skeet? I rub a hand over my forehead. Leading Renee on doesn't sit well. I'm not going to be one of those weasels who uses women. I get that. Bo acknowledges. You don't have to lead her on, Memphis chimes in. I look across the table, waiting for him to expound. Just tell Renee you want to go to the dance as friends, Memphis continues. A large grin fills Bo's face. Yeah, that's the ticket. Play that friend card. This time it'll work for your benefit. I roll the notion around in my head. I guess I could do that. Renee and I are on friendly terms. If I make it clear that we're going as friends, then there won't be any misunderstanding. Memphis slaps me on the back. Good. It's all settled. It's not settled. Not by a long shot. So I'm just supposed to take Renee to the dance and then somehow things will magically work out with Skeet? That seems like a stretch. Yeah, I see where you're coming from. Bo drums his fingers on the table, his jaw working. A few seconds later, he slaps the table. I'm a genius. A pleased as punch chuckle rumbles in his throat. Jess... You're gonna thank me for this one. My eyebrow slides up. I've got the plan of all plans. He pumps his eyebrows. You ready for this? Just spit it out, I grumble, tired of him keeping me on the hook. Bo heaves his legs over the bench where we're sitting and springs to his feet. He hops lightly from foot to foot, holding up his fists. Let's box a round or two first, while I roll the plan around a few times in my head. I rise to my feet, a smirk pulling at my lips. 
The only thing that's going to be rolling around in your head are cuckoo birds when I punch your lights out. Bo's eyes gleam with anticipation. You got fire crackling in you. I like that. He taunts. I've got plenty of fire raging through me like a river. If Wade Claiborne were here, I'd knock him into next week. Seeing as that's wishful thinking, Bo will have to do. Chapter 6 My thoughts are still boiling over the things Jasper said to me as I pull up to Henry Roach's house and park along the curb. It was utterly unfair of Jas to equate my reluctance to get involved with him romantically to my fear of getting another dog or me passing up the opportunity to go to culinary school. A, I'm living proof that a person can do just fine without a dog. B, not going to culinary school is one of my biggest regrets. However, I've done okay. Once I earn enough money to purchase the bakery, I'll be a business owner. That's nothing to sneer at. The clogging thing was the last straw. The nerve of Jasper judging me about how I choose to burn calories. I'll clog a sock in his miserable throat the next time he tries to pick me apart. Enough brooding over Jasper. I need to think about my plans for the rest of the day. I refuse to let Jasper put a damper on my day off. After I talk some reason into Henry, I'm heading back home to grab Alice and take her to the vet. Excitement spritzes through my veins at the thought of seeing Wade Claiborne. An unbidden image of Jasper flashes before my eyes. The memory of his lips on mine rustles heat through my body. Okay. I order myself. Stop thinking about the kiss. You have to be sensible. You did the right thing by putting the kibosh on any budden relationship with Jasper. One of us has to be the adult. Also, I don't want to be with a man who's a moronic idiot. I'll bet Wade Claiborne wouldn't judge me. He doesn't care if I clog or if I didn't go to culinary school. That's why I need a romantic relationship with a man who doesn't know all of my flaws. A fresh start is what I need. Taking in a deep breath, I turn my focus to Henry Roach. He lives on the edge of the historical part of town. Even though his house is only a couple of streets over from Penelope's bed and breakfast, the area is vastly different. Henry Street marks the dividing point between the affluent section and the lower income district, made up mostly of government subsidized housing. Henry Roach's background is a bit of a mystery. All anyone knows is that Henry moved to Comfort a decade ago to be with Gladys, who was a native of Comfort. Henry and Gladys met through an online dating site. While they seemed content with one another, I've always wondered how they managed to get together. The two of them were polar opposites. Gladys always wore a big, radiant smile and looked for ways to help people. Henry is cantankerous and has no patience with anyone or anything. With his perpetual scowl that's deeply carved into his jowls, his long, solemn face and sad eyes, he reminds me of a basset hound. I know that Henry loved Gladys because his grief over her death has made him even more difficult to deal with. Gladys was a fanatic about Valentine's Day. She would go all out, decorating her front door, porch, and yard with various sizes of pink and red valentines and cupids. Some of the townsfolk considered her fetish tacky, but others enjoyed bringing their significant others to take pictures in front of the home. Gladys would box up her signature walnut fudge and package it in pink boxes and matching ribbons to give as gifts to all who came to take pictures. 
It occurs to me that it was Gladys who first started the town tradition of holding the cutie pie dance on Valentine's Day. No wonder Henry is acting out. Sympathy wells in my chest, crowding out my frustration over having to come here on my day off. The house looks barren without the Valentines, as if it's also mourning the loss of Gladys. This year, there will be no happy couple snapping pictures, no boxes of fudge, and no warm welcome from Gladys. She left a gaping hole in the heart of comfort that is especially noticeable now during her favorite holiday. As I open the car door and get out, shrieks split the air. It sounds like alley cats trying to claw their way out of a washing machine on the spin cycle. My stomach lurches. Someone's in trouble. I hear the high-pitched squeaks of what sounds to be kids, followed by the low gurgle of a man. My heart leaps into my throat as I hurry around to the side of the house. I halt in my tracks, unable to believe what I'm seeing. Henry is spraying three boys in their early teens with a water hose as they attempt to run away. One boy slips and falls, planting his face into the grass. Determination creases Henry's brow as he aims the hose at the fallen boy, dousing him with water. The boy tries to get up, but the force of the water knocks him back down. That'll teach you, Henry cackles with feverish glee. Has the ornery old goat completely lost it? The sight of the helpless boy being soaked with water causes something inside me to snap. Stop! I scream, darting over to Henry. I reach for the water hose and attempt to pry it from his hands. He's surprisingly strong. We wrestle, sending the water shooting high into the air like a slithering snake. The boy takes the opportunity to scramble to his feet and then sprints to catch up with his buddies. Let go, Henry growls, exerting all his strength to wrench the sprayer from my hands. Then the unthinkable happens. His foot slips on the wet grass. The whites of his eyes pop as he falls back, taking me down with him. I sit up, dazed. My first thought is to make sure Henry's okay. He's sitting upright and appears to be fine, from what I can tell. Well, other than the fact that he's madder than a trapped hornet. Are you okay? I stammer, rubbing my elbow. It's smarting from taking the brunt of the fall. Before Henry can answer, jeering laughter cuts him off short. I look across the vacant field that runs alongside Henry's home. The boys are standing at the other side. Serves you right, old fart, one of the boys yells. Recognition dings through my brain. The boy speaking is Lance Wallace. I know his mother. She works as a server at the restaurant on Main Street. The boy on Lance's right raises his hand and shoots Henry a bird. Lance and the boy on his left call Henry a few unsavory names. Stay away from my house, Henry yells, the veins in his neck turn into ropes as he shakes his fist. Or next time, you'll get worse. The boys laugh and scamper away as Henry turns his venom on me. This is your fault, he bellows. My eyes fly open wide. My fault? I'm not the one who was dousing the kid with the hose. Serves him right. I've told them time and time again to stay off the swing. Henry's voice is normally gravelly. However, it's scratchy with so much outrage that I can almost believe his throat is coated with sandpaper. I look at the wooden swing in question. Sure, it looks nice with the canopy, I'll bet it cost a pretty penny. Still, all that for a silly swing? This man is unbelievable. I throw him a glare as I rise to my feet. My muscles are already stiff, letting me know that I'll probably be sore tomorrow.
Henry's face darkens. It's not silly. I had that swing special order for Gladys. It's teak. Ah, I'm starting to see the full picture. This is about Henry's grief. I bend over and extend a hand. Here, let me help. He pushes my hand away with a grunt. It's crazy how fast anger scalds through me. Suit yourself, I quip. With a considerable amount of effort, Henry manages to get back up on his feet. Then he loses his balance and topples sideways. Luckily, I manage to catch him before he falls again. Whoa, I caution. Easy does it. I hate those pesky kids, Henry seeds. Somebody ought to teach them a lesson. They have filthy mouths. Yes, I concede. Someone needs to give them a good talking to. Amen, Henry thunders. The world would be better off without that riffraff. Hold it, I interject in an ironclad tone. Henry blinks in surprise. I look him in the eye, punching out my words. That's easy for you to say, when you have a nice home and all the comforts you could ever want. My voice rises in both pitch and volume. Outrage burns like gasoline through my veins, fueling my boldness. Do you know anything about the kid you were assaulting with the hose? I get up in Henry's face. Do you? Henry's eyes go round as I rush on. It just so happens that Lance Wallace's dad left before he was even born. His mom, Lizette, works at the restaurant on Main Street waiting tables. She also cleans houses on the weekends to make ends meet. That still doesn't excuse the kid's bad behavior, Henry protests, but his voice has lost its ferocity. He glances at the swing. His veil of fury slips enough to reveal a sliver of naked grief. My anger immediately evaporates. I let out a long breath. The only way that kids like Lance will ever have a fighting chance is if good, upstanding citizens, I make air quotes, take an interest in them. I lock eyes with Henry. He may be cantankerous, but I'm not backing down from this one. You sound like Gladys. His words are spoken as a compliment, and Henry offers me the tiniest of smiles. He's not wearing his dentures, and his lips seem to dissolve into his face like a sinkhole. It strikes me that Henry is frail. His mustard yellow sweater gives his skin a sickly pallor. Or maybe the color of the sweater has nothing to do with it. I've heard rumors that Henry's health was poor, but every other time I've been around him, he seemed so strong and determined that I figured he was perfectly fine. Henry Roach is way too mean to die anytime soon. I need to put the hose away. His voice is deflated, his shoulders sagging. I'll do it, I offer, relieved when he nods his consent. I make short work of winding the hose around the metal hanger attached to the siding of his house. Then I give the knob on the faucet a hard twist to make sure the water is off. His head hanging low, Henry shuffles around to the back of the house. I follow behind him. Grasping the handrail, he trudges up the steps leading to his back door. He looks back over his shoulder. Don't just stand there like a knot on a log. Come in. I was hesitating at the bottom step. At his devil tongue prodding, I bound up the steps and then have to slow back down so that I'm not crowding him. Henry crosses the floor in labored movements and then collapses in one of the kitchen chairs. His entire body seems to quiver in relief at being able to sit down. Concern threads a tight cord through my insides. Are you okay? He nods, swiping a hand across his forehead. 
The chair directly across from him goes scraping back, giving me a start. It runs through my brain that Henry must have shoved the legs with his foot. Have a seat, he commands. He takes in a labored breath, his shoulders heaving in the process. My feet remain rooted to the floor as I moisten my lips. Is there anyone I should call to get you help? Shit, he croaks. So much for feeling sympathy for him. Fine. I grumble as I march over and sit down. The vinyl on the chair crinkles in protest as I shift to find a comfortable spot. The metal table and chairs look like they came straight out of the 1950s. Gladys's love for collecting antiques is evident throughout the kitchen. I feel like I'm in a Cracker Barrel restaurant. Vintage metal cans line a shelf that runs along the top of one wall. Wooden knickknacks are crowded into every nook and cranny. My eye catches on a rolling pin resting on the island. I can't imagine Henry using it for cooking. Maybe he's keeping it handy in the event that he gets the chance to bludgeon some poor, unsuspecting soul who happens to cross his path. Like me. Eek, okay, I'm being overly dramatic. Henry's not going to bludgeon me with the rolling pin. At least I hope not. He looks pretty spent. The sunken skin around his eyes resembles an overripe banana. Dark age spots mar his face. I should be more worried about Henry needing emergency care rather than him hurting me. I glance at the kettle on the stove. Can I make you a cup of tea or coffee? Something hot? The back of my jeans is damp from the wet grass. I'm sure Henry's clothes are also damp. I don't want him to get chilled and catch a cold. Yeah, Henry's a grouch, but that doesn't mean I should just turn my back on him. It's plain as the nose on my face that he's having a hard time without Gladys. He flicks a hand in annoyance before settling back in his seat. No tea or coffee. Tell me more about the boy. His words are spoken by one who's used to being in complete control of his surroundings. I wonder what Henry did for a living before coming to comfort and marrying Gladys. You want to know about Lance? He nods. Wow, I'm surprised that Henry cares enough to ask. I run my tongue over my lower lip, composing my thoughts. It's good that Henry has taken an interest in someone else. Maybe he's turning a corner. I know that his mother, Lizette, worries about him. He arches a bushy eyebrow. How do you know that? His tone is sharp, confrontational. She told me, I answer simply. Last month when she came in to order Lance's birthday cake, he was turning 13. Henry grunts. He acts like he's 10. A dry chuckle rumbles in my throat. I can't argue with you there. Lance and his buddies made spectacles of themselves. No question about that. Even so, I don't condone Henry spraying Lance down, especially after the poor kid fell to the ground. Talk about stripping away a person's dignity. Henry's behavior is inexcusable. I pick back up on my narrative. Lizette struck up a conversation, telling me that she's concerned about Lance growing up without a father. Lizette works so much that she doesn't feel like she spends enough time with Lance. He rolls his eyes. Obviously. His reaction grates on my nerves. I lean forward, looking him in the eye. Did you ask me to tell you about Lance so that you could take pot shots at him and his mother? I'm learning very quickly that the best way to deal with Henry is full on, holding nothing back. Henry blinks in surprise. No, he says in such a forthright manner that I believe him. You care about the boy, Henry asserts. I suppose I do. You need to give Lizette some slack. She would spend more time with Lance if she could. 
Things are never as shut and dry as they seem. He wrinkles his nose. Shut and dry? What's that supposed to mean? Heat fans my face as my words tumble out. I meant cut and dry. Oh, cut and dry, he repeats. A smile breaks over his lips, revealing his toothless gums. Seeing Henry without his dentures gives me the willies. Gladys cared about people, too. Yes, she did. Gladys was a good woman. His eyes glisten as he clears his throat. The best, he says gruffly. I know you miss her, I say softly. His jaw works as he looks away. I can tell from the stiffening of his shoulders and the slight quiver of his chin that Henry's trying to get his emotions under control. A couple seconds later, he wins the battle and shifts his focus back to me. His transformation is astounding. Had I not witnessed it firsthand, I would have never realized how close he came to losing it. What would you do to help the boy? His voice is no nonsense. His question startles me. I um, I'm not sure, I hedge. Guilt wraps me in a tight blanket. I've been so consumed with the bakery that I haven't had much time to think of anyone else. I'm sure there are lots of kids in Comfort who need some type of help. I figure that most of the residents of Comfort are like me. We feel for underprivileged kids, but there's only so much of us to go around. Henry looks disappointed. My brain races to come up with a solution, or at least a plausible suggestion. For starters, I blurt, I'd make a place for kids like Lance to go while their parents are at work. Some sort of outreach program. Yes, that would work. Henry dips his head in thought. You mean like a daycare center? I knit my brows. No, not necessarily. More like an activity center, a place where kids would want to go and hang out. They could do things such as bowling and hiking, but with mentors to guide them, I add. An outreach program costs money. Yeah, I shrug. It was just an idea, I say defensively. After all, Henry did ask. Oh, and while we're dreaming, I'd build a park. Interest kindles in his watery eyes. What kind of park? This time my answer is immediate. One with a playground for the kids and walking trails for the grown-ups. Maybe an ultimate frisbee course. He studies me with a scrutiny that makes me squirm. Unable to take the discomfort anymore, I raise my eyebrow. What? One second goes by. Two, you remind me a lot of Gladys, he finally says. He looks past me, staring into the distance. She was always making her fudge and giving it away. A reminiscent smile overtakes his lips. She'd put those ridiculous valentines all over the place. He balls a hand and places it over his mouth. I used to tease Gladys about cutting into the bakery's business during Valentine's Day. He lowers his fist. Her fudge was the best. It was, I agree. It's on the tip of my tongue to say something else in an attempt to soothe Henry's pain, but I fear that it would backfire. The man has never opened up before. I should probably leave well enough alone. He gives me a steely look. Now, about that gosh-awful key lime pie you keep serving. I feel my eyes bug and am ready to launch into a heated defense when I catch the wicked gleam in Henry's eye. Suddenly, I know exactly what's going on here. I remind Henry of Gladys. He was searching for an excuse to have me stop by and bashing my pie did the trick. 
I sit back and fold my arms over my chest. I guess I'll have to make you another one and have it delivered tomorrow afternoon. A deep frown creases his face, bringing the basset hound out full force. I can almost see the wheels turning in his head. It's my company that Henry craves. Not in some weird way, but more like I'm the daughter he never had. Of course, what do I know? Henry may well have a daughter or a son. Or, I continue, sitting up and pressing my index finger into the table. You could stop by the bakery and pick up the pie. We could chat over a cookie or two. And for Jasper's information, I'll refrain from clogging afterward. I can handle a hundred calories or so, I think. How many calories make up a pound? God, maybe Jasper's right. I guess I do fear failure. Some nights I wake up in a panic, thinking that I must be out of my mind to try and purchase the bakery. Am I cut out to own a business? Managing is one thing. But at the end of the day, if profits are down, then Abigail has to handle it. Of course, profits have been way up since I started managing, but that's beside the point. It's the what-ifs that I have a problem with. Henry cuts into my thoughts. Make it a chocolate iced brownie, and you've got a deal. My eyebrow slides up. Under one condition. Amusement flicks across his wrinkled face. I'm listening. I wag a finger. There'll be no more threats about getting Nellie Kinsey to do an expose on the bakery. He gives me a busted look before thick laughter bursts through his lips, sounding like watery sludge trying to work its way through a drain pipe. <laughs> no promises. First, we'll have to wait and see how good that pie of yours is. My phone rings, startling me. I had forgotten that I put it and my car key in my front pocket. I sit back and slide my phone out of my pocket. My eyes fly open wide. It's Jasper. Quickly, I press the button on the side to silence it. Don't not answer on my account. Henry mumbles. It's okay. I can call him back later. Interest simmers in Henry's eyes. He? Just a friend of mine, I say casually. But I can tell that Henry's not buying it. Who's the friend? He wants to know. Henry Roach is the last person I would ever discuss my problems with. I'm surprised that he's being so inquisitive. I wrinkle my nose. No, that's not the word I'm looking for. It's insensitive. No, intrusive. The word clicks through my brain like a key fitting nicely into a lock. Intrusive, that's it. I scoot my chair back with a loud scrape. The sound of metal scraping the wood gives me an adverse chill. The chair legs have rubber caps at the bottom, but they must be worn out. Henry frowns. What's your hurry? I thought you were going to make us a pot of tea. You said you didn't want tea, I argue. He thrusts out his chin. Can't a fella change his mind? Yeah, I guess. I have a couple of hours before I'm due to take Alice to the vet. Still, I don't want to spend two hours talking to Henry. God, that sounds bad. I really should be more compassionate. The poor man lost his wife and is all alone. That's why he's lashing out at everyone. It's a plea for help. I offer a silent prayer, asking for patience. No, maybe I shouldn't pray for patience. After all, I don't want heaven to heap trials on me so that I can learn to be patient. Is it too late to retract my prayer? I can make some tea, I hear myself say as I stand to retrieve the kettle so that I can fill it with water. 
My phone dings this time instead of ringing. I look down, realizing I'm still holding it in my hand. It's Jasper again. This time he sends me a text. We need to talk. I shove the phone back into my pocket. Jasper works 24 hours on and 48 hours off. Today is the second leg of his time off. He reports back to the station early tomorrow morning. If I can evade him for the rest of the day, then I won't have to deal with this until Sunday. I need time to sort through my feelings. Yeah, the kiss was spectacular. Heat wafts through me, remembering the fierceness in his eyes when he grabbed me and kissed me the second time. So help me. I liked the forcefulness of his lips and how they licked fire through my blood. I didn't dare fan my face earlier when Jasper saw me in the tub, but I can certainly do so now. My hand goes up, fanning vigorously. I've got to get over my attraction to Jasper. It's in both of our interests to move past this and resume our friendship. If you're hot, we can turn down the heat, Henry says in his garbled voice. No, I'm good. I grasp the wooden handle of the kettle and take it over to the sink where I fill it up. Where do you keep your tea? I ask as I carry the kettle back to the stove and place it on the front burner. The cupboard to the left of the sink, Henry directs. Once the tea is made, I carry both cups back to the table and place one in front of Henry. I sit back down in my seat, cupping my hands around the mug. The warmth feels good on my skin. I'm not really sure how to go about making polite conversation with Henry. I guess I could ask about his background. Rather than raising his cup to his lips, Henry lowers his mouth to the rim and slurps the liquid noisily. A giggle blips through my throat. Luckily, I manage to swallow it down before it escapes. Henry reminds me of a kid in many ways. Maybe that's why he didn't think twice about assaulting Lance with the water hose. So you and Gladys met online? We did. Where are you from? California, he croaks. The Bay Area. I love San Francisco. I went there when I was a teenager. The Golden Gate Bridge is so magnificent. What type of work did you do, professionally? A little of this and a little of that, Henry says offhandedly. Okay, it's obvious he doesn't want to talk about himself. My phone dings again. I pull it out with a heavy sigh. It's from Jasper. This time his text says, Ignoring me won't fix the problem. Henry motions to the phone with his gnarly hand. Is that your friend? His voice drips with so much sarcasm that I can't help but laugh. <laughs> yes, it's my friend. I shake my head. Things are complicated between us right now. Ah, complicated. Meaning you like him. Of course I like him, I snip. He's my friend. The wide smile that stretches over Henry's lips makes him look like a wise turtle or Yoda. Gladys and I started out as friends, too. Really? For a second, I forget about my own troubles. He nods and slumps against the back of his seat. Yep. His expression brightens, paling a decade from his face. Gladys was hesitant for us to get involved, but I pursued her. I can be very persuasive, he finishes with a note of pride. I have to bite back my smile. Persuasive would not be a word I would use to describe Henry Roach. Maybe you should give your friend a chance. It's not like that with Jasper and me, I blurt. Ah, Jasper. He taps his fingers on his mug. 
Would that be Jasper Donaldson, the fireman? The walls crowd in around me as I gulp. I've said too much. I don't want Henry knowing my business. Jasper and I are just friends. My face is hot enough to ignite into a fiery ball of flames. His eyes sparkle with humor. You might want to fan your face again. A high-pitched giggle rises in my throat. This time I can't hold it back. Okay, I admit. Things between Jasper and me are a little strange right now. Or strained, I wrinkle my nose. They're both strange and strained. How so? I let out a long sigh. I'd rather not get into this, if you don't mind. I understand, he nods. Some things are hard to talk about. I shift in my seat, chewing on my inner cheek. It's not that. I just don't know how I feel about the two of us. I don't want to ruin our friendship. A low chuckle rolls from his throat. <laughs> That's what Gladys said. Really? I guess Gladys and I were more alike than I realized. I know we both love to bake. Gladys's buttermilk pound cake was legendary. How did you and Gladys make the transition from friendship to something more? He shrugs. Like anyone else does, I guess. One breath at a time. A perceptive light flicks in his eyes. Maybe you should give Jasper a chance. He seems like a decent fellow. A smile tugs at my lips. He's the best. All right, there you have it. He looks thoughtful. Hey, I'll be happy to put in a good word for you with Jasper. No! I nearly shout and then regret my outburst the second I see Henry's startled expression. No, I say in a softer tone, offering an apologetic smile. I need to work through this on my own. Henry frowns. There's no shame in accepting help. I know, I assure him. I appreciate your offer, I really do. I sift through the contents of my mind, trying to articulate a halfway decent explanation that will hopefully suffice Henry. It's just that I'm not sure that I want to be with Jasper that way. There's someone else in the picture. His eyes widen. Another girl? No, another guy. Sheesh. Why do I feel like such a louse for admitting that? It's not like Jasper and I are a couple. I'm working through my feelings. I don't want to hurt Jasper. I just want to be honest. With him or yourself? I jerk frustration firing through me. Why would I be upset with myself? I retort, giving Henry a hard look. He shrugs his shoulders. I don't know, but that's how you seem. Well, I'm not frustrated with myself, I snip. If anything, I I'm frustrated with Jasper for pushing the envelope. Why am I having this conversation with Henry? His opinion of Jasper and me has no relevance. I've known Henry since he moved to Comfort, and this is the first in-depth conversation I've had with him. Before today, I didn't think Henry was capable of having a meaningful conversation. He nods in some secret understanding that cuts to the center of my soul. Just remember, he admonishes, one breath at a time. Moisture blurs my vision as I blink, throwing Henry a tight smile. Well, seeing as how I can't quit breathing, I guess I'll just keep on doing it and hope that things will eventually work themselves out, I add to myself. Chapter 7 Chimney Cricket I'm so nervous that I could barf. Let's go, Alice, 
I coo as I remove the cat carrier from the back seat. My heart is hammering a mile a minute. I take in a breath, trying to get a grip. I force my feet to move across the parking lot and to the entrance of the veterinary clinic. All the while, I keep reminding myself that as far as Wade Claiborne is concerned, I'm here to have him look at Alice. Alice is hunkered down on the bottom of the carrier, her eyes darting around nervously. From what I can tell, Alice appears to be perfectly fine after her tree escapade. However, getting the vet's seal of approval will do wonders to ease Laura Lee's nerves. When Tina, the middle-aged receptionist, sees me, a broad grin stretches over her face. Hi, Skeet. Laura Lee called and said that you'd be bringing Alice in. No need to fill out any paperwork. We have Laura Lee's information on file. Have a seat and someone will call you back shortly. I go over and find a seat, smiling and nodding at the people in the waiting area. Most of the pets are in carriers. However, Mr. Paulson's Labrador retriever is sitting by his feet. There's a peculiar smell at a vet's office. It's a mixture of chemicals and animals. It darts through my mind that Blakely might have had a point about Wade's smelling. I laugh inwardly. I'm sure Wade doesn't smell. He's a dreamboat. Everything about him is impeccable. I sit for 35 minutes, watching other people get called back until finally it's my turn. My heart picks up its pace as I follow behind the dark-haired girl in her early 20s who's wearing green scrubs. She ushers me into a room. I sit down, balancing the carrier in my lap. What seems to be the problem? She asks in a perky tone as she goes over to the computer. I don't recognize the girl, and I wonder if she's new to comfort, or maybe she's from one of the surrounding areas. I give her the short version of what happened. She nods, pecking on the keyboard. After she's done, she turns her attention to Alice and says in a gushy tone, You've had quite a scare, but it'll be okay. Dr. Claiborne will be in shortly. Alice's ear flicks in response. I could almost believe that she understood the girl. Or more likely, she was just responding to the girl's intonations. Dr. Claiborne is finishing up a procedure, but will be in shortly, she informs me as she leaves the room. I touch my hair and smooth a hand over my blouse. Calm down, I order myself, but my words do little good. I feel like my heart is trying to punch through my ribcage. What should I say to Wade? Should I mention his breakup with Colette? No, that would be bad form. I could simply ask how he's doing. Suggest that we grab a coffee or go for a walk. No, a walk would be dumb. It's not super cold in comfort right now, but it's still wintertime. By the time the door opens, I've worked myself up into such a frenzy that I'm sweating like a horse. It's a good thing I wore a dark-colored blouse. Otherwise, the sweat rings beneath my arms would be visible. Wade steps into the room and blinks in surprise. Hey, Skeet. I saw Alice's name on the chart and was expecting Laura Lee. For a second, I sit tongue-tied. Wade's dark blonde hair is perfectly styled. I swear his features have been chiseled from stone with those high cheekbones and his aristocratic nose. I guess Jasper was right. Wade is a pretty boy. In fact, he's so pretty that I could hang him on my wall and salivate over him. His light blue eyes seem to hold a perpetual sparkle. He's wearing scrubs and a lab coat. The coat makes him look distinguished. Wade goes over to the stool and sits down. He gives me a funny look. Are you okay? I'm great. I squeak, a goofy grin wobbling over my lips. He motions to the carrier. So you brought Alice in for Laura Lee? Reality check. This is a vet appointment. Wade's a doctor. Of sorts. 
and here I am drooling over him like I'm some lovesick groupie. My cheeks go scalding hot. He probably thinks I'm the biggest doofus on the planet. I force my tongue into action, my words coming out fast, all in one big chunk. Alice got scared and ran up a tree, then she fell out of it. Laura Lee was worried about her but had to go to work, so I volunteered to bring her in. The air has completely left my lungs, leaving me no alternative other than to suck in an audible breath. Glad you got that out, Wade says, humor flickering over his features. Let's get Alice out so I can take a look at her. He and I both bend down to the carrier at the same time and butt heads. I'm so sorry, I laugh, mortified. No worries, Wade says easily. I've got it. I straighten back up in my seat. Meanwhile, Wade opens the carrier and scoops Alice out, cradling her in his arms. She lets out an irritated meow. It's okay, girl. He soothes, stroking her head. Heat stirs warm ribbons through my stomach as I look at his long fingers moving over Alice's white fur with such finesse. I wish he'd stroke my head like that. Alice nestles into his arms and begins purring loudly. She likes you. I guess all females, be they feline or human are immune to your charms. God, did I really just say that? Now he'll think I'm throwing myself at him. He looks puzzled. If Alice were immune to my charms, she wouldn't be purring. Huh? He shakes his head. Never mind. He carries Alice over and deposits her on the examining table. She stands up and arches her back as he rubs it. Alice takes in her surroundings with curious eyes. She seems to be fine, Wade surmises. How far did she fall? About 20 feet. That's not too bad. I think she's okay. Laura Lee will be relieved. Wade continues to stroke Alice. She rubs her head against his hand, purring like a motor. It was nice of you to bring Alice in for Laura Lee. It was no biggie, I say offhandedly. I was glad to help. How were things at the bakery? Nuts. With Valentine's Day and the cutie pie dance. I'm tempted to ask if he wants to go with me to the dance, but he'd probably balk. How are you doing? I ask instead wincing inwardly at the unnatural high-pitched edge in my voice. I can't complain, he says neutrally and then turns his attention back to Alice. Okay, girl, time to go back in the carrier. He scoops Alice into his arms and places her back inside the carrier. Alice lets out a few wounded meows like she's been betrayed. The visit is drawn to a close. I need to make a move pronto before my time runs out. My pulse thrashes against my ears as I search for something to say. I'm sorry about your mix-up with Colette. He dips his head, frowning. I beg your pardon? I rewind what I just said. I, I mean your breakup, I stammer. I'm sorry about your breakup with Colette. A shadow passes over his features. Thanks, he says tersely. I can't just let it go at that. My palms are swimming in icky perspiration. I moisten my lips. If you need someone to talk to, I'm here. Ew, that sounded lame brain. He flashes me an appreciative grin. Thanks, I'll keep that in mind. He's so dreamy with his even features and sexy scruff. For an instant, I'm caught in his spell like a fly mired in sticky syrup and have to blink myself out of it. My mouth disconnects from my brain and starts flapping a mile a minute. Would you like to go out sometime? I mean, not on a date, but maybe as friends? 
I take in a quick breath as nervous laughter skitters from my throat. We don't have to. It was just an idea. If you prefer not to, I'll understand. He tips his head. Sure. Why not? It takes a second for my brain to register what he just said. Wonderful, I exclaim. How about tomorrow night? We could grab a pizza or something? Sounds good. My heart soars as we exchange numbers. He agrees to pick me up at my house at six. See you then, he says, giving me a parting smile as he goes out the door. Victory! I want to laugh hysterically or squeal at the top of my lungs. I pick up the carrier and hold it up to my eye level. Did you hear that, Alice? I ask exuberantly. I've got a date with density. Ahem, destiny, tomorrow night. Alice lets out an irritated meow before plopping down and tucking her paws beneath her voluminous body. She's looking at me as if to say, you're such a fraud. I know the real reason why you brought me to the vet. Hush your mouth, Alice, I sass. No one likes a smarty pants. Alice belts out another short meow and looks away. The next day, I'm up to my elbows in cookie dough and fantasizing about my upcoming date with Wade when Ellie bursts through the swinging doors leading to the kitchen. Guess who's here? Before I can respond, she rushes on. Mr. Grump himself. Her expression goes sour. He's asking for you. Henry, she grunts. Henry Roach. I'd like to squash him like a roach, she mutters. That man doesn't have a kind word to say about anyone. Fire shoots from her eyes. Do you know what the old geezer said to me? I'm almost afraid to ask, I say dryly. She draws herself up to her full height. I told him that he should try one of our bear claws because they're to die for, and I just can't get enough of them. Henry came back with, I can certainly tell. Maybe you should lay off them. And then he makes a point of looking me up and down with this snotty expression that says, You're a lump of lard. What is it with Henry and wait? I can't for the life of me understand why Henry feels the need to be so mean and hateful. I always wondered what Gladys could possibly see in the man. And then yesterday, I caught a glimpse of the man behind the mask. It's too bad that Henry won't let more people see the real him. I don't know, but that man can't weigh a hundred pounds. She wags a finger her head moving saucily in rhythm as she speaks. That twig had better watch his mouth before somebody gives him a hard thump. I'll have you know I lost 23 pounds since Christmas. Thank you very much. You look great, Ellie, I say in all truthfulness. I place the mound of cookie dough into a large freezer bag and begin cleaning up the area. Tell Henry that I'll be out shortly. I really wish Henry would give the grumpy old man persona a rest. It might have worked well for Walter Matthau and Jack Lemon on film, but not so much in real life. This town is way too small to go around offending everyone. If Henry keeps up, the townsfolk will be ready to ride him out on a rail. Oh, no, Ellie counters, shaking her head. I'm not saying another word to that man. You don't pay me enough for that. I'll finish tidying up and you can handle Henry. Sounds good. Thank you. I untie my apron and remove my hairnet. As I walk to the front, I comb my fingers through my hair and fluff up my curls. I find Henry sitting at one of the tables glaring at a group of chatty moms and their rambunctious kids who are sitting nearby. What is it with Henry Roach and his distaste for anyone or anything that breeds happiness? Sure, the toddlers are a little rowdy, 
but I've gone to great lengths to create an environment where people want to congregate. When Henry sees me, he grunts, About time. It took you so long to get out here that I can feel my fingernails growing. I halt in my tracks, my spine going stiff. This is going to stop right here, right now. I refuse to be Henry's doormat. If it's a problem, I can always go back. Trust me when I say that I've got plenty of work to do. I eye him in a challenge. His jaw goes slack, causing the loose skin on his jowls to jiggle. No, it's all good, he grumbles. I pin him with a glare. Let's hope so. I pull out a chair and plop down. Now that I've made my position clear on his sour attitude, my angst toward him ebbs. How are you today, Henry? I ask brightly. Tolerable, for an old man. Laughter bubbles in my chest. This is about as agreeable as Henry Roach is going to get. I guess I should count myself lucky that he's being civil. Are you ready for that brownie? He smacks his lips as he nods. Let me get it for you. He frowns. Don't you have help that can do that? He looks past me and scowls at Tori, who's working the counter. Girl, he demands, we need some help over here. An incredulous laugh hiccups in my throat. Did he really just call Tori girl? Tori gets a deer-in-the-headlight expression as she looks from Henry to me. Fresh out of high school, Tori is bubbly and good with customers. However, she's still in training. I certainly don't want to subject her to the likes of Henry. Pipe down, I say to Henry as I get up and go over to the counter. Tori, I begin sweetly. Would you please get me a walnut fudge brownie and a pint of milk? Her eyes round as baseballs, she nods. I lean forward and whisper, Don't mind Henry. I flash her an appreciative smile. You're doing a great job. Thanks, she grins as she jumps into action, eager to please the boss. A few seconds later, she hands me the plate containing the brownie and milk. Thanks. I'd also like a chocolate chip cookie. I could live off of chocolate chip cookies. They're my guilty pleasure. Speaking of guilty pleasures, my senses rehash those electric kisses with Jasper. Stop it, I command myself. I've spent way too much time daydreaming about how forcibly his lips took mine, or how it felt to be in his powerful embrace. Jasper might not have the finesse of Wade, but he certainly makes up for it in his commanding presence, and it doesn't hurt that he's so fit with those chiseled muscles. I force my brain back to the cookie. Just to spite Jasper, I'll refrain from clogging off the additional calories after I eat it. I wonder how Jasper will react if he gets wind of me going out with Wade. A thick dread coats my throat as I swallow. I don't want to hurt him. And yet, I suppose it would be a good thing. Maybe it'll help put this thing between Jasper and me to rest, once and for all. I place Henry's brownie, milk, and a napkin in front of him and then sit down. He looks down at it, a horseshoe frown carving into his face. No fork? I cluck my tongue. Henry, you are something. His bushy brows dart together. What? Nothing, I sigh as I get up to retrieve the fork. All I can think right now is that Gladys must have been a saint to put up with him. I consider myself a relatively patient person. However, I'm not sure how much more of Henry's rotten attitude I can take before biting his head off. Here you go, I say as I hand Henry the fork. 
I sit back down and break off a piece of the cookie. I place it in my mouth, savoring the chewiness of the tender dough mixed with the satisfying sharpness of the semi-sweet chips. I can tell from Henry's rapturous expression that he's enjoying every morsel of the brownie. It's nice to see that the man can get some sense of enjoyment out of life. We eat in silence until the food is gone, at which point Henry wipes his mouth vigorously with the napkin, wads it up, and then places it on the plate. He gives me a speculative look. So, what's it gonna take to get you and Jasper together? I about jerk out of my skin. Not just because of what Henry asked, but also because of how he asked it. His voice is several volumes too loud. I can feel the moms at the table beside us eyeing me with interest. Shh, I hiss as I lean forward. I don't want the whole world to hear my business. I've got enough trouble as it is with Jasper. I certainly don't want to pile on an extra layer of town gossip. Amusement simmers in Henry's watery eyes. You like him? He taunts. I begin blinking fast as my rebuttal comes out in angry whispers. Of course I like him. Jasper's my best friend. But that doesn't mean I want to date him. I make a face. Why do you even care? I watch Henry for a reaction and am surprised to see the regret that flashes over his features. Gladys put up with a lot from me. I bark out a clipped laugh. I can only imagine. I compress my lips when I see his distraught expression. I'm sorry. That was uncalled for. Just because Henry is a pill doesn't give me an excuse to be catty. He waves a hand. You speak the truth. He grimaces. I'm no bed of roses. The corners of my lips twitch. I wouldn't be so sure about that. You certainly have the thorns down, Pat. Henry actually laughs at that. He points a bent finger. See, that's why I like you. You don't have any qualms about setting me straight. I certainly don't mind beating down trees and shaking down doors when the situation warrants, I quip. He looks confused for a second before hearty laughter rasps from his throat. I think you mean shaking down trees and beating down doors. A giggle rises in my throat. <laughs> yeah, that's what I meant. I certainly don't want to be accused of beating down trees. No, you don't, he agrees. That might leave you in a tough spot with the tree huggers out there. My brain connects the dots. I get it. Leave, tree huggers. Henry has attempted to make a joke. We share a smile. Henry looks much younger with his dentures in. I go back to my earlier question. Why do you care about Jasper and me? I ask quietly, glancing at the women at the next table. To my relief, they're engrossed in conversation, no longer paying any attention to Henry and me. Henry takes a breath. Grief shadows his eyes. Before she died, Gladys made me promise that I'd do something altruistic. He drums his fingers on the table. I figure getting two young lovers together fits the bill. Startled laughter bursts through my lips. <laughs> no offense, Henry, but you're barking up the wrong tree. I lower my voice. How many times do I have to tell you that Jasper and I are just friends? Irritation flashes in his eyes. Stop trying to deny it. I have a gut feeling about the two of you. His voice rings with a stubborn certainty. And one thing I know is that my gut never lies. I knew I needed to buy stock in IBM back in the day, just as I knew when to sell it. He ticks through the list as he touches his fingers. 
Then there was Amazon, Netflix, and Domino's. He lifts an eyebrow. Need I continue? I wave a hand. Okay, so you have a keen sense for business. That's not the same as knowing what's best for people. He grins. I knew that Gladys was the one for me. He boasts, sticking out his chest. I roll my eyes. Yeah, because it involved you. Don't presume that you know what's best for me. He squares his jaw. You'll see that I'm right. It occurs to me that it's a waste of time to argue with Henry. So he's misguided about Jasper and me. I suppose there's no harm in letting him entertain the notion, so long as he doesn't blast it to the world. You know, if you really want to be altruistic, then you'd help those who need it. Kids like Lance Wallace. Nah, I'll leave that for you to handle. That's a cop-out, I argue. He just laughs. The sound is wet and wheezy, making me wish he'd clear his throat. I sweep my hand around to encompass the room. I've got too much on my plate as it is. As much as I'd like to help Lance and kids like him, I don't have the time nor the resources to do so. An enigmatic smile pulls at his lips. Not now, but you will. Something about the smug way he speaks the words puts me on edge. What do you mean by that? I'm coming to learn that when it comes to Henry, I'm only seeing part of the picture. A very small part. He scoots his chair back and pushes himself to his feet. Seeing the effort it took for him to stand raises my sympathies. Well, I guess I'd better get to it, Henry says. No one lives forever, he says drolly. Concern tugs at my stomach. Are you okay? Henry is so frail, and he has those dark circles around his eyes. I'm fine, he answers in a tone that says his health is not up for discussion. Well, time for me to beat down those trees and shake down some doors. He winks and then laughs to himself. With that, he turns and hobbles across the room and out the door. Each step seems to be a great effort, and yet his steps are determined. He's definitely a man on a mission. What in the world is that man up to? There's no telling, my mind answers. I replay the odd conversation. It's absurd that Henry feels it's his duty to get Jasper and me together. Talk about a misguided sense of benevolence. Well, I utter under my breath, I guess Henry will have to get used to disappointment because I've got a hot date with the man of my dreams in a few short hours. It's not until I get back to the kitchen that I realize that I forgot to give Henry the key lime pie. Great. That means that I'll have to drop it off to him. Otherwise, he'll start squalling to my employees. I guess I can leave work a little early and stop by before I head home to get ready for the date. Chapter 8 By the time I spot Wade strolling up the walk to my house, my heart is beating so profusely that I feel like I'm about to have an out-of-body experience. I lean back against the wall and place a hand over my chest willing myself to calm down. The doorbell rings. A prayer for help races through my mind. I rub a moist hand over the bodice of my dress. And then, realizing that I can't stand here forever with him waiting outside, I plaster a smile over my face and open the door. Hey! I squeak. Hey! Wade shoves a hand into the front pocket of his jeans and shuffles his feet like he's nervous. I step back. Come on in. He does so, glancing around the foyer. Nice place. 
Thanks. It's a bit of a fixer-upper. I wish I had more time to do everything that I want, but the bakery keeps me so busy. I stop myself, realizing that I'm rambling. An awkward silence passes before Wade offers a polite smile. You ready? Sure. Disappointment ripples through me. I spent over an hour getting ready, but Wade is oblivious to my appearance. I get the feeling that I could be wearing a paper sack and he still wouldn't notice. I'm not sure how I expected him to react. Maybe a little more like Jasper, who photographs me with his intense, deep brown eyes. A peculiar longing shoots through me, taking me completely off guard. I wish it was Jasper here with me instead of Wade. There would be no awkward silences or wooden smiles. Maybe I'm jumping the gun here. After the date gets going, things are bound to settle down, right? I'll just grab my purse, I say as I leave Wade in the foyer and hurry to the kitchen to retrieve it. I come back with a renewed sense of purpose, determined to make the date a success. After all, I've been crushing on Wade for years. We go out to get in his car. His silver BMW is a subtle reminder of not only how successful he must be in his career, but also of the affluence of his family. His mother, Dottie, throws a lavish Christmas party every year at the country club. This past Christmas, she hired me to cater it. Of course, it wasn't just my skills in catering that Dottie was after. Her condition was that she'd hire me if I could get Presley to perform. Presley reluctantly agreed. She was a big hit, just as I knew she would be. However, it wasn't all smooth sailing. Her former manager and boyfriend showed up and tried to wreck her relationship with Bo. The manager almost succeeded. But thankfully, all was eventually resolved, and Presley and Bo got there happily ever after. My thoughts moved to Dottie. If everything does go well for Wade and me, do I really want a woman like that as my mother-in-law? I saw the pain and turmoil that Penelope went through with her former mother-in-law, Viola Norwood. I have to laugh at myself when I realize the direction my thoughts are taken. Wade and I are on our first date, and here I am marrying us off. I expect him to get my door and feel let down when he doesn't. I open the passenger door and get in. The smell of new leather permeates my senses. I fasten my seatbelt and shift to face Wade. New car? Sort of. I ordered a black one, but it hasn't come in yet. I'm driving this one in the meantime. Oh, well, it's nice. Thanks. An awkward silence stretches between us as he starts the engine and pulls away from the curb. Normally, I'm decent at making conversation, but my brain is scrambling for something to say. I don't want to get nervous and mix up my words. Wade will think I'm an idiot. So, are we getting a pizza? Yeah, that sounds good to me. Awesome. I moisten my lips. Think, Skeet. What would a man like Wade Claiborne like to talk about? I glance at his profile. Wade is certainly not one for conversation. That was nice of you to work Alice into your schedule yesterday. No problem. How's she doing? Great, I chuckle. I don't think there was a thing wrong with her. Wade nods, drifting off to silence. This is so dang awkward. How was your day? He looks thoughtful. Normal. What about you? Super busy. We're getting ready for Valentine's Day and the cutie pie dance. My pulse ratchets up several notches. Speaking of the dance, are you going? I hold my breath, waiting for his answer. My hands are clasped tightly in my lap. It seems to take forever for him to answer. 
I haven't given it much thought. You should go. He glances at me. You think so? Yeah, we could go together. I blurt. Okay, he says neutrally. I guess I should feel happier that he said yes. Maybe I would be if he would show the slightest trace of enthusiasm. Wade is with me in body, but I get the feeling that his mind is somewhere else. My chest squeezes. Maybe he's thinking about Colette. He was engaged to her. Do you care if I turn on the radio? Wade asks. No, not at all. I'm relieved to have something to fill the silence. As he turns the knob, I sit back in my seat and give up on trying to make polite conversation. By the time Wade polishes off his third slice of sausage and pepperoni pizza, his tongue begins to loosen. The conversation drifts to our growing up years as we compare notes about our mutual acquaintances. Wade graduated a year ahead of me. How's Presley doing? Wade asks casually as he reaches for his Coke and takes a long drink. My shoulders tense. She's good. Does Wade have lingering feelings for Presley? He broke up with her. Still, that doesn't mean anything. Presley is gorgeous with her mane of curly red hair. Also, she's a rising star. I'm not sure if Wade is the type of guy who would be enamored with Presley's stardom. His mother is certainly impressed by it. I guess I don't know Wade Claiborne all that well. I've mostly admired him from afar. Even now, when we're on our date, I feel like there's some invisible barrier between us. Why did Wade even agree to go out with me? Because he didn't want to be rude? Or maybe he had nothing better to do. Do you think Presley will end up with Bo? I study his handsome face and notice that a muscle in his jaw is flicking. He is beautiful to look at. No wonder I was so gaga over him during my growing years. Yes, I do, I say with conviction. He nods. I figured. His expression is too guarded for me to detect any disappointment. I want to bring up the subject of Colette Williams and the broken engagement, but I don't dare. So, you have a clinic in Mobile? I ask in an attempt to open up a conversation about his work. I've found that if you can get people talking about themselves, the ice is bound to thaw. Yes. I'm sure you stay busy driving back and forth between there and your office in comfort. It does keep me busy. But you enjoy it, right? He shrugs. Yeah, most of the time. A job is a job. Do you have any pets? Nope. Really? I'm surprised. I would have thought a vet would have a pet. I cringe inwardly, realizing that my words rhyme. I had a dog once, but it got hit by a car. I guess I haven't gotten around to getting another pet. I blink, excitement coating my voice. The same thing happened to me. My dog Trotter got killed, and I haven't been able to talk myself into getting another dog. Maybe Wade and I do have something in common. There may be hope for us yet. He shrugs. I would get another dog, but I don't have time to take care of it. Oh, so I was wrong. We don't have that in common. Jasper's face flashes before my mind. I guess I've been wrong about a lot of things lately. A few beats pass. Dang, that awkward silence. He picks up another piece of pizza. I select a small slice and begin nibbling on the tip. This is my third piece. The crust is thick. I'm sure I've eaten enough carbs to last me a week. I ate the cookie earlier and now this, and I can't even clog off the calories. I grin inwardly. Take that, Jasper Donaldson. I'm living dangerously. What's so funny? I startle, my cheeks growing warm. Huh? 
You were grinning at something. Putting down the slice of pizza, I fumble for something to say. I was just thinking how awkward first dates are. He chuckles, lighting up his entire face. They are awkward. He takes another bite of pizza and then tosses it onto his plate like he's done with it. He pushes the plate away, wincing. I'm sorry. You're probably regretting going out with me. I'm not much fun to be around tonight. No, you're great. I lie. He gives me a doubtful look. Okay, I amend. It has been interesting. A smile curves my lips. We share a look of understanding that restores my faith in Wade. My heart does a little dance. Maybe things will be okay after all. He lets out a long sigh. Colette called right before I picked you up. We had a big argument. Oh, wow, I'm sorry, I say automatically. His pained expression lets me know that he still has feelings for Colette. An acute disappointment hammers through me. Then again, what did I expect? Of course Wade would still have feelings for Colette. The two recently broke up. Sympathy wells in my chest. Do you want to talk about it? A wry grin tugs at his lips. Not really. His smile widens. I'm ready to move on to greener pastures. He gives me a hopeful look that turns my heart over in response. Then he does something totally unexpected. He reaches across the table and takes hold of my hand. His touch is warm, his expression earnest as he searches my face. Give me another chance. Sure, I stammer, thinking that this is the culmination of all my high school fantasies about Wade Claiborne. Well, except for the part where some sort of sparks or something should be flying between us. I'm curiously unaffected by Wade's touch. I mean, it's nice, but no fireworks. Maybe I need to lower my expectations. The poor guy is still reeling from his breakup. Yes, that must be it. A whisper of relief goes through me. The sparks will come in good time. I feel eyes on me and glance around the restaurant. I pick out the faces I know. Judy and her husband Frank. Tammy, Cynthia B., and Mrs. Rutledge, my high school chemistry teacher. I offer them a strained smile. Some respond with smiles and nods, but Cynthia B. just glares at me. She's tight with Colette. I'm sure tongues will be wagging all over comfort tonight. It occurs to me that Wade is still holding my hand. Do I pull away from his grasp? No, that would come off as rude. Thankfully, he releases my hand. Wade asks me about the bakery. We talk about surface things until the server brings the check. The conversation is taxing, mostly because I'm trying so hard to keep the words flowing to avoid those awkward silences. I probably shouldn't fear silence so much, but it makes me terribly uncomfortable. Wade pays the bill, and then we finally leave. Is it bad that I just want this date to be over? When we get back to my house, I shift in my seat toward Wade. My voice sounds too upbeat in my own ears as I say, Well, that was fun, thanks. We'll have to do it again sometime, I say evasively. He looks surprised. Yes, at the cutie pie dance. A high-pitched giggle climbs up my throat. Uh, of course, the cutie pie dance. Why did I ask Wade to the dance? Why? The thought of trying to make conversation for several long hours knots my insides. I know I'm not making any sense. Didn't I tell myself at the restaurant that I needed to give Wade time to recover from his breakup? For so long, I've wanted Wade to pay attention to me. And now he's semi-interested. 
Maybe that's the problem. Wade is lukewarm about everything. Sure, he's willing to go out with me, but would I have ever come up on his radar had I not pursued him? If I'd not gone to the clinic and asked him out, we wouldn't be together tonight. It's ironic that Jasper's intensity often gets on my nerves. Now, however, I'm wishing that Wade had some zeal or passion about something. I don't want to be the someone that he settles for. I want to be pursued, to be loved completely. My eyes grow moist as I blink. That's the problem. I'm not sure what I want. I reach for the car handle. Thanks for everything, I say again. I'll walk you to the door. My heart lurches. Okay, I say casually. I get out of the car and go around to his side. He gets out. Meanwhile, my pulse bumps up several notches. Surely Wade won't try to kiss me goodnight. Do I want to kiss Wade? Before tonight, the answer would have been a resounding yes. However, I'm still reeling from Jasper's kisses. Let me state loud and clear that I'm not the type who goes around kissing everyone. The thought of kissing two different guys in the span of a few days freaks me out. When we reach my front door, I get a good look at Wade's tight expression. He looks as nervous as I feel. He turns to face me, peering into my eyes. Oh no, he's going for it. He leans in, his lips brushing against mine. Then his arm goes around my waist as he pulls me close. His lips are warm and soft. The kiss is not unpleasant. In fact, Wade obviously knows what he's doing. I let him take the lead patiently waiting for the kiss to be over. He pulls back, grinning. I guess the evening turned out okay after all. Yeah, I guess so. He reaches for my hand and squeezes it. Remind me to thank Laura Lee for sending you into the clinic with Alice. I'll call you so we can make plans for the dance. Sounds good. No, this is not good. I'm a hot mess. He releases my hand before turning to leave. I watch with curious detachment as he strides across the porch and then down the steps with a confident gait. When he gets to his car, he smiles and throws me a parting wave. I force a smile and wave back. When I get inside the house, Emotion bubbles inside me, filling my eyes with tears. I just went out with the man I've been dreaming about since junior high. What should have been a magical evening was lackluster. And the worst part? He seems to be warming up to me. I rub a hand over my forehead, a geyser of frustration spewing up inside me, burning my throat with acid. Jasper Donaldson, this is all your fault, I mutter. What have you done to me? Chapter 9 My besties and I have a standing appointment on the last Sunday of each month. We get together for what we've dubbed Sundays on Sunday. It's a hallowed time when Albany, Penelope, Blakely, and I gather to catch up on our lives while gorging ourselves on ice cream that's swimming in decadent chocolate fudge syrup and toppings. I watch in half fascination and half awe as Albany takes the last bite of her third bowl of ice cream. She places the empty bowl down on the coffee table and then scoots back into the couch with a contented sigh. She cradles her stomach in a protective grasp like many pregnant women do. Albany has always been beautiful, with her dark eyes and glossy black hair, but she has a motherly glow that makes her downright radiant. That was so good, Albany drawls. Even the little man liked it. Pan is sitting in the chair next to me. 
We share a grin. What? Albany demands. Seems like you're settling quite nicely into married life and everything that goes with it. Blakely makes a point of looking at Albany's basketball-sized stomach. So what if I am? Albany says dreamily. Then the corners of her lips dip in a frown. Of course, it's not all wine and roses when the little tyke starts kicking me at night. Everyone laughs. When's the due date? Pen asks. April 29th, Albany says decisively. Is Gavin excited about having a boy? I ask. Albany chuckles. He's over the moon. Mom and Dad are ecstatic, too. They'll finally get their boy. Albany is an only child. I can only imagine how thrilled Albany's parents, Sable and Dallas, are to be getting a grandson. I take the last bite of my ice cream and place the bowl on the coffee table. Pan does the same. Blakely is sitting on the couch beside Albany. She removes the pillow from behind her back and looks at it. Is this new? Yeah, I figured new pillows would help spruce the place up a bit. Was Jasper able to fix your leaky sink? Blakely asks. Not yet, I answer nonchalantly. I can tell from the way that Blakely is eyeing me that her asking about the sink is a way to open up the conversation about Jasper. I don't want to talk about it. And yet I do. These are my closest friends. If I can't talk about it with them, I'll go nuts. I suppose I could talk about it with my mom. No, that's not a good idea. Mom thinks that Jasper hung the moon. If I mention one word about our kisses or the disturbing attraction that I feel for him, Mom will shout for joy and plan my wedding. Before Blakely can make her move, I look at Penn and ask the one thing that's sure to redirect the conversation away from me. When are you gonna have a baby? My voice is sing-song, a little taunting. Penn's face goes crimson as she chuckles. Not anytime soon. The only baby I want to take care of right now is the B&B. Blakely positions the pillow in her lap and then tucks her leg underneath her. The bed and breakfast seems to be going well. It is. Penn's face glows with pride. We're already booked through the summer. It has been great to have Memphis's help with the website and advertising. It's wonderful to see Penn doing so well. It was rough on her to deal with Tim Norwood's infidelity and then the divorce. I'm grateful that Penn found Memphis. Still, I can't help but feel a twinge of envy. Albany and Penn are entering a new phase in their lives with their husbands. I glance at Blakely, wondering if she's like me and starting to feel like we're the leftovers. How's it going at the bakery? Penn asks. Super busy with Valentine's Day and the dance coming up. My gaze pings to each of them. Are y'all going to the dance? You know it, Albany chuckles. I'm gonna make Gavin dance with me until my ankles swell up like balloons. Blakely makes a face. Ugh, that sounds so unromantic. Albany turns to Blakely. What about you? She sasses. Are you going? Nah, not this year. She trails a hand through her poker straight chestnut hair and then adjusts her glasses. For a while there, a romance was brewing between Blakely and one of the English professors at the junior college. The guy was divorced with two kids. He ended up getting back together with his ex wife. Blakely was devastated, although she's too prideful to let on. Always the practical one, Blakely refuses to let her head overrule her heart. She told me that she couldn't exactly fault Reed for choosing his kids over her. While that may be true, it still had to hurt. Blakely has suppressed her feelings for so long that she's bound to come undone eventually. Then again, who am I to judge? 
My love life is a complete disaster. Do you and Memphis want to go to the dance with Gavin and me? Albany asks Penn. We can make it a double date. Make that a triple date, Penn corrects. Bo and Presley Jean are also going. Albany's dark eyes sparkle with innuendo. Bo has it bad for Presley, she taunts. Yes, he does, Penn laughs. I always knew he'd eventually meet his match. Presley is as good as they come, I interject. I have to put in a good word for my first cousin. All eyes turn to me. Blakely arches an eyebrow. Well? Well, what? I ask innocently. I assume you're going to the dance, Pan begins. Yep. A faint irritation flicks over Blakely's features. Don't keep us in suspense. Who are you going with? I moisten my lips. Here it comes. I'm standing on the edge of a pool, about to dive in. Wait, Claiborne. Penn and Albany's eyes go round as Blakely narrows hers. <laughs> what? Albany giggles. <laughs> when did this happen? Wasn't it just yesterday that Wade was engaged to Colette? Blakely is giving me the stink eye. I can feel her disappointment slithering around me like an anaconda that's about to squeeze me breathless. Do tell all, Penn chimes in. Yes, Blakely says icily. I, for one, want to hear how it feels to play second fiddle to Colette. The hair on the back of my neck rises as I lock gazes with Blakely. That was uncalled for. Blakely harumps and looks away. Penn wrinkles her nose. What's going on here? I'm not done with Blakely. The two of us have had tension between us for a while now. Time to get everything out in the open. I keep my gaze lasered in on her. While you may not agree with my decision, it's still no reason to castrate me. Albany and Penn burst out laughing at the same time. Blakely does a giggle snort thing. Albany's shoulders shake as tears roll down her eyes. <laughs> That's hilarious. She clutches her stomach. Ouch, the baby is tightening up. I shouldn't be laughing so much, but I can't help it. That's just too funny. Penn is still sniggering. Her face is bright red. What? I growl, not appreciating that everyone is having a laugh at my expense. Even behind her glasses, I can see that Blakely's eyes are shimmering with laughter. I glare at my friends. Somebody had better start talking. Blakely takes in a deep breath in an attempt to compose herself. Okay, she sighs. A second later, Albany giggles, shaking her head. Skate, you are hilarious. I don't think you have the right equipment for anyone here to castrate you. My brows bunch. I don't get it. Blakely holds up a finger as she slips into professor mode. Actually, the definition of castration is to remove the testes or ovaries of an individual. Another definition is to render someone impotent. Heat blasts my face, and then a hysterical giggle circles my throat. A second later, I can no longer contain myself, and laughter is peeling out of me. This causes everyone else to start laughing again. Finally, we dab our eyes. Okay, I admit. You got me there. Blakely gives me a superior look. I think the word you were looking for is castigate, meaning to criticize. You're right, smarty pants. That's what I meant. I stick my tongue out at Blakely as she returns the gesture. What's going on between you two? Albany wants to know. Blakely's eyes flash in an open challenge. Do you want to tell, or should I? 
I'll tell. I might as well get my side of the story in while I can. Blakely's upset because I won't entertain the idea of a relationship with Jasper. I expect Albany and Penn to be surprised by this revelation, but then I see the exchange that passes between them. What? I growl. Maybe you and Jasper should give it a try, Penn suggests. I throw my hands into the air. Not you too. I look at Albany. What are your feelings on the subject? Never one to mince words, Albany comes right back with, He likes you, you like him, I say go for it. My jaw hits the floor. I never said I liked Jasper. You didn't have to, Blakely fires back. I feel like I'm running to catch a bus that's already in motion. I ball my hands, my nails digging into my palms. What if it doesn't work with Jasper? I could lose him as a friend. Sympathy crosses Penn's features as she touches my arm. Oh, honey, you can't keep harping on that same tune. Tears rush to my eyes. I blink furiously to stay them. I hate it when I cry. I feel like such an idiot to have my fears paraded around in front of my friends. Then again, I do want to talk about it with them. You've got to stop being so afraid of everything, Blakely says. I'm not, I seethe. Albany swats Blakely's arm. Quit hounding her. I'm not. Blakely counters. Yes, you are, I assert. Blakely takes in a breath. Her voice takes on a practical tone as she holds out her hands. I just want you to understand what's going on in your head. A hard laugh rises in my throat. So now you presume to tell me what I'm thinking? I don't mean it like that. Blakely says evenly. I'm only suggesting that the best way to overcome your fears is to face them straight on. I grit my teeth. Is it really gonna hurt some cosmic plan if I go out a few times with Wade Claiborne? If it puts Colette Williams in her place, then probably not, Albany pipes in. Blakely throws her an exasperated look. This isn't about you and your vendetta with Colette. This is about Skeet and what's best for her. You're right, Albany agrees. Skeet should be with Jasper. Why is everyone so insistent that I should be with Jasper? Has the whole world gone stark raven mad? Hello, I'm right here and can hear everything y'all are saying, I spout. Blakely gives me a reproving look. Hearing and listening are two very different things. Penn holds out a hand. Okay, guys, stop with the fighting. She turns her attention to me. What is it that you're so afraid of? Emotion clogs my throat. I put a hand to my mouth to stifle it. I swallow hard and fight for composure as I continue. Do y'all remember when Jasper and I kissed in junior high? Albany wrinkles her nose. Are you talking about that time we played truth or dare? I nod. Okay. Albany looks at me like I'm a little touched. We were kids. My chest squeezes. Jasper ignored me for months. My voice cracks as I swallow and forge on. Other than y'all, he's my best friend. I can't risk losing him. What makes you so sure that you'd lose him? Penn asks. I feel like an imbecile, trying to articulate my fears, especially when everyone is giving me the third degree. You know my track record. I've never had a relationship that lasted longer than four months. 
Just because you've chomped on a few mealy apples doesn't mean that you should never eat apples again, Hen says wisely. Amen, Blakely booms. That's what I've been trying to tell her. I roll my eyes. No, you've been telling me to chomp on one apple in particular, the very one that's the forbidden fruit. Albany's eyes sparkle with mischief. The forbidden fruit is always the best. Unfortunately, I mutter. Albany homes in on that. She scoots forward in her seat. Her voice is husky with excitement. Did you sample the forbidden fruit? I don't answer, but the truth must be written all over my face because a wicked giggle trills from Albany's lips as she puts her hands together. You did, she exclaims. When Blakely shoots me a look of triumph, my anger sails through the roof. I point a finger. Don't sit there grinning like a chessy cat. Your little comment about weddings, lace, and cake in the face hasn't helped matters. Blakely's eyes go wider than silver dollars. First of all, it's Cheshire Cat, she corrects and then flicks her hand in irritation. And second, are you talking about how I said that all it takes are weddings, lace, and cake in the face to ruin a relationship? Yep, I snip. Albany tips her head. Kind of catchy. I like it, she frowns. What does it mean exactly? Blakely rolls her eyes. I was talking about Wade and Colette, and how that when the wedding planning starts, everything goes to the dogs. Albany giggles. Well, it certainly did in Colette and Dottie's case. Oh, to have been a fly on the wall when their tiff over the cakes went down. How in the heck does my quote possibly relate to you? Blakely wants to know, directing her question to me. You don't want to even date Jasper, much less marry him. I blow out a long breath. Everything was good between Jasper and me. And then he had to go and ruin it with that kiss. I guess I can see how that connects, Blakely muses. Her voice picks up its pace. Wait a minute. Forget the blasted quote. Are you telling us that you and Jasper kissed? Tell us, Pan prompts, giving me a nudge in the arm. I take in a breath. Okay, Jasper and I kissed. How was it? Albany demands. Good, I say neutrally. They all just give me a look that says you're not fooling anyone. Okay, it was great. Too good, I mutter, knowing that I might as well spill the rest while I'm at it. The kisses with Jasper were so good that they spoiled my kiss with Wade. The room goes dead silent before Albany erupts in giggles, her stomach shaking like jello. You kissed Jasper and Wade? She asks, her tone incredulous. Wow, Skeet, you don't waste any time. I clasp my hands together in my lap, wishing I could make myself small enough to disappear. Yes, I admit, feeling like a floozy. Do tell, Albany chimes. First, I tell them about my kiss with Jasper, leaving out the parts about how his lips and touch lit me on fire. Also, I leave out the part about how he seemed to brand me his on our second kiss. Then I tell them about Alice and how I took her to the vet. I finish with Wade kissing me goodnight at the door. When I'm done, everyone just sits there, speechless. Say something, I demand. Penn is the first to speak. The way I see it, the most important question is, which kiss left the most impact on you? She already answered that, Albany interjects. I blink several times. I did? 
If I'd said that, I'm pretty sure I would remember, I clip. Yeah, you said your kisses. She holds up a finger as she looks at Blakely and Penn. Note, she said kisses, meaning plural. I got that part already, Blakely says with a trace of impatience. Clearly, she's ready for Albany to get to the point. Albany continues, looking me in the eye. You said that your kisses with Jasper spoiled the one with Wade, which leads me to conclude that the kisses with Jasper were so good that the one with Wade paled in comparison. It's true, I groan. Aha, Albany snaps. I knew it. Yes, I'm attracted to Jasper, and yes, it's killing me, I growl. I think you're making too much of this, Blakely says. Look, Jasper's my big brother. Her voice gathers intensity. I'm telling you point blank that he cares about you. What more could you want? I don't know. My voice trembles. I admit that I'm a hot mess. Tears slip from the corners of my eyes. I have no idea what to do about this situation. My voice breaks. I know it sounds silly that I'm so afraid. Not necessarily, Penn soothes, rubbing my arm. We're all afraid of something. Really? I sniff. What are you afraid of? I need reassurance that I'm not the only one with hang-ups. Pen looks thoughtful. Well, at one time I was afraid that if I didn't keep striving to live up to the perfect image that I'd crafted for myself, that my world would fall apart. The corners of her mouth harden. Look where that got me. Married to the wrong man and saddled with the mother-in-law from Hades. But you had the courage to rebuild your life, Albany counters. I did, Pan agrees. A glowing smile fills her face. And I couldn't be happier. I look at Albany. What are you afraid of? Albany is the most fearless person I know. Owning a shop with my mother, she says dryly as everyone laughs. Even though Albany and her mother frequently go at it, the two are a dynamic duo. The boutique on Main Street is a smashing success. People come from all over to shop at it, and the online sales are through the roof. Albany's own dress designs are picking up steam. She has a long list of customers waiting to have their custom dresses made. Seriously, I add, letting her know that I'm not letting her off the hook. Albany squints her eyes, thinking, Well. As much as I love y'all, she throws an uncertain glance around the room. I never pictured myself settling down in comfort, she laughs to herself. I was gonna go to New York and conquer the world, she shrugs her shoulders. And yet here I am, happy as a clam, with the one man you couldn't live without, Blakely adds. Albany nods. That's for dang sure. A triumphant smile curls her lips. Oh, and it gave me a mountain of pleasure to steal him away from Colette. Pan frowns. Not that it was any competition. Gavin has always been into you. Why, yes, he has, Albany says in a coquettish voice. She bats her eyes as she flicks the ends of her hair. I turn my gaze to Blakely. Your turn. What are you afraid of? Not being the smartest person in the room? I couldn't resist getting in that jab. Ouch, she quips. The claws are coming out. She gives me a wounded look before pursing her lips. I don't know what I'm afraid of. Her expression goes somber enough for me to clue in that Blakely knows exactly what she's afraid of. 
She's just trying to decide if she wants to share it with us. She nibbles on her lower lip as she touches her stylish glasses. Maybe of never finding the right one, of spending my life alone, she finishes quietly. A gloomy silence descends over us, like a thundercloud waiting to spill. I feel guilty for being so snappy with Blakely. She's still hurting over her breakup with Professor Reed. Is that why she's pressing so hard for me to get together with Jasper? Maybe in some strange way she's trying to right injustice in the universe. The right one will come along, Albany assures her. Blakely nods, but I can feel her doubt, squeezing my chest as if it were my own. What am I saying? It is my own. Isn't that the core of my issue? I don't want to lose Jasper as a friend. I can't stand the thought of him not being in my life. I'm willing to forego the delectable cookie and settle for the crumbs. Blakely forces a smile. This is not about me, but about Skeet. Her eyes lock with mine. You can't be so afraid of failing that you forget how to live. Take a chance on love. Tears glisten in her eyes. You don't know what a gift you've been given, she utters hoarsely. If I had someone who cares about me the way Jasper cares about you. Her words dribble off as she shakes her head and looks away. Albany scoots over and slides an arm around Blakely's shoulders. Tears prick my eyes. Do you think I like being afraid? I know I sound like a heel wallowing in my own misery. I took a chance on the bakery. That was huge for me. A person can only take so many chances before crumbling on the inside. I think about what Jasper said about me being afraid to leave comfort, to go to culinary school, or me being afraid to get another dog, me thinking I have to clog like crazy every time I eat a morsel of a cookie or other dessert. I know I'm a wimp. Planning for every contingency is how I deal with life's stresses. Pen cuts into my thoughts. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter what we say or even what we think. The question that you have to ask yourself is, what do you want? I jerk. Huh? What do you want? Albany repeats, her tone more forceful. The answer comes so fast that it spills out of my lips before I even realize what's happening. Jasper. I want Jasper. The words are a revelation to me. I do want him. I don't want some guy who's indifferent about his career and life, even if he does look perfect on the outside. I want someone with fire and passion. Someone who's not afraid to challenge me. Someone who's rough around the edges. Someone who often knows me better than I know myself. Hallelujah! Blakely shouts, raising her hands and looking at the ceiling. My heart starts beating fast. What am I supposed to do? Once I cross the Great Divide, there'll be no turning back. Pen reaches for my hand and squeezes it. Tell him how you feel. I take in a breath, trying to sift through the dizziness that's overtaken me. I don't know. I shake my head. What if it backfires? I could lose Jasper as a friend. I know I sound like a broken record, but my fears are very real. I hate to break it to you. Albany chimes in. But your friendship with Jasper is not gonna stay like it is. My stomach clenches. What do you mean? Well, either you'll eventually find someone else, or he will. And then that person will take center stage. Blakely peers over her glasses. Do you think for one minute that Renee has given up on Jasper? No. 
I'm sure she's spinning her web and trying everything she can think of to get him back. Are you just going to sit back and let her or some other woman sweep in and take your man? I thought you said Jasper was over, Renee. I repeat the words from our phone conversation that took place the day I was in the tub and Jasper barged into the bathroom. According to you, Jasper is footloose and fancy free, looking for just the right girl to keep him straight. I make air quotes with my fingers. He is, for now, Blakely responds, giving me a meaningful look. Albany tips her head. Blakely's right. A man like Jasper's not gonna wait around forever. Another woman, most likely Renee, will swoop in if you keep putting him off. I guess you're right. That's a terrifying thought. Why have I never thought about it before? I've been assuming that things would remain at status quo. But that's not how life is. Change is the only constant in life. My lungs contract, making it hard to get a good breath. The best chance you have at keeping Jasper is to let nature take its course, Penn adds. And that means letting your relationship evolve. I roll their advice around and around in my head. Okay, I hear myself say. I'll tell Jasper how I feel about him. Albany and Blakely cheer as Penn claps. I smile at them like all is well. But on the inside, I'm downright petrified. Chapter 10 I glance at the clock on the microwave. 7.15 p.m. All day long, I've been waiting on pins and needles for Jasper to either stop by the bakery or call. I haven't heard a peep from him. I guess I need to face the fact that I'm not going to hear from him tonight. The knowledge settles like a brick in my stomach. No doubt Jasper has heard about my date with Wade. The entire town of Comfort knows. Several ladies mentioned it with coy smiles when they came into the bakery. Around lunchtime, Colette waltzed in. Ellie was working the counter at the time. Colette asked to speak to me. She'd ordered Valentine's Day cookies for her co-workers at the bank and claimed that she wanted to check with me to make sure that her order would be delivered first thing next Monday morning on Valentine's Day, as scheduled. All the while Colette spoke, malice glittered in her eyes. Then, just before our conversation ended, Colette said that she'd heard through the grapevine at the bank that Matt Hauser was helping me with a commercial loan. There are so many facets to those types of loans, Colette said in a sugary tone. It would be a shame if anything went wrong. Of course, it sounds like you're nowhere close to gathering the required down payment, so my words of advice probably won't even apply. With that, she flashed a mean smile and sashayed off, her shiny blonde hair bouncing on her shoulders as she went. I freaked out, worrying about the loan falling apart so I called Matt to make sure everything was okay. He assured me that all was well and that he couldn't really do anything until I had the down payment money. I was tempted to ask Matt if he'd been wagging his tongue to Colette, but I refrained. I'm sure that Colette would love nothing more than to put me on the outs with Matt. Then I'd be sunk for sure. Colette Williams is a piece of work. I don't understand what any man could see in her. Sure, she's glamorously beautiful, but she's so dang conniving. No wonder Albany detests her. Maybe Wade and Colette are a match made in heaven. If Wade doesn't have strong opinions about life, then he wouldn't mind letting a woman like Colette lead him around by the nose. I'm sure Wade is used to women like that ruling his life. After all, his mother is Dottie. 
What to do about Wade? He called me earlier today, but didn't leave a message. I suspect he wants to talk about us going to the cutie pie dance. I need to let Wade down easily. There's still time. The dance is a week away. Right now, I need to focus on getting things settled between Jasper and me. My stomach roils with apprehension as I glance at the clock again. I guess I could try and track Jasper down tomorrow, but I sure would like to get things resolved between us tonight. I didn't sleep a wink last night, but tossed and turned, replaying my conversation with the girls. If I don't talk to Jasper this evening, I doubt I'll get any sleep tonight. It has taken a superhuman effort for me to summon the courage to tell Jasper how I feel. I'm still not convinced that I'm doing the right thing. However, I don't want to lose Jasper to Renee Keith or any other woman, so I need to make a move. Another thought occurs to me, shaking my confidence. Jasper said I wasn't his type. What if he was telling the truth? I ball my fists. No, that can't be right. Jasper was upset because I wouldn't agree to take our relationship to the next level. He cares about me the same way I care about him. I just know it. My pulse hammers in my ears as I swallow, reaching a decision. I'm calling Jasper right now and asking him to come over. He still needs to fix my leaky sink. If I have to, I'll beat the pipes to create an emergency situation so that Jasper will have to come over. No, I won't do that. I can't afford to pay for the damage. Also, I'm not that brazen. That sounds like something Albany would do, but not me. I reach for my phone. My hands are shaky as I dial Jasper's number. A part of me hopes he won't answer. My heart is beating wildly in my chest, making me dizzy. He answers on the third ring with a casual, Hey. Hey, Jess, I squeak. How are you? Good. Are you okay? You sound strange. Laughter hiccups from my throat. I'm good. I swallow, trying to get a grip. Hey, I was wondering if you'd mind coming over to look at that leak. It seems to be getting worse. Long pause. Hello? Did I lose you? I'm still here, he says flatly. Desperation claws at the base of my skull. Would you mind coming over? I can order us some Chinese. No pizza. I close my eyes scrunching my nose. He knows I went to the pizza place with Wade and is ticked about it. We can do pizza if you'd like. Should I get your usual? Jasper likes Canadian bacon and pineapple. It's not my favorite by any stretch of the imagination. I don't like mixing sweet with savory. Amusement coats his voice. You're being awfully accommodating. What can I say? I'm in the mood to be nice. That's a first, he fires back. Hey, I protest. I'm always nice. That's debatable. My spine straightens, and it's all I can do to bite back an angry retort. I know what's happening here. Jasper's baiting me to force an argument. Well, I'm not going to let him. Maybe this is a good sign. If Jasper didn't care, he wouldn't be mad about the date. What time should I have the pizza delivered? I ask sweetly. I'll be there in 30 minutes, he responds curtly. Sounds great. See you then. I'm about to end the call when Jasper adds, Chinese is fine. Order that instead. Before I can respond, he ends the call. Jerk. I growl as a grin slips over my lips. I certainly don't have to worry about things getting boring between Jasper and me. After ordering Chinese, I go to my bedroom and rummage through my closet to find an outfit. 
I select a camel-colored sweater that forms to my figure in a pair of snug jeans. I freshen up my makeup and fluff my hair. I would put on some perfume, but I don't want to come across as trying too hard. I look in the mirror, noting the heightened excitement in my golden brown eyes. Tonight's the night where everything changes, I say to myself. Anticipation fires through my veins, thinking about the kisses that are sure to follow when Jasper realizes how I feel about him. Laughter gurgles through my throat. I guess Jasper was right. Friends do make the best lovers. I traipse back down the steps and reach the bottom when the doorbell rings. My heart leaps into my throat, wondering if it's Jasper or the Chinese food delivery. Taking in a calming breath, I smooth a hand over my sweater and go to the door, making sure to hold in my stomach and keep my shoulders erect. I open the door to find Jasper. An electric charge blitzes through me when our eyes connect. He looks terrific in a navy blue sweater that showcases his broad shoulders. A lock of dark brown hair flops over one eye as he pushes it back with an unconscious gesture. Hey, he begins, his gaze flickering over me. He frowns. Why are you so dressed up? Are you going somewhere? No. I look down at my outfit, wishing that I hadn't put on boots. Then I wouldn't look so dressed up. I step back and motion. Come on in. Awareness stirs through me when he steps closer. Longing rises in me like a fire demanding to be released. I want to throw my arms around his neck and press my lips to his. His brow creases. What's wrong? I jerk. What do you mean? You're looking at me funny. Heat scorches my cheeks. Am not. Did you order the food? Sure did. He goes into the living room as I follow behind him. He goes over to the couch and sits down. Briefly, I wonder if I should sit in one of the chairs across from him, but I decide to sit beside him instead, but not too close. I don't want to come across as desperate. Jasper's certainly not making things easy on me. Irritation crawls down my spine. I don't know why he has to act so cool and standoffish. I clasp my hands in my lap. Thanks for coming over. I've been worried about the leak. No problem. My gaze takes in the stubborn set of his jaw. I trace the faint line of the scar on his chin. The air in the room sizzles and cracks with Jasper's presence. I'm so aware of him that I can hardly breathe. I knew this would happen, that once I opened that sturdy metal box, there would be no containing my feelings. How was work? Good. A few beats of silence passed between us. With Wade, it was awkward. However, with Jasper, it's entirely something else. Frustration bubbles inside me. Stop it, I demand, giving him a shove. Surprise flicks over his rugged features. Stop what? This. You're being so tense. Er, terse. A hint of a smile tugs at his lips. He's so boyishly handsome. My kind of perfect. I like that his nose is slightly crooked and that he has a scar. He looks tough and real. The kind of guy I can depend on. I guess I'm guilty of being both tense and terse. Why? This is me you're talking to, remember? I search his face marveling at the intensity and depth in his chocolate brown eyes. He pushes out a heavy breath. Things have been so tense between us lately. I touch his arm. I know. My throat closes as I cough to clear it. He gives me a funny look. Are you okay? I'm good. I clip, ready to spill my guts to him so I can get it over with. The suspense of it all is killing me. 
about our kisses. My face heats up ten degrees just speaking the words. I look at his lips. Ugh, I'm a wreck. What I would give for another kiss right now. Regret simmers in his dark eyes. I had no right to grab you like that and force a kiss. I'm sorry, he utters. It was a mistake. I start blinking so fast that it's a wonder that my eyelashes don't fly right off my eyes. My heart twists. A mistake? I squeak. What do you mean? The doorbell rings. I ball my hand. Stupid doorbell. Of all the times to interrupt. It's our food, I announce unnecessarily. I move to get up, but Jasper touches my hand, rustling a tingling sensation through my skin. I'll get it, he says easily as he rises to his feet. I watch as he goes to the door with lithe steps. A second later, Jasper opens the door and talks amiably with the delivery guy. Jasper has the gift of gab and can make conversation with nearly everyone. I grin a little, thinking that I'd like to see him try to navigate Henry Roach. Henry stopped by the bakery today. He had his brownie and I had my cookie. No clogging afterward, thank you very much. Henry looked so thin, and his complexion was sallow. At one point, a coffin fit overtook him. I'm concerned about Henry's health. I asked if he was okay, but he dismissed my question with an irate flick of his hand. All he wanted to talk about was Jasper and me. Even Henry had somehow heard about my date with Wade. His lips had vanished into tight lines as he shook his head, telling me that if I didn't have enough sense in my pea-brained skull to realize that Jasper was the real deal, I didn't deserve him. Henry went on for ten minutes castigating me. Never again will I mix up castigate with castrate. I learned my lesson on that one. Finally, when I could get a word in edgewise, I told Henry that I planned to set things straight with Jasper, telling him how I really feel. The relief that swelled over Henry's face was perplexing. And then he nodded, saying that he could finally rest knowing that he'd done right by Gladys. As he got up to leave, he stumbled, but then caught himself on the table. I tried to help, but Henry wouldn't have it. He shoved my hand with a force that was surprising. Watching him hobble out of the bakery was a painful and heart-wrenching experience. Henry still drives himself around. However, I'm not sure how much longer he can continue to do so. I worry about him having a wreck and injuring himself and other people. Should I go to the sheriff's office and raise a concern? I hate to blow the whistle on Henry. Normally, I could discuss my concerns with a person's family. However, Henry has no family that I'm aware of. It would be sad to be so alone. I'm glad that I can be a friend to him. Jasper returns, carrying a white bag. He motions with his head. Should we eat in the kitchen? Sure. I get to my feet as we go in that direction. Jasper places the bag on the kitchen table and begins removing the contents. It occurs to me that I'll have to psych myself up again to tell Jasper how I feel about him. But wait. He said kissing me was a mistake. Did he mean that he shouldn't have forced a kiss? or that kissing me in general was a mistake. The scent of the food turns my stomach. How am I supposed to eat at a time like this? I force my feet into action as I retrieve the silverware, serving spoons, plates, and napkins. Jasper goes to the cupboard and grabs two glasses. He takes them to the fridge and uses the dispenser to fill them with ice and water. I've always appreciated how comfortable Jasper feels in my home. Being with him is a breath of fresh air, compared to how awkward I felt around Wade. We sit down at the table and begin filling our plates. 
I place a fork full of broccoli and beef into my mouth and am about to chew when Jasper asks, How was your date with Wade? The food goes down the wrong pipe as I cough to clear it. Luckily, it comes out as fast as it went down. Chewing with a vengeance, I grab my water and chug down several swallows to help the food go down easier. Amusement lights Jasper's eyes. I thought I was going to have to do CPR for a minute there. I'm okay, I cough again, touching my chest. The date went that well, he says dryly. It's time to get everything out in the open. For better or worse, I put down my fork. Jasper, about what happened between us, he holds up a hand, his jaw hardening. Don't say it. But, but you don't understand. I'm trying to tell you. He talks over me. I'm taking Renee to the cutie pie dance. The words come at me like a hard slap, nearly stealing my breath. What? I know you're not overly fond of Renee, but she has her good qualities. He grins. Want me to name them for you? No, I blurt. He chuckles. Fine, I'll keep them to myself. This is a nightmare. I struggle to hold back the wall of tears pressing against my eyes. Jasper continues. I'm sorry that I put you in a bad position. He takes in a resolute breath. I've given a lot of thought to what you said about us not doing anything to jeopardize our friendship. And I think you're absolutely right. You do? I croak. He nods. I was out of line, and it won't happen again. The corners of his lips turn down in concern. Are you okay? You're not acting like yourself. It's all I can do to force a smile. I'm fine. Jasper offers me a good-natured grin that stretches from ear to ear. Friends we are, and friends we shall stay, he shrugs. Who knows, maybe Renee and I can rekindle the old flame. His words are nails being driven into the coffin of my heart. I take it, you're going to the dance with Wade? I am, I assert. He looks thoughtful. Hey, maybe we could go together, a double date. That's a terrible idea. I scoff. His face falls. Why? Two besties on a date with their significant others. What could be wrong with that picture? Come on, Jasper urges. You owe me for fixing the leaky sink. He wags his eyebrows. You haven't fixed it yet, I snap. He laughs. Down, girl. I'll fix it as soon as I eat. He makes a face. What's eating you? You must be working too hard to get ready for Valentine's Day. His voice lifts. Hey, I hate to throw one more thing on you, but would you mind teaching me a few dance steps? For a second, I can hardly believe my ears. You hate dancing, I protest. Yeah, it's not my favorite, he continues eating. But Renee loves it. I'd like to impress her with a few fancy schmancy moves. And the way I see it, you're the perfect person to teach me. I'm sorry, but I don't see how I can possibly fit it in. No way am I going to teach Jasper any moves that will impress Renee Keith. Oh, come on now. I've got to work tomorrow, but surely you've got some time on Wednesday. I'll come over right after you get off work. It won't take long. He gives me a puppy dog look. Yeah, he's cute and too persuasive for his own good. Fine, I bark. A large smile fills his face. That's my girl, he drawls, his eyes holding mine. I want to bawl. How did I get myself into such an awful mess? It sickens me to think of Jasper with Renee. I don't know how I'll stand it, seeing him dancing with her. 
He motions to my plate. Better dig in before it gets cold. I pick up my fork and go through the mechanics of eating. Several minutes later, my phone rings. I welcome the interruption. I get up to retrieve it from the kitchen island. It's Abigail, the owner of the bakery. I slide my finger across the screen and then place the phone to my ear. Hello? Skeet, Abigail says breathlessly. I'm so sorry to call you this late. No worries, I assure her, wondering what's wrong. Abigail's husband Paul's health has been tenuous the past few months. I hope he's okay. I brace myself as I wait for her to continue. There's no easy way to say this. My heart drops as I tighten my hold on the phone. What's going on? I feel Jasper's eyes on me. He can tell that something is wrong. Heather and Steve have been renting a condo. Heather is Abigail's daughter and Steve is her son-in-law. They've been renting their place on a month-to-month -month basis. Their landlord wants to sell. They will have to move out by the end of the month. They need to get into a house so the kids can have more space and a yard. Things have gotten so expensive in this area that they can't afford to buy a house on their own. Paul and I will need to help them. To do so, we'll need to sell the bakery right away. My breath hitches. Oh, no. This can't be happening. I don't know what I'll do if I lose the bakery. It's what I've been working for, dreaming about. I'm so sorry, Abigail laments. I had hoped to be able to give you ample time to get the down payment money together. I have a couple of other buyers who are interested. I can give you until the end of the month to get your loan in the works. She pauses. If you can't make it work, then I'll have no other alternative but to sell to one of the other buyers. Her voice trembles with emotion. I really am sorry. I know how much the bakery means to you, but I have to help my daughter and grandkids. On a positive note, if you can't purchase the bakery, then you may be able to stay on as the manager, working for the new owner. The room begins to spin as my throat closes. Tears pool in my eyes as I sway. Darkness crowds the edges of my mind. I catch myself by bracing my weight on the counter. The phone slips from my hands and falls to the floor. The next thing I know, Jasper is by my side. He touches my arm before bending down to pick up the phone. Abigail? Hello? Well, this is Jasper. Skeet's okay, just a little jolted. I understand. Yeah, that's tough about Heather and the condo. Jasper looks at me as he speaks. I'll tell her. Thanks. Bye. Tears stream down my cheeks. I can't believe this, I say mostly to myself. First Jasper and now the bakery? In the short span of a few minutes, my entire life is imploding right before my very eyes. Jasper rubs my arms. I allow him to lead me back to the table, where I collapse into a chair. Jasper pulls up a chair and sits so that his knees are touching mine. Take a deep breath, he orders. I try to get a good breath, but my chest is too tight. I can't, I pant, panic racing through me. You can, he encourages, reaching for my hands. Skeet, he says gently. It's okay. Breathe in through your nose. I do as he instructs. Good, he coaches. Now push it out through your mouth. He talks me through the breathing exercises until finally my lungs expand with blessed air. My head clears a smidgen. At least I know I won't pass out. The knowledge that I'll lose the bakery sits like a box of bricks on my heart. Jasper's tender expression cuts like a knife. 
reminding me that I'll lose him too. I should have never pushed Jasper away or gone out with Wade. I might not be able to help what's happening with the bakery, but losing Jasper was my own stupid fault. My hands are enfolded in Jasper's. His hands are large and calloused. I peer into his eyes, trying to absorb some of his strength. What am I gonna do? My voice sounds small and insignificant in my own ears. The bakery is the only thing I've ever taken a chance on, and it's backfiring royally. I've gone way beyond the call of duty as a manager. I put my heart and soul into the bakery, knowing that it would one day be mine. I should have realized that me being a business owner was too good to be true. Jasper swallows, his Adam's apple zipping up and down in his throat. I don't know, he answers honestly. But I can promise you that everything will be okay. I nod, appreciating his kind words. However, I know that while Jasper means well, he's dead wrong. Nothing will be okay ever again. Chapter 11 The next day passes in a blur. On Wednesday, I go through the motions of doing my daily work, but I'm finding it hard to focus. The fear of losing the bakery lumps in with my fear of losing Jasper. They roll together until they become a big ball of barbed wire in my gut. I'm on the verge of tears. Several times I've been tempted to lock myself in my office and bawl my eyes out. At 3 p.m., when Ellie comes into the kitchen and announces that Henry is here to see me, I groan. Today, I don't know if I can handle it. Ellie doesn't skip a beat. Very well, I'll tell him that you're too busy to see him. An image of Henry, taking each labored, twisted step, flashes through my mind. If he can drag himself to the bakery, then the least I can do is spend a few minutes with him. No, don't do that. I'll go and talk to him. Maybe I'll drown my sorrows in cookies, allow myself to have two or three instead of one. A dull headache pushes against the bridge of my nose as I remove my apron and hairnet. Pray for me, I tell Ellie. I'm gonna need patience. Lots of it. Her hand goes to her hip. I hear you, honey. You're a saint for putting up with that fart knocker. Wh what? I chortle. The corners of her lips twitch. Preacher Dawson's always delivering those sermons about how we need to turn the other cheek and love our neighbors unconditionally. She harumphs. I'm sure the good preacher would change his tune if he spent any time around that ornery old goat. I give in to the laughter that tickles my throat. It ripples through my stomach before traveling back up and shaking my shoulders. Thanks, Ellie. I needed that today. Ellie gives me an astute look. Honey, are you okay? You look a little pale. I'm fine, just tired. She lets out a sigh. You've been working yourself to the bone. I know you'll be glad when Valentine's Day is over. Barbara called me last night. You talked to Mom? Ellie and Mom are close friends. In fact, Mom was the one who recommended that I hire Ellie. Yep. She asked me to keep an eye out, to make sure that you don't overdo it. Tender emotion wells in my chest. My mom is a gem. My dad's pretty great, too, when he's not trying to tell me how to run my life or the bakery. He's still miffed that I won't serve churros and tres leches, his favorite Mexican dessert. Her expression brightens. At least you have the dance to look forward to. You and Wade will make a fine-looking couple. She cackles out a deviant chuckle. I'll bet Colette is eating her heart out. She's eating something, I grumble. Or maybe not. 
the woman is toothpick skinny. As is Renee, I can't believe my rotten luck. I finally get up the nerve to take the plunge with Jasper, only to find out that the water has been drained from the pool. Gah, I'm gonna have to go to the dance with Wade. He called again today. This time he left a message asking me to call him so we could make plans. Ellie shakes her head. I stand by what I said. You're a saint for putting up with Henry Roach. No, the saint was Gladys. You're right about that, she agrees heartily. Her expression turns somber. I miss Gladys. She was a good woman. That's the reminder I needed. Gladys was a good woman. One of the best. I owe it to her to be kind to her husband. I take in a deep breath as a prayer asking for patience flits through my mind. I do need patience, and I shouldn't be afraid to ask for it. I don't want to lash out at Henry. I'm just so spent. Not just physically tired, but weary to the bone. Right through to my soul. I guess I should figure out what I'm going to do with my life after the bakery is sold to someone else. The idea of staying on as manager doesn't sit well. But maybe I'll get used to the idea. I guess it depends on who the new owner is. The person may not want me as the manager. Then where will I be? I go out to where Henry is sitting. Hello, I say, plastering a smile over my face. Henry grunts in response. My temperature shoots through the roof. Patience, I remind myself as I pull out a chair and fold into it. Henry knits his brows. What's wrong with you? He says it like he's offended that I'm not my usual chipper self. Dark clouds are crowding in on the horizon. I don't know how long I can keep my doomsday mood at bay. What do you mean? He motions with his hand as he studies me critically, like I'm a monkey on exhibit at the zoo. Something's off about you. I'm floored that Henry is astute enough to notice. I'm fine. Just tired. I rub a hand over my forehead. It's been hectic. Would you like your usual brownie? He nods. I get up to get it but stop when I see Ellie hurrying toward me carrying two plates. One contains a brownie for Henry and the other a chocolate chip cookie for me. She places the plates in front of us. My fork, Henry grumbles. Ellie gives me a knowing look that says, always the jerk. Then she smiles sweetly at Henry and says in a gushing voice, coming right up. Would you like anything else? Milk, he croaks. For a second, I half expect Ellie to lash out. Instead, she nods and says smoothly, Milk it is. Before turning away, she leans close and whispers low in my ear. Take that, Preacher Dawson. How's that for patience? See, I can be civil to the fart knocker. A snigger slurps through my throat as Ellie sashays away, looking quite proud of herself for her snide remark. What was that about? Henry demands. Nothing, I say casually. He studies me. Something is wrong with you. I can feel it in my gut. Your gut, huh? How many times do we have to keep having the same conversation? He gives me a challenging look. My gut never lies. Of course it doesn't, I grumble. I don't have it in me to argue with Henry, especially about something as inconsequential as the predictions of his gut. I sit back in my seat, pick up the cookie, and take a generous bite. Mmm, that's good. It would be even better with a bowl of vanilla bean ice cream. Maybe I should follow Albany's lead and gorge myself on ice cream. I need an escape from my life, and I need it badly.
I assume Henry will start eating, but he just sits there staring at me with those beady eyes. What? I ask, shifting in my seat. Tell me what's wrong, he orders. You are an exasperating man, I bluster, immediately regretting my explosive reaction. He gives me a vindicated look. I told you something was wrong. Great. Just what Henry wanted, to get a rise out of me. If it's candor he wants, then it's candor he'll get, up close and personal. Fine. You want to know what's wrong? I plunk down my cookie as I lean forward, hurling my words through clenched teeth. I'll tell you. For starters, Jasper and I aren't going to work. I curse myself for allowing my voice to quiver as I swallow, determined to hold back the emotion. Henry's cheeks droop low. Why not? He's getting back together with his ex-girlfriend. I harumph. That's why. Henry shakes his head back and forth. No, that can't be right. What do you mean? I can't believe I'm letting myself get drawn into Henry's delusions. Maybe it's because I wish to the depth of my soul that there could be something to Henry's assertion about Jasper and me. He blinks. Nothing. I wag a finger. Oh no, I want to know what you meant by that. Here I go, doing exactly what I said I wouldn't, getting sucked down the rabbit hole. It's like I told you, my gut's never wrong. You and Jasper are destined to be together. Hope kindles in my breast, but I snuff it out with a brittle laugh. It's time for me to face the hard truth. Jasper and I are friends. He'll float off into the sunset with Renee, and I'll be stuck with picture-perfect Wade or some other guy who leaves me hollow on the inside. Destined, huh? Speaking of gut, you haven't touched your brownie. Dutifully, he picks up his fork and takes a bite. Happy now, he taunts as he thrusts out his chin and plops the fork back down with a ping. I can't help but chuckle. Ellie's right. Henry's an ornery old goat, always ready to fight. I have to admit, he's kind of growing on me. There's something endearing about his grittiness. What else is bothering you? Is that a note of concern that I detect in his raspy voice? I do believe it is. Jeepers creepers, the man does have a heart. I push out a heavy breath. I've been working like a mad woman to earn the down payment money so that I can get a loan to purchase the bakery. Do you remember Abigail, the owner of the bakery? He nods. She went to Florida. Yep, to be with her daughter and grandkids. Abigail called me last night. She needs to sell the bakery right away so she can help her daughter buy a house. She has a couple of interested buyers. I have until the end of the month to gather the money. The words cut like a knife coming from my lips. I still can't believe I'm losing the bakery and Jasper, all at the same time. A wave of desperation rises in my chest and I tamp it down. I refuse to fall apart. Henry looks thoughtful. At least you have a little time to figure things out. Yeah, at least. I don't have a prayer of amassing the down payment money in that short amount of time, but there's no sense in diving into the details with Henry. The only reason I've told him as much as I have is because he hounded me into it. Fire flashes in Henry's eyes. Back to Jasper. You need to fight for him. A high-pitched giggle bubbles from my lips. I seriously can't believe I'm having this conversation with Henry. I hold out a hand. Look, I can appreciate what you're doing. 
It's a notable sentiment to want to honor Gladys's memory by doing a good deed. But your efforts are misguided. He smirks. You mean noble? Huh? It's a noble sentiment, he repeats like I'm hard of hearing. I blink in annoyance. That's what I said. Good grief. Maybe Henry's the one who's going deaf. I enunciate every word. It's a noble sentiment. I smash the next words together. They come out waving like a battle flag. But you're way off base. He charges back with a surly, I don't think so. I lift my chin, drawing a line in the sand. I guess we'll just have to agree to disagree. He shakes his head in admiration. That's exactly what Gladys used to say. No wonder, I chuckle. You pestered her to death. The minute the word death leaves my lips, I realize what I said. I certainly meant no disrespect to Gladys. Thankfully, Henry doesn't seem to be the least bit offended. On the contrary, his eyes sparkle like they've captured fragments of a disco ball. She could hold her own, just like you. It dawns on me that Henry enjoys sparring with me. He seems to draw energy from it. He scoots back his chair. Time for me to have a word with Jasper. Panic flutters in my stomach. Don't you dare, I hiss. I mean it, Henry. I reach across the table and catch hold of his papery hand. It's cold as ice. If you want to continue our friendship, then you'll keep your mouth shut. He gives me a crafty look. You care about him that much. There's no winning with Henry. His hand is so fragile that I feel like I could crush it with the slightest bit of pressure. I release my hold, hoping that I haven't injured him. Promise me that you won't say a word. He looks me in the eye. Only if you promise to work things out with Jasper. Sure thing, I rush on. At this point, I'd promise him the moon, anything to keep his mouth shut. Jasper's coming to my house tonight. I don't dare add the part about how I'm teaching him to dance so he can impress Renee. I should have never listened to the girls. Blakely, Penn, and Albany got my hopes up about Jasper, making me believe that I could open my heart to him. Fat chance of that ever happening. Hello, a cheery voice says from behind. I turn to see none other than Renee Keith standing before me. I've heard the intermittent chime of the door, indicating that customers have been going in and out while Henry and I have been talking, but I didn't pay any attention to which people were coming and going. I narrow my eyes, wondering what Renee wants. She's one of those women who gush goodwill, but she'll hand you a casserole with one hand and stab you in the ribs with the other. I don't understand how Jasper can be so gullible where she's concerned. A friendly smile spreads over Renee's flawless face. I wanted to talk to you about Jasper. My heart nearly stops. What about him? Renee is a looker. I'm sure that's why Jasper's drawn to her. Who am I to cast judgment? Isn't that why I set my sights on Wade? Because he's so terrific looking? Renee tucks a lock of shimmery dark hair behind her ear. I just want to make sure there are no hard feelings between you and me. Renee's wearing black yoga pants and a lightweight black jacket, suggesting that she might have just come from the gym. Even in workout clothes, she looks terrific. Of course, it helps that she's tall and lean, not an ounce of flab on her. I really shouldn't be gorging myself on cookies or any other sugary confection. My spine goes poker straight. 
Why would there be any hard feelings? A delicate laugh issues from her throat. I know the two of y'all are close and all. I just hope you're not upset that he asked me to the cutie pie dance instead of you. Her dark blue eyes glimmer with triumph. My blood begins to boil. How dare this woman traipse into my bakery and goad me about Jasper? Actually, it's not my bakery and it never will be, but that's beside the point. Renee came in here looking for a fight. As my brain races to figure out an appropriate comeback, Henry speaks up. Ugh, Renee got me so discombobulated that I forgot Henry was here. How's the weather up there? Renee blinks. I beg your pardon? She looks at Henry as if just now realizing that he's sitting at the table. The weather up there, Henry croaks. I figure as tall as you are, you'd make a pretty good weather vane. Hysterical laughter surges up my throat. Thankfully, I manage to gulp it back down. Renee's eyes blaze wrath. You're a menace, old man. I heard what you did to Lance Wallace, Jared Crocker, and Chris Applegate. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Henry's rebuttal is so immediate that I can't help but be impressed. And you ought to try one of Skeet's walnut fudge brownies. It might help to put a little meat on those raggedy bones. Renee's eyes bulge as her face turns purple. I'll have you know that there are plenty of women who would kill for my figure. She throws me a smug look that suggests I'm one of those women. You keep telling yourself that, Henry counters. But I happen to know from experience that men prefer women with a little meat on their bones. He makes a point of looking at me before turning his gaze back to Renee. If you're so secure in your knowledge about how Jasper feels about you, then you wouldn't be in here torturing Skeet. He flicks a wrist. Now, do us all a favor and scatter. Renee's face turns crimson as she aims her devil fork at me. You might think you're superior because you've got Mr. Rogers fighting your battles. But honey, you don't stand a chance against me. She snubs her nose in the air, turns on her heel, and marches out of the bakery. Henry laughs. Mr. Rogers? He looks down at his button-up sweater. I suppose I've been called worse. I turn and give him an appraising look. You are something, I chuckle, shaking my head. A weather vane? That's the best you could come up with? A sly grin tugs at his lips. It did the trick. I suppose it did. He gives me a wise look. You know you liked seeing that bag of bones get put in her place. A giggle rises in my throat. I have to admit, that was satisfying. Henry makes a face. Are you really gonna let that horrible woman steal your man? He's not my man, I say quietly as I look down at the plate and partially eaten cookie. Renee has already won, and she knows it. There's one thing that you failed to realize here. My head snaps up. What's that? You hold all the cards. He gives me a penetrating look. The question is, what are you willing to do in order to win the game? Bracing his hands on the table, Henry rises to his feet. Anger streaks through me. Game? This isn't some game. This is my life. He gives me a shrewd look. Even more reason for you to fight. I motion to his plate. You only ate one bite of your brownie. Is Henry losing his appetite? Again, I think of his health. 
Every time I see him, he looks skinnier and more fragile. Now that Rene has left and the fight has gone out of him, the sallowness of his complexion has returned full force. Apprehension tugs at me. I don't want anything to happen to Henry. In a strange turn of events, I'm starting to care a great deal about him. It really was beautiful watching Henry battle wits with Rene. Henry is one tough codger. He gives me a fatherly smile. I know you've had a lot thrown at you. Just remember, take it one breath at a time. You'll see. It'll all work out. Without warning, tears spring to my eyes as I repeat the words I said when he told me this before. Well, seeing as how I can't quit breathing, I guess I'll just keep on doing it. Atta girl, he encourages as he shuffles across the room and out the door. Chapter 12 The one question that keeps running through my mind as I wait for Jasper to arrive is, should I tell him about the run-in with Renee? She probably already told him, and I'm sure she portrayed herself as the martyr that was preyed upon by the town grump. Jasper knows that I don't care for Renee. He thinks that Blakely, Penn, Albany, and I have always treated her unfairly. The truth is that we women see Renee for the two-faced twit she is, whereas Jasper is too blinded by her beauty to see the person within. Renee and Colette are good friends, more proof that birds of a feather flock together. Maybe I won't breathe a word about it to Jasper. If he mentions it to me, I'll just play it down, saying that Renee is being overly sensitive. People expect Henry to speak his mind. The doorbell rings and I hurry to answer it. Emotion charges through me when my eyes connect with Jasper's. Hey, I begin. I grin inwardly at how wrinkled his shirt is. His knuckles are red and there's a red mark running along his cheekbone. I raise an eyebrow. You and Bo been boxing again? Yep, over at Memphis's place. Ah, you were at Edwina's, the Silver Jalapeno. That's what Memphis has named his Airstream trailer. He and Penn are always going rounds about it, mostly in jest. But I can tell that Penn will be glad when Memphis builds his office and gets rid of the trailer. She worries that having a trailer next door to the bed and breakfast will be bad for business. He steps inside and comes close enough to me that my cells swirl. I look at his lips, my throat going dry. Are you hungry? A crooked grin lifts a corner of his lips. Always. I figured. I chuckle. Jasper's always hungry. It smells good. Jasper says as we go into the kitchen. What did you make? Something simple. Barbecue chicken, sweet potatoes, and country green beans. His eyes sparkle in amusement. Ah, something simple for the gourmet chef. The compliment warms my insides as a smile curves my lips. That is simple. Uh-huh, he drawls. It sounds delicious. Sit down and I'll make you a plate. He lifts an eyebrow. What did I do to deserve the royal treatment? Normally you make me fix my own plate. Do I need to be worried? He teases. Just sit down. I shoo him over to the table. I guess I am being extra nice to him. Henry said I hold all the cards, but I certainly don't see how. Every time I'm with Jasper, it carves out my heart because all I can think is that I'm going to lose him to Renee. As he takes his seat, I go over to grab a plate from the cupboard. You ready to do some dancing? I ask casually. Ready as I'll ever be, I reckon. I pop Jasper's plate into the microwave. When it's done, I grab a fork and napkin and carry the items over to him. He's sitting with his long legs stretched underneath the table. 
His sweater is pushed up at the sleeves, revealing his masculine forearms. Him being here with me feels so right. I wish I hadn't been such a scaredy cat before. I should have taken my chance with Jasper when he was open to the idea. Then again, it only took him a second to lose interest in me and turn his sights on Renee. He flat out said that us kissing was a mistake. I need to get that cemented in my brain once and for all. I put his plate in front of him and then go to retrieve him a glass of water. After placing it down, I sit across from him. He looks down at his plate. His boyish expression, filled with eagerness, twists my heart. This looks fantastic. The corners of his lips turn down. Aren't you eating with me? I wave a hand. I just finished right before you came. Go ahead, I prompt. He digs into his food with a relish that makes me grin. How's the sink? He asks in between bites. Any more leaks? Nope, you fixed it. Good, he sighs. Do you still need me to look at your garbage disposal? It seems like it's doing okay. It was acting funny a couple weeks ago, but it seems to be working like normal again. So, what did you do on your day off? I ask. Has Renee told him about our run-in? He's certainly not acting like it. I slept in, which was nice. Then I went over to Memphis's place and came here. I'm relieved that he didn't go and see Renee. He takes a large bite of his potato. After swallowing, he asks, What about you? How was your day? Good, I say casually. Busy. He nods as he turns his attention back to his food. A few minutes later, after clearing his plate of everything except for the potato peel, he sits back. Thank you. That hit the spot. I grin. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Concern touches his features as his perceptive eyes roam over my face. How are you really doing? Fine, I clip, but I'm unable to stop moisture from rising in my eyes. I blink furiously, frustrated at myself for getting choked up. He reaches for my hand, sending a charge of attraction through me. Hey, he begins. It'll be okay. The irony of the situation isn't lost on me. The very person telling me that everything will be okay is a large part of my distress. I take in a quick breath as a tear slips from the corner of my eye and rolls down my cheek. Jasper releases my hand and wipes away the tear with his thumb. His touch spritzes energy through me. He lowers his hand. Have you heard anything else about the bakery or the loan? No, I haven't called Matt. I guess I should do that soon. I offer a weak smile. There's no use in postponing the inevitable. Calling Matt will make everything painfully real. I'd wait until the deadline. There's no sense in rushing. Abigail gave you till the end of the month. I scrunch my nose. What am I waiting for? I blurt. I'm sorry, I amend. None of this is your fault. I'm just frustrated. You have a right to be. It's a lot to take in. I think of Henry's advice. I guess I'll just have to keep breathing in and out, I say with a touch of irony. That does seem to help, Jasper responds with a wry grin. My voice goes practical. I guess we should get to the dancing, he grimaces. Do we have to? I chuckle. No, we don't, but I thought that's what you wanted. Our eyes lock. All I can think is that I want him so desperately that it aches through my entire body. Several emotions I can't discern flick through his eyes. He swallows, his Adam's apple moving up and down. And then he seems to reach a decision. You should teach me a few moves, he grins. Otherwise, I'll make a complete idiot out of myself at the dance. We can't have that happening.
I retort. What would Renee think? God, that sounded sulky. Jasper frowns. Where's that coming from? Never mind, I mutter. His jaw tenses. No, I want to know. I blow out a hard breath. You know how I feel about Renee Keith, I snap. I do, he says evenly. You've made your feelings crystal clear. Anger runs a hot trail through my veins. What's that supposed to mean? He shakes his head. I didn't come here to argue with you about Renee. No, you came so I could teach you some moves to impress her. Amusement circles his eyes. Skate, he drawls with a low chuckle. Are you jealous? I rock back, my cheeks flaming. Not in the slightest, he arches an eyebrow. Are you sure? My hands go into the air. Look, just because I'm trying to protect you from the likes of Renee Keith does not mean that I'm jealous. Okay, he says easily. I hear you. The smirk on his handsome face tells me that he doesn't buy it. He tips his head in thought. The best way for you to make sure that I'm protected from Renee is for us to double date. Not that again, I thunder. Why not? It's the best way for you to watch out for me and for me to watch out for you. You are still going to the dance with Wade. You betcha, I fire back, feeling a twinge of satisfaction when Jasper's jaw hardens. It's settled, he says in a tone that leaves no room for argument. We're double dating. A high-pitched chortle nearly cuts off my breath. That's the worst idea I've ever heard. His eyes blaze with a ferocity that's both awe-inspiring and infuriating. No one can get my feathers ruffled faster than Jasper. We're doing it, he utters. I blow out a long breath. Fine. This will be disastrous. If Renee hasn't yet told Jasper about the incident at the bakery, I'm sure she will. Probably when we're all together. Also, Jasper will witness firsthand how awkward and stale things between Wade and me truly are. A hard smile stretches over his lips. Shall we dance? My traitorous body sizzles with anticipation, just thinking about being close to Jasper. Fine, I bark. Jasper picks up his plate, takes it to the garbage, and scrapes off the peel before placing it into the sink and running water over it. I grab his silverware and glass and put the items into the sink. Our hands brush, tracing ribbons of heat through my stomach. This idiotic attraction to Jasper is maddening. We go into the living room. I steel my shoulders as I mentally prepare myself for the task. The idea is to keep my feelings in check. On top of everything else I'm going through, I certainly don't need the added humiliation of Jasper thinking I'm pining away for him. I step into the center of the room. Let's do this, I grumble. With a cheeky grin, he comes in my direction with fluid steps. Wow, he's fit. Men like Jasper Donaldson are the reason people call firefighters hunky. No wonder he's in such great shape. When he's working his 24-hour shift, he spends the bulk of his free time working out at the state-of-the-art gym at the firehouse. And then, on his days off, he boxes with Bo and Memphis. No music? He asks, a wicked glint in his chocolate eyes. A curl slips down on his forehead, giving him a boyish look. My fingers itch to run through his messy curls. I don't have a music player, but I guess I could find us something on my phone. Well, yeah, he spouts back. Who wants to dance without music? I'm already gonna look like a yard chicken pecking his way through the grass. 
I at least need some music as a distraction. He flaps his arms and starts walking like a chicken. I can't help but laugh. Jasper knows just how to pull my strings. Okay, I'll get my phone. For a second, I forget about the bakery or Jasper taking Renee to the dance. The weight on my heart lightens considerably as I hurry in the kitchen to get my phone. I go back into the living room and scroll through my music. Most of the songs are fast for clogging. Finally, I find a playlist by the band Chicago. The mellow tune of Hard Habit to Break fills the room. My heart beats faster as I step up to him. I can't deny that he exudes a power that draws me to him like a magnet. Without my heels, my head comes to Jasper's shoulders. I feel petite and dainty in comparison to his powerful body. I look up at him as his compelling gaze holds mine. My voice sounds too cheerful in my ears as I begin the instruction. I place my left hand on your shoulder. I place my hand on him, trying not to notice the ridges of his muscles. We clasp hands. He takes my hand in a firm grip, evoking a string of shivers down my spine. The warmth from his skin flows into me like a heater. I swallow, willing myself to get a grip. Put your other hand on my waist. He does as I instruct, but then frowns. Nah, that's not working for me. My jaw goes slack. Huh? He encircles my waist, pulling me to him with such force that I grunt in surprise. Soft laughter rolls from his throat. Much better. Now what? For a split second, all thoughts fly right out of my head. Then I manage to collect myself. We move to the beat of the music. The guy leads. A cocky grin tips his lips. I'm all for that. He begins wheeling me around in a circle, our joined hands moving up and down. Slow down, speed racer, I giggle. We're not rowing a boat. He gives me a sheepish grin as he backs off a little. You direct me with the flex of your hand on the center of my lower back. He puts pressure on my back to go a certain direction. Like so? Yep, that's it. Jasper has always been a quick study. I have no doubt that he'll master dancing just as surely as he has mastered everything else. He practices moving me around in various directions. Good. Now twirl me. His eyes widen. Huh? I chuckle at the surprise on his face. Release the pressure on my hand and hold up your arm. As he does so, I dart underneath. Now pull me back into your arms. You don't have to ask twice, he murmurs. His eyes deepen with an intensity that quivers anticipation through me. The next song is... You're the inspiration. We sway in silence. The energy in the room is crackling and sizzling, building like an electrical storm. I don't know how much more of this I can take without giving in and pressing my lips to his. What next? He asks softly. Hmm? With a slight jump, I break myself out of the spell. He's asking which dance step is next. We can do the cuddle step. His eyes sparkle. If you wanted to cuddle, all you had to do was say the word. Right on cue, my cheeks go warm. I roll my eyes. Don't get too excited. It's a dance move. You take your left arm and then turn me to the left. Pivoting my hand in his, I position myself so that my back is resting against his stomach. His embrace is powerful, thrilling. My breath hitches when he leans into my ear. His warm breath tickles and teases my skin as he murmurs. How's that? Good, I croak. He smells so good. 
so wonderfully fresh and masculine. Okay, I have to think here. To get me out, lift your left arm again, and I step out. I turn to face him, his eyes light with mirth. I like that move. Let's try it again. I don't know how much more of this my heart can take without shattering to pieces. Once more, I say tonelessly as he lifts his arm and turns me into another embrace. He steps closer to me as we sway. Okay, now turn me out, I instruct. Not yet, we're still cuddling. Laughter ripples from my throat. I never pictured you as a cuddler. You never pictured me as a lot of things, he utters, his voice going husky. His touch is so wonderful and yet so agonizing. The words spill from my lips. What's happening here? You tell me. My phone rings, cutting off the music and breaking the spell. I extricate myself from his arms. I better get that, I say, but Jasper is faster. I'll get it. He goes over and picks up the phone. When he sees the screen, the edges of his eyes tighten. It's Wade Claiborne, he smirks. Hand it over. I hold out my hand to get the phone, but then I see defiance flash in Jasper's eyes. In the snap of a finger, he answers the call with a hearty, Hello? What are you doing? I hiss. Give me the phone. Hey, no, you don't have the wrong number. This is Skeet's phone. She's right here with me. I dive at Jasper to grab the phone, but he's faster. He turns himself around and holds the phone so that I can't get to it. I try to hop around him, but he fields me off with such ease that I realize my attempts are futile. This is Jasper, he says pleasantly. How you doing? Oh, why am I here? Skate's showing me the cuddle hug. My eyes nearly bug out of my head. It's the cuddle step, you idiot. I can only imagine what Wade must be thinking. At this rate, he'll refuse to go to the dance and I'll be out of a date. Is that Jasper's big plan? Put me on the outs with Wade while he gets cozy with Renee? Anger ignites like a blowtorch through my insides. Jasper lets out a throaty chuckle. My bad. It's the cuddle step. We're practicing for the dance. Hey, would you and Skeet be up for double dating with me and my date? I'm going with Renee Keith. We'd love to have y'all join us. His voice lilts. Great. How about this? We'll all meet at Skeet's house at six. It'll be a party. I can't believe Jasper's audacity. Give me the phone, I demand, slapping his back. Oh, you want to talk to Skeet? He contorts himself around to look at me. His mouth is set in a smile, but his expression is intense. Sorry, he says easily. She can't get to the phone right now, but I'll be sure and have her call you back. Okay, bye now. What was that? I rage as he ends the call. His jaw goes razor sharp. You have concerns about Renee, and I have concerns about Wade. I get up in his face. You have no right to butt into my business. He doesn't back down an inch. I have every right. That's what friends are for. Ha! With friends like you who needs enemies. A taunting smile lifts his lips. I could say the same about you. Wariness wraps my stomach. What do you mean? Renee told me what you said to her at the bakery. My face falls as I plant a hand on my hip. My voice escalates to a fever pitch. What I said? Surprise flicks through Jasper's eyes. Are you seriously trying to deny it? You're darn tootin' I am. I didn't say anything out of line to Renee. From Jasper's bewildered look... 
I gather that Rene has been feeding him all sorts of malarkey. What did she tell you, I said? That you made wisecracks about her height and weight, saying that she was a weather vane and a bag of bones? Disappointment clouds his eyes. That was low, Skeet. You know that Renee has a hang-up about her height. For an instant, I can't believe my ears. Wow, Renee really did a hack-up job on the truth. Then again, what did I expect? It's Renee Keith. Of course she did. I cackle out a short laugh. This is why I keep telling you that you can't trust a word Renee says. I knew she was trouble from the minute she and Stephanie Pace streaked through town naked as crows. His eyes pop to saucers before a chortle bursts from his throat. It's naked as jaybirds, he corrects. I throw up my hands. Who's to say a jaybird is any more naked than any other type of bird? My voice goes hard. Besides, I'd much rather think of Renee as a crow than a jaybird. That's harsh, he says, but the amusement zinging in his eyes douses my anger a fraction. You know the story. Renee and Stephanie streaked through town when they were twelve, on a dare. I lift my chin. So what? It happened. Yes, it did, he agrees. Something flashes in his eyes. The same way our first kiss happened. Let it go, he encourages gently. It's time to move on. I don't have to look in the mirror to know that my cheeks are blazing. Why did he have to bring up that wretched kiss that planted the seed of fear in me? If only Jasper hadn't acted so weird about the kiss, then I might not have such a phobia about the two of us. Okay, it's not fair for me to blame Jasper for my hang-ups. It occurs to me that Jasper said it was time to move on. The knowledge mires my heart in glue. Jasper's moving on with Renee. I guess it's time for me to move on, too. Not wanting to dwell on my sad state, I shift gears. You shouldn't believe everything Renee says. The woman lies like a dog. I never said those things to her. Henry Roach did. He gives me a doubtful look. Why would Henry Roach want to insult Renee? Ew, I realize too late that I've backed myself into a corner. I can't very well tell Jasper why Henry said those things without admitting that I have feelings for Jasper. I guess I could harp on Henry being misguided in his attempt to get Jasper and me together. However, I'm afraid if I go down that road, my true feelings will shine through. I shrug my shoulders, adopting a disinterested tone. You know Henry. He's always dissing on someone. I happened to be talking to Henry at the bakery when Renee waltzed in and rubbed my nose in the fact that you're taking her to the cutie pie dance instead of me. A dart of pleasure zips through his dark eyes as a grin curves his lips. Skeet, are you jealous? He taunts softly. He takes a step closer, revving up the molecules in my cells. His eyes take on a wicked glint. You know, he drawls, if we practice kissing, it might help you get over your fear. Desire whooshes through me like the flames of a furnace. Then my brain gives me a much-needed reality check. This isn't some twisted game. This is my heart we're talking about. I force a light chuckle. No thanks. If there's any kissing to be done, I'm sure that Wave can do the trick. His features harden. You need to watch yourself around that one. He smirks. I wouldn't put it past him to use you to get at Colette. The comment comes at me like a punch in the gut. Are you suggesting that the only reason why Wade is going out with me is to make Colette jealous? The nerve. He lifts an eyebrow. Well, 
considering the timing, it does make one wonder. Blood starts pounding my temples as I go blistering hot. So someone like Wade couldn't simply like me for me. Take it easy, he cautions. I'm just looking out for you. I grunt, looking away. Skeet, he implores. Look at me. I do so, and am surprised to see the agony in his eyes. What do you want from me? A lump forms in my throat. I want you to feel the same way about me as I do about you, my mind shouts. I want you to tell me that the two of us can have something more than just a friendship. I want to guarantee that our relationship will work, that I won't get my heart ground to bits. I guess that's the problem. I'm looking for a guarantee that no one, not even Jasper, could ever give. I don't want anything from you, I say flatly. He steps back, running both hands through his curls. A second later, a tight smile forms over his lips. All right, then. I think I'll leave on that note. My heart thuds out a dull beat as I swallow. But we haven't finished our dance. He gives me a long, hard look that's shrink-wrapped in disappointment. I think we have. Tears burn my eyes as he turns on his heel and stalks across the room and to the front door. That's it, huh? I yell after him. When things get tense between us, you just walk out? Desperation claws at me. He turns, shaking his head. No, Skeet, you're the one who's walking out on us. I'm just the one leaving. His eyes lock with mine. Good night. Chapter 13 This is not what I ordered, Samantha Camp insists, her fair complexion turning as red as her hair. It has been a day from Hades. This is the third order that has gotten messed up. I'm so sorry for the mix-up. I begin. The downside of being the manager is having to put out fires, while keeping irate customers from biting your head off. Tori, my newest employee, boxed up these orders. I thought she was ready to take on more responsibility, but evidently not. Samantha leans over the counter, a crazed look in her eyes. Do you know what would have happened if Danny had eaten one of these cookies? Her voice goes shrill. He has a peanut allergy. It could have been disastrous. I understand, I soothe. Again, I apologize. I've spent half of my day running back and forth to the bakery. I got home and was getting everything ready for Danny's birthday party when I realized that the cookies were all wrong. We're standing off to the side of the bakery case. However, Samantha's loud voice easily carries throughout the entire room. The eyes of the other customers are zeroing in on us. I can see the headline of Nellie Kinsey's blog now. Abigail's bakery is a flop. The manager can't keep track of the orders. Or worse, cookie mix-up causes a young boy to go into anaphylactic shock. We'll fix the order right now. I assure Samantha, and the cost is on the house. The stress lines around her eyes and mouth dissolve. That would be good. Also, I'll throw in two dozen double fudge cupcakes. Her expression brightens. Okay, thank you. Relief rolls through me. How about this? I say in a cheerful tone. I'll get you a complimentary cookie and milk. You can sit and relax while we fix your order. An appreciative smile touches her lips. That would be good. Thank you, she sighs. I'm sorry I got so upset. It's been a crazy day trying to get ready for Danny's party. I got all the way home and realized that the cookies were wrong, so I had to turn around and come back into town. 
I totally understand. I give her a warm smile. It's no problem. I'm just sorry that we added to the stress of your day. Samantha lives way out in the country. Twenty minutes from town. No wonder she's flustered. I'm grateful that she's allowing me to fix the problem. What type of cookie would you like? She steps over to the middle of the counter and peers through the glass. Would it be okay if I have a brownie instead of a cookie? You betcha. I'll take one of those. She points to the chocolate iced brownies. I give her one and get the milk. Once I get her situated, I turn to Tori, who's working the front counter. The poor girl looks like she might faint. Before you leave today, we need to have a talk, I say quietly. She nods, her ponytail bobbing up and down. Then she casts a furtive glance at Samantha before turning her attention to the next customer in line. I hurry back to the kitchen where Ellie and a couple of other women, Phyllis and Julie Beth, are working. We need to fix an order, I announce. Ellie's eyes widen to saucers. Another one? I'm afraid so. Her hand goes to her hip as she curses under her breath. Tori needs to learn how to put orders together, she grumbles. I know she's young and just out of high school, but this is getting ridiculous. It is, I agree in the firm tone of the one in charge. I've got it under control. I give quick instructions to the women on how to prepare Samantha's order. I make sure to tell them to throw in the cupcakes. I go back to dipping strawberries. At 4 p.m., it occurs to me that Henry hasn't come into the bakery. Normally, he comes in around 3. Should I call and check on him? No, maybe not. I don't want to get pulled into any more drama than I'm already in. I'm so swamped with work that I really don't have time to spend with him today anyhow. Henry will want to know if I talk to Jasper. I still can't believe that Jasper walked out on me last night or that he insisted on us double dating to the dance. The last thing I need is Henry pestering me and making the situation worse. At a quarter till five, Tori sticks her head in the kitchen. You've got a visitor. Thanks, I say as I remove my apron. Maybe Henry's running late. I go out into the customer area to see a familiar head of glossy chestnut hair. Blakely is sitting at one of the tables. Hey, what are you doing here? I pull out a chair and sit down. I do a quick mental calculation. Don't you have a class? She flicks her hand. I gave my students the day off so they can study for a test coming up at the end of the week. Her eyes spark. I figured I'd better get my behind over here and find out what in the heck is going on between you and my brother. Shh. I hiss as I glance around. I don't want everyone here in my business. A deep crease forms between her brows. What the heck happened? She angry whispers. When Albany Penn and I left your house Sunday night, you were all set to tell Jasper that you want to make a go of your relationship. Then Jasper informs me that he's going to the dance with Renee and you're going with Wade? And that y'all are double dating? She gives me a disbelieving look. Have you lost your freaking mind? Several people who are standing in line glance in our direction. I reach across the table and grab Blakely's hand. Shh, I warn again, but she just rolls her eyes. I let go of her hand, making sure to keep my voice low as I explain. I had intended to tell Jasper how I feel about him. The words sit heavy on my tongue as I force out the rest. However, before I could, he told me that he was moving on. With Renee. Blakely makes a face. That's absurd. Jasper doesn't want Renee. He wants you. I'm afraid you're wrong, I say tonelessly. My heart squeezes to the size of a withered avocado. Jasper doesn't want to risk our friendship any more than I do. 
He said that he realized that the two of us getting romantically involved would be a mistake. My voice trembles as I press on. He said he wants to see if he and Renee can rekindle the old flame. I swallow the tightness in my throat, vowing to myself that I'll hold it together. That's a crock, Blakely barks. What's my brother trying to pull? Nothing, I mumble. You need to let it go. Her voice gathers intensity. Skeet, you have to fight for what you want. My eyes grow moist. Sometimes things just don't work out the way we want them to. You know that better than anybody. Blakely's hurting over her recent breakup. I can see the strain on her expression. It oozes out and blends with my own pain. She's living her life vicariously through Jasper and me. I get where she's coming from, and I'm touched that she cares so much. Still, she's wrong. Her eyes flash with fierce obstinance. No, she fumes. You and Jasper are meant to be together. Her voice grows hoarse as tears pool in her eyes, fogging up her glasses. She removes them, rubs the lenses with the hem of her shirt, and then places them back on her face. No, she says, her voice gaining more control. I won't accept defeat. She squares her jaw. You and Jasper are made for each other. I get the feeling that she's trying to convince herself of that even more than she's trying to convince me. I look her in the eye. Blakely? She flinches. What? I'm okay, truly. I force a smile. She grunts. You don't look okay. I don't? Fine, if I'm being completely honest, I'm not okay with Jasper and me, but there's not a dang thing I can do about it. He's moved on. It's time for me to do the same. No, she smirks. A second later, she scoots back her chair and jumps to her feet. Her expression is determined. I'm gonna have a nice little talk with my brother. She grabs her purse from the back of the chair and slides the strap over her shoulder. Alarm races through me. Please don't. You'll only make things worse. Comfort is starting to feel impossibly small. I wish people would just let me live my life without interfering. First Henry and now Blakely. A hard smile forms over Blakely's lips. Don't worry. I'll get to the bottom of this. You'll see. Blakely, don't, I plead, but my words fall on deaf ears. She's already halfway across the room. A second later, she throws open the door and charges through it. I feel the eyes of everyone in the room pinging me with curiosity. Automatically, I flash a smile. I keep trying to talk Blakely out of going on a shopping spree, but she just won't listen, I say breezily. That's all it takes for folks to lose interest. A curious numbness settles over me as I wonder if I should call Jasper and warn him that Blakely's on the warpath. On second thought, I'll just stay out of it. It takes me a couple of seconds to realize that my phone is buzzing. I retrieve it from my back pocket. It's Abigail. I slide my finger over the phone and answer. Hello? I get up from the table and walk briskly back into the kitchen so that I won't be forced to have another conversation while in a fishbowl. Skeet, Abigail begins warmly in her cultured voice that has a rolling spin to it. How are you? I'm okay, I say neutrally. How does she expect me to be? I've always had great respect for Abigail. She's a good person, and it took grit and determination for her to build her business from scratch. As hard as it is for me to know that I'm losing the bakery, I do understand where she's coming from about wanting to help her daughter and grandkids. 
However, Abigail's not my favorite person right now. I need space to work through my hurt and disappointment. Excited laughter trills through the phone. You won't believe what happened, she says in a breathless sing-song voice. What? I ask dully. Someone gave me the down payment for your loan. I hear the words, but I don't understand their meaning. I bunch my brows. Huh? Your down payment has been paid, Abigail exclaims. You can now get your loan. The floor shifts beneath my feet as I stumble over to the wall so I can lean against it. I, I don't understand. She laughs again. A person wishing to remain anonymous sent me the money to pay the down payment on your loan. She rushes on. It's a miracle. She sucks in an audible breath. I've been so worried about you. I felt so bad about giving you an ultimatum, and yet I didn't know what else to do. I had to help Heather and her kids. Her voice rings with jubilation. Now you can purchase the bakery, as we planned all along. Tears blur my vision as my mind whirls. Someone paid the down payment? Is this real or am I dreaming? Yes, ma'am, Abigail chirps. Air leaves my lungs. Who? I can't tell you, she chuckles slyly. I've been sworn to secrecy. So you're telling me that someone gave you money to pay the down payment on my loan and you won't tell me who it is? I probably should be jumping for joy right now, but I'm too bewildered. I guess the full scope of the situation hasn't set in yet. I keep waiting for her to say, psych, or just kidding. Curiosity nips at me. Who's my benefactor? I shake my head. Wait a minute. Is it even possible for someone other than me to pay the down payment? I brace myself, hoping with all my heart that the bank will accept the gift. Yes, she squeals. It's perfectly legal. I called the bank and spoke with Matt. As soon as the money clears my account, I'm sending it straight to the bank. I nibble on my lower lip, still hung up on who sent the money. It has to be Henry. He said that everything would be okay, and he mentioned buying and selling stocks. Is that why Henry didn't keep his standing appointment at the bakery this afternoon? Maybe he wanted to avoid my questions. A smile slips over my lips. That sly dog. Henry is a man of many layers. Gratitude swells in my chest. I try to hold back the tears, but they slip from my eyes and roll down my cheeks. I glance across the room at Ellie, who's watching me in concern. It's okay, I mouth, giving her a reassuring grin. I can hardly believe this is happening. Is there not any way that you could tell me who gave you the money? I ask Abigail again. No, ma'am, she shoots back. I gave my word. I push out a long sigh. Okay. I can't contain the ginormous smile that fills my face like warm sunshine. I know who it was. Henry Roach. There's a long pause before Abigail says easily, I'll never tell. Well, I should let you go. Matt said he'll be in touch to get the ball rolling on the paperwork. We say our goodbyes as she ends the call. I stand there, my mind racing. Are you okay? Ellie asks as she glances at Phyllis and Julie Beth. Yeah. I go over to the nearest stool and collapse onto it. Henry, I utter, shaking my head. Giddy laughter bubbles from my lips. Suddenly, I know what I need to do. I don't care how crazy things are right now at work. I need to go over to Henry's house this instant and thank him. Guilt rolls in my gut. To think I was relieved when Henry didn't come in today. 
and he gave me the greatest gift. I need to run an errand. I look at Ellie. Will you hold down the fort while I'm gone? You bet, she assures me with a confident nod. Thank goodness for Ellie. I think of something else as I hold up a finger. Oh, tell Tori that I'll talk to her in the morning. We'll do, Ellie says. My gaze sweeps over all three women. It has been crazy trying to get ready for Valentine's Day, but we'll get there. My voice cracks with emotion. I hope you all know how much I appreciate everything that you do. Ellie gives me a funny look. Are you sure you're okay? Couldn't be better. I chime as I waltz out of the room and head to my office to grab my purse. When I pull up to Henry's house, my heart drops when I see the fire engine and a police car. His place is under siege, with firemen going in and out. I survey the group to find Jasper. I don't see him, but I spot Bo over to the side talking to Deputy Dwight Jones. I jump out of the car and rush up to them. What happened? I search their faces, fearing the worst. We lost him, Bo says quietly, remorse shadowing his face. Tears spring to my eyes. Henry? He nods. Oh, no. My knees buckle as Dwight grabs my elbow. Easy, he cautions. A wave of dizziness engulfs me. No, I whimper, my shaky hands going over my mouth. Stars explode around me. This can't be happening. I could tell that Henry wasn't well, but I never expected him to die. Dwight leads me over to the front porch steps and helps me sit down. I clutch my hands in my lap. My legs tremble uncontrollably, tears streaming down my face. Bo sits down beside me and rubs my arm. Are you okay? Ignoring his question, I jerk around to face him. What happened? He had leukemia, Bo answers. I didn't realize that you and Henry were close. A futile laugh rises in my throat. We were. I lean forward and bury my head in my hands, letting the grief overtake me. I cry for Henry and the loss of his life. I cry for myself out of regret for not being a better friend to him. He sought me out. I should have called him today when he didn't come to the bakery. Was he still alive at that time? Didn't he die thinking I didn't care? I don't know how much time passes before I hear a familiar voice. Skeet, Jasper says gently. I raise myself up and turn to him. He's sitting where Bo was. I can't believe he's gone. A sob wrenches my throat as Jasper gathers me in his arms and lets me cry. Finally, when my tears are spent, I pull back, wiping at my eyes. I'm sorry, I sniff. I'm a wreck. My nose is running all over the place. I wipe my hands on my pants. My eyes are big and sore. A cold lump of nothingness has replaced what used to be my heart. Jasper searches my face. The compassion in his soft brown eyes causes more emotion to well inside me. I swallow it down before it can escape. I didn't realize that you and Henry were so close. Why does everyone keep saying that? I retort, giving him a hard look. His eyes widen just making an observation. I suck in a breath. We were. I push my stringy hair from my face. I didn't even get a chance to thank him. For what? For paying the down payment on my loan? Shock registers on Jasper's expression. It came as a surprise to me, too, I continue. Abigail called earlier and said that an anonymous person sent her the money to pay the down payment. Jasper frowns. 
Are you sure that Henry's the one who paid it? No, not exactly. But it has to be him. Who else has that kind of money? Jasper has an odd look on his face. Who else could have done it? I press. He shakes his head. I'm not sure. I rub a hand over my forehead as a hard laugh scratches my throat. He never told me he was sick. My voice breaks. Had I known, I would have been kinder, more patient. I'm sure that's why he didn't tell you. What do you mean? Henry struck me as the kind of person who didn't want pity. He didn't tell anyone that he was sick. He hired a private nurse to come in each day and take care of him. But he didn't get someone locally. The woman drove in every day from Mobile. Laughter rises in my throat. That's so Henry. We sit in silence for a few beats until Jasper speaks. There's something else that you should know. I turn to him. What? He takes my hand and sandwiches it between his. Normally, I would get all Twitter-pated about Jasper's closeness. But right now, all I can think is, what is he going to tell me? Henry was still alive when we arrived. Tears pool in my eyes before running down my face. What else? I pull my hand away from him and use it to wipe my tears. He recognized me. He grabbed my hand and told me that if I didn't take care of you, he'd dig his way out of the grave and come back to wring my neck. I clip out an incredulous laugh. Henry never stopped. He had this crazy idea that the two of us were destined to be together. Don't worry, I add quickly. I set him straight and told him that you and Renee are an item. Jasper goes bug-eyed. Why do you tell him that? I raise the pitch of my voice to match his. Because it's true. You said that you and Renee are trying to rekindle the old flame. I give him a scathing look. Don't you dare try to deny it. He holds up his hands and laughs nervously. I wouldn't dream of it. Bo comes sauntering over wearing a smirk the size of Texas. So, how's it going with the besties? He points two fingers and moves them from Jasper to me. Y'all fighting or loving today? My head feels like it might snap off and rocket clear up to the sky. Bo Primrose, I bluster. You're an idiotic dingbat. He hoots. <laughs> dingbat, huh? Never been accused of that before. I run my words back through my brain. Correction, I snap. Idiotic doofus. Ouch, your woman has a tongue sharp enough to cut metal. Bo winks at Jasper. Better mind your P's and Q's, Donaldson. This one keeps you on a tight leash. Stop it, Jasper warns Bo, his jaw hard as glass. With a chuckle, Bo shakes his head and strolls away. Don't mind him, Jasper grumbles. He doesn't have enough brains to fill a pinhead. A cackle slurps from my lips, easing some of the tension between my shoulder blades. He never has. I'm glad that he has Presley, but for the life of me, I don't see how she puts up with him. Amen, Jasper fires back as we share a smile of understanding. It's gonna be okay, Jasper assures me. I take in a deep breath. I guess I'll just have to keep taking one breath at a time. A scant smile touches my lips as I think of Henry. Is he still inside? Jasper nods. A sense of duty fills me. I want to see him. He catches hold of my arm. That's not a good idea. When I start to argue, he cuts in. Henry would want you to remember him as he was. The tenderness on Jasper's face causes me to go teary-eyed again. I blink back the emotion. Come here, 
Jasper murmurs as he slides an arm around my shoulders and pulls me close. His touch is as comforting as it is stimulating, causing tingles to cascade through my body. I rest my head against the curve of his shoulder. He slides his fingers up and down my arm. It'll be okay, Jasper soothes again. Sitting here in the protection of his embrace, I can almost believe that he's right. Chapter 14 The next several days pass in a blur. Before I know it, Valentine's Day is here. The dance looms over me like the march of doom. Several times I almost called Wade to cancel. I would, except that Jasper will balk and give me grief. The easiest thing to do is to just get it over with. Albany surprised me at the bakery, bringing me one of her signature dresses to wear. She said it's only fitting that I should have it, considering that she designed it for me. It's a rich, vivid red with silky fabric that molds to my figure. Albany says it'll look great with my tawny hair and olive skin. My brown hair is tipped with gold on the ends. I suppose it could pass for tawny. The dress is gorgeous. Albany insisted that the two of us go into my office so that she could have me try it on to make sure it fit. Albany was prepared to do some quick alterations, but her services weren't needed. The dress fits like a glove. I decided to wear my curls piled high on my head with dangly diamond earrings. I peer into the mirror and I can't help but be impressed with the dark-eyed, exotic woman staring back. I keep reminding myself of how important Valentine's Day was to Gladys. Honoring her memory helps to honor Henry. He didn't want a funeral. A graveside service will be held instead. It's this coming Wednesday. Two days from now. I wonder if any of Henry's family will come to town. Does he even have family? It'll be interesting to find out. My heart hurts thinking that Henry's gone. Oh, how I wish I could thank Henry for his generous gift. My only consolation is that Henry is now with Gladys. I reach for my favorite cologne, spray it into the air, and step into the mist. As I'm slipping on the red, strappy sandals that Albany gave me, the doorbell rings. Showtime, I say as I check my reflection one last time. I hurry down the stairs, hoping that Wade will get here first. It'll be painfully awkward to have to make polite conversation with Jasper and Renee. I don't even want to think about the depth of feeling emanating from Jasper's deep brown eyes on the day that Henry passed. Nor do I want to remember how it felt to have his arm firmly fixed around me. Those wretched thoughts need to be banished from my mind. Straightening my shoulders and holding in my stomach, I glide to the door. I open it, a sharp disappointment stabbing through me. It's Jasper and Renee. Both surprise and appreciation streak through Jasper's expressive eyes as he looks me up and down. You look incredible, he murmurs. Thanks. I look at Renee and can practically see steam coming out of her ears. She gives me a look that could kill, which I make a point of ignoring. Come on in. Wade should be here any minute. They step inside as Jasper closes the door. An awkward silence descends over us. Jasper looks sharp in a crisp white button-down shirt, black tie, and black trousers. Why does he have to be so dang fit with all of those wonderful muscles? His curls are tamed, emphasizing the strong lines of his jaw. My gaze goes to his faint scar. It makes him look sexy and tough. I think of his lips, how they were both soft and demanding against mine. 
I trace the outline of his powerful shoulders, noting how the fabric of his shirt is stretched over them. The essence of him fills the space, making me keenly aware of how much I'm drawn to him. Our eyes catch and hold as an electric charge rushes through me. Then, Renee severs the connection by clearing her throat. Jasper jumps as an undercurrent of red seeps into his chiseled cheeks. I grin inwardly, feeling a ping of triumph. At least Jasper still feels some sort of attraction to me. Renee is not making any bones about staring me down. No doubt she's still smarting from our last encounter. The heat of her glare is annoying. I look her in the eye before glancing her up and down. Nice dress. Thanks, she says stiffly. It's true, Renee looks fabulous, as always. Her violet dress shows off her willowy figure. Her honey blonde hair falls just below her shoulders and does a peppy turn up on the ends. Renee is the picture of style. Interesting that Jasper said Renee is self-conscious about her height. With me being short, I would have thought Renee's height would be an advantage. I guess it just goes to show that everyone can find flaws with their bodies. Jasper shoves his hands into his pockets and rocks forward on the balls of his feet. Well, no surprise. Wonder Boy is late. My eyebrow slides up. Are you seriously bagging on my date? His dark eyes twinkle like he's tickled to get a rise out of me. Nah, he drawls. I'll let the bed off easy tonight. His gaze moves over me slowly and thoroughly, like he's soaking in every detail. How mighty kind of you, I sass, trying to downplay the energy flowing between us. Perhaps feeling threatened by the familiarity between Jasper and me, Renee steps closer to him and links her arm through his. The territorial move makes it crystal clear that Jasper is with her. The doorbell rings. Jasper extricates himself from Renee's grasp and opens the door. Hey, he booms in a friendly tone like he and Wade are old friends. Hello, Wade responds. Come on in, Jasper says like it's his home. Aren't you the gentleman? Jasper points at the plastic container Wade is holding. You brought ski to corsage. Amusement flicks in Jasper's eyes. This is like prom all over again. Wade's face turns beet red as I shoot Jasper an exasperated look that says, cut it out. What? Jasper asks innocently. I just shake my head and float Wade a doting smile. Thank you. That was so thoughtful. Wade looks good, too. Dressed in a white shirt, tan pants, and a red tie. He really is a pretty boy although in comparison to Jasper's muscular frame, Wade seems a little puny. Wade opens the container and slides the corsage over my wrist. You look great. At least Wade noticed my appearance tonight. Thanks, I grin, noting the look of fury that crosses Jasper's features. Renee notices it too and eyes me with open malice. Let's get going. Jasper suggests. He looks at Wade. I take it you're driving? I hadn't really planned on it. Wade hedges, tightening his hold on the empty container. It crackles under his grip. We could go in my truck, Jasper counters in a cavalier tone. But then you and Skeet would have to sit in the back. My vote's the truck. Renee pipes in, giving me a mean smile. Only if you sit in the back, I say casually. Renee's face turns bright red as she turns to Jasper. I told you this wasn't gonna work, she snaps. That does it, 
my words come flying out like an army charging into battle. What was your first clue when you waltzed into my bakery and staked a claim on Jasper? Or was it when you lied to him and said that I made snide comments about your height and weight? Renee's eyes fly open wide before narrowing to fiery slits. How dare you? Jasper chuckles as he places a hand on Renee's arm. Now, now, take it easy. Skeet was only joking. He looks at me to back him up. Sure, I snip. It was all a big joke. I lock eyes with Jasper, hoping that he'll get the meaning of my words. Us attempting to double date is one big joke. Jasper brings his hands together, his tone cheerful. Let's get to it. Wade looks seriously uncomfortable. I reach for the container. Here, let me put that down so you won't have to carry it around all night. He gives me an appreciative smile as I go over and place the container on the nearby bench. Jasper and Renee are almost out the door when I remember that I haven't grabbed my phone, purse, or keys. I'll be right back, I tell Wade as I hurry into the kitchen to grab my purse off the island. I really don't want to carry my purse around all night, but I need my things. We go out the door and I lock it behind us. I don't know why Wade was hesitant about driving his BMW. I remember him saying that he's driving the silver one while he waits for his black one to arrive. Still, a BMW's a BMW. It's super nice. A far cry from Jasper's beat-up truck or even my well-used Honda. Maybe Wade doesn't want Jasper to put his driving skills under scrutiny. That's probably it. Jasper lets out a low whistle. Nice wheels. I'll bet that set you back a pretty penny. Wade blinks in surprise as Jasper continues. I guess taking care of animals has its benefits. Much better than saving lives, evidently. I can't believe you just said that, I blurt. Do you have to be so belligerent about everything? Jasper immediately comes back with, I'm not being belligerent, just making conversation. You're the one making a mountain out of a molehill. That's because Drama is her middle name, Renee smirks. Her catty comment comes at me like a red flag being waved at a bull. Luckily, I manage to button my lips before the insults come hurling out. Jasper throws Wade a nod. Hey, man, I meant no harm. Just yanking your chain a little. He flashes a guys-will-be-guys guys grin. No worries, Wade says easily. Great. Now I'm the bad guy. Er, Girl, for opening my big fat mouth. I throw Jasper a look that says drop dead. He gives me a smug grin that lets me know he's intentionally stirring the pot and getting away with it wonderfully. Wade goes around and opens his door, leaving me standing awkwardly by the passenger door, waiting for him to unlock it so that I can get in. Jasper shakes his head in disgust. The instant Wade unlocks the door, Jasper makes a point of opening it for me. He gives me a cocky smirk that says, a real man would have opened your door. I can't argue with Jasper there. My dad wouldn't dream of not opening the door for my mom. He taught my brother to do the same for women. Thanks, I mumble as I get in. You're welcome. Jasper punches out, glaring through the window at Wade, who looks embarrassed. It occurs to me that Jasper opened my door, meaning that he wasn't there to open Renee's. She's standing on the opposite side of the car and has to open her own door. The new car leather smell permeates my senses, reminding me of the awkwardness of my previous date with Wade. We seem to be following the same pattern tonight. I look at Wade's tight expression. 
I don't dare look back at Renee, but I'm sure she's peeved at Jasper. The tension in the car is thick enough to cut. Wade starts the car, and we're off. Jasper peppers Wade with technical questions about the BMW. It does the trick of putting him at ease. Jasper certainly has a way with people. He can be Mr. Congeniality when he wants to be. When the chit-chat about the BMW runs its course, Renee interjects herself into the conversation. I'm surprised you're going to the dance tonight. It takes me a second to realize that she's talking to me. I shift in my seat and crane my neck to look back at her. Why wouldn't I go? Isn't the bakery providing all the sweets? Yes, we are. She gives me a challenging look. You must have a great deal of trust in your employees to handle everything. I do, I say simply. Ellie's fantastic. As soon as I take over as owner, I'm promoting her to manager. I turn back around, my eyes facing the road. However, Renee's not finished. Also, I figured you'd be too torn up over Henry Roach to go to a dance. My body goes tense. Henry would have wanted me to go tonight, I say quietly. Yes, he would have, Jasper pipes in. Renee's voice reeks of innuendo. Did y'all hear that Henry's attorney came in from Mobile to take an assessment of his house? Evidently, Henry had millions of dollars tucked away. Renee laughs. Who would have thought the old Scrooge was actually worth something? That's enough, I bark. I work at a bakery, the hub of gossip. Of course I've heard all about Henry and his supposed wealth. I'm sure it's probably true. After all, he paid my down payment. The speculation has been whether Henry has family and who's going to get his money. The whole thing disgusts me. Henry's value went so much deeper than his money. People like Renee who thrive on hearsay are like buzzards, crowding around to pick the rotting flesh off the carcass. What? Renee asks, her voice going wounded. I was just making conversation. Anger rages hot and furious through my veins as I whip around. I know exactly what you were doing. I grit my teeth, hurling out each word. And I don't appreciate it. Wh what's that? She stutters. You were taking pot shots at Henry to get to me. Renee looks at Jasper her voice trembling. That's not true. Tell her. I look at Jasper, waiting for his reaction. He pushes out a long breath, directing his comments to Renee. It has been tough on Skeet to lose Henry. It's probably better for you not to say anything. That's just like you, Renee harumphs, to take her side. She clamps her arms over her chest and turns away from him to look out the window. I turn back around, realizing that I'm neglecting Wade. How has your week been? I ask him brightly. He looks surprised that I'm talking to him. Fine. I wait for him to expound, but he doesn't. We ride in silence the rest of the way to the town hall where the dance is being held. We follow the long line of cars filing into the parking lot. It's a packed house, Jasper observes. At least someone in the car is making conversation. Are Pan, Memphis, Bo, and Presley still coming together? I ask. Yep, that's the plan, Jasper answers. Albany and Gavin are coming too. That's right, it's their triple date. I can't wait to see Presley. A grin curves my lips. I'll bet Bo's happy to have her home. Jasper chuckles. He's been grinning like a possum all day. 
As we pull into an empty space, I feel a whisper of relief that we're finally here. We can part ways. Jasper and Renee can do their thing. Wade and I can do ours. God, I'm sure it'll be a long and painful night for Wade and me. Oh well, nothing I can do about that now. Let's tag team it, Jasper suggests to Wade. I'll get Skeet's door and you get Renee's. Uh, okay, Wade stammers. Smooth one, Jasper. I can't help but be impressed. Jasper opens my door but doesn't stop there. He reaches for my hand, sending a jolt through me when our skin touches. I step out and expect him to release my hand, but he holds on to it a second longer than necessary. I give him a questioning look. For an instant, I see a piercing longing in his eyes, but it disappears as fast as it came. He lets go of my hand and offers a rueful grin. Have fun tonight. You too. He leans close and murmurs. Watch those cuddle hugs. I gulp out a startled snigger. Our eyes lock as a swift current passes between us. I can't stand being so close to Jasper and yet having him out of my reach. I wish with all of my heart that the two of us were going to the dance together. Wade comes around and holds out his arm. Shall we? Yes, I say, offering him a buoyant smile. I guess I'm a better actress than I thought, because Wade smiles brightly in response. Jasper goes around to Renee. She entangles her arm through his like an octopus. She says something in Jasper's ear, and he throws his head back and laughs in an unencumbered way that only Jasper can. It turns my stomach to watch them, so I don't. I force my attention on Wade. Thanks for being such a good sport about us double dating with Jasper and Renee, I say as we make our way across the parking lot. It's a chilly evening, sending goosebumps over my flesh. I don't mind, he says pleasantly. I figure the more the merrier. I'm not sure how to take his comment. I suppose he means that he's grateful he doesn't have to be with just me. Or maybe he means something else. I don't begin to pretend that I understand the inner workings of Wade Claiborne's mind. It's hard to believe that the two of us actually kissed. In so many ways, he's a stranger to me. We step through the door to find the cavernous room filled to the brim with people. Loud music is booming from the DJ station in front of the stage. We weave our way through the tight clusters of people and over to one of the walls. I look over to the refreshment table that's being manned by Ellie and Phyllis. Wade frowns. I was hoping we could find an open table, but they're all filled. We could dance. I suggest. He looks mortified. I'm afraid I'm not much of a dancer. He winces. Sorry. A shaft of disappointment slides down my throat. No worries. There's nothing worse than being at a dance and not being able to dance. A fast song is playing. I survey the dance floor and spot Bo and Presley dancing. When Presley sees me, her face lights up as she waves. She says something to Bo. A second later, they make their way over to us. Hey, cuz, Presley begins as she throws her arms around me and gives me a bear hug. We pull back as she takes an assessment. Long time no see. I know, I haven't seen hide nor hair of you since you became a big star, I tease. She blushes a deep red as she laughs. Uh, I don't know about that, she says modestly. Don't let her fool you. Bo slides an arm around Presley's shoulders. She's a big deal. He gives her an adoring look. Yeah, yeah, she chimes as the two share an intimate look. 
A few seconds later, Presley blinks when she realizes that Wade is standing beside me. Hey. Hey, he gushes. You look great. Wow, I never knew that Wade could be so enthusiastic. It's comical to see how fast Bo's eyes narrow. Thanks, Presley says nonchalantly, but I can tell that his compliment made her uncomfortable. I used to lament that Wade and Presley were an item back in high school, and thereby making him off limits to me. I guess I should be thanking Presley, because Wade Claiborne is most definitely not for me. Presley delicately slips out of Bo's arm. She takes my hands in hers and searches my face. How you doing? I'm unprepared for the dew that glistens in my eyes. I'm okay, I utter hoarsely. She glances at Wade. Are you with him? Her voice is coated with disapproval. Just for tonight. Relief sweeps over her beautiful face. Good. I talked to Penn. She told me about Jasper and you. I rock back and throw a glimpse at Wade to see if he's listening. Thankfully, he isn't. I figured Jasper and you would be here together tonight, she finishes. No, a deep sadness fills my heart. Jasper and I are just friends. Presley arches an eyebrow. Are you sure about that? I press my lips together and nod in the affirmative. A slow song comes on. Bo hooks an arm around Presley's waist. Let's go dance, babe. Okay. Presley gives me a meaningful look. We need to have lunch soon. We will, I promise. A delicate giggle ripples from Presley's throat as Bo whisks her away. I spot Albany and Gavin, dancing as close together as her round belly will allow. Then I see Penn and Memphis on the dance floor, looking so gloriously happy together that an ache stirs through my body. I turn to Wade. I know you don't like dancing, but it's not hard to slow dance. I could show you a few moves if- The words die in my throat as I take a good look at Wade. The naked yearning in his expression is exactly how I feel. I follow his trail of vision, straight to Colette. She's dancing with some guy I don't recognize. He's handsome and well-dressed. He and Colette make a fine picture. Dry laughter scratches my throat. Aren't we the pair? Wade pulls his eyes from Colette and focuses on me. Huh? You're pining away for her. I make a point of looking at Colette. He gives me a sheepish grin. Guilty as charged. He studies me with perceptive eyes. And you're pining away for him. He looks at Jasper and Renee. My breath catches into a hard ball in the back of my throat as I see Jasper and Renee dancing close together. Her body is melded close to him like melted cheese on toast. I take in a quick breath. Well, the way I see it, we've got two options. We can go out on the dance floor and attempt to make them jealous. Or we can get out of here. A grin stretches over his lips. I say we do the latter. The corners of his lips turn down. How will Jasper and Renee get home? I shrug my shoulders. Not my problem. Wade chuckles. I like the way you think. He motions with his head. Let's go. Oh, first I need to go over and check on the food and my employees. Wade perks up. Can we grab a couple of cookies to go? <laughs> you bet, I laugh. As we're going over to the dessert table, a familiar voice stops me in my tracks. I turn as my mom and dad step up. Hi, honey, 
Mom says as she catches me in a hug. She pulls back, looking me up and down. Wow, you look like a gazillion bucks. <laughs> Thanks. I smile. Where in the world did you get that dress? It's one of Albany's originals. Mom clucks her tongue. It looks like it was made for you. It was, sort of. Albany designed it for me. You look great, too, I say to Mom. She's wearing a gold dress that goes well with her bouncy blonde hair. Dad's wearing a white tux with a black bow tie. The white looks great against his golden brown skin and dark features. My parents have always reminded me of the Hollywood couple Antonio Banderas and Melanie Griffith. She's a daughter of comfort as Southern as a person can get, and Dad holds tight to his Mexican roots. Hey, mija, Dad says, pulling me into a hug. A teasing grin tips his lips as he looks over at the dessert table. I noticed there are no churros. Ha ha, I say dryly. Dad's always razzing me about not carrying churros at the bakery. In his mind, every food establishment should serve churros and tacos, with heavy sides of salsa and guacamole. The fine creases around Mom's eyes deepen as she looks at Wade. Hello, dear. Hi, Mrs. Lopez, he responds cordially. Mr. Lopez? He and Dad shake hands. Mom gives me a questioning look. Where's Jasper? I cut my eyes across the dance floor. Playing pretzel with Renee Keith, I retort, not trying to hide the disgust in my tone. Mom's eyes bulge with concern. Oh, do you need me to go and talk to him? No, thanks, I clip. He seems to be doing just fine. Dad narrows his eyes, his voice going hard. Maybe I should talk to him. Mom and Dad know all about the history between Jasper and me. They know that I've fought against my attraction to him for years. They assumed that in the end I'd come to my senses and realize how I felt about Jasper. Well, I did that. What no one counted on, however, was Jasper running into the arms of another woman. I guess it just goes to show that you can't plan for everything. No need. Wade and I are leaving. A troubled look passes between Mom and Dad. Wade and I aren't really together, I explain. We're partners in the business of broken hearts. I don't understand, Mom says dubiously. Misery loves company, I explain. Wade just got over a breakup. Dad nods. Ah, Gotcha. Y'all have fun, I say glibly as I reach for Wade's hand. Love you both. Love you too, honey, Mom responds, and then shoots Jasper a dark look. I lead Wade over to the dessert table, where we chat with Ellie and Phyllis and load up on cookies. As we make our way out of the dance, I steal another glance at Jasper. His back is to me. I realize glumly that he won't even realize I'm gone. Well, that is until he discovers that he has no way to get home. Jasper will be fit to be tied when he realizes that we left him. Like I told Wade, it's not my problem. Chapter 15 the graveside service for Henry is tastefully simple. The only flowers are the expertly arranged red roses in the spray covering the mahogany casket. As hard as it is to know that Henry is gone, it gives me a sense of peace to see Gladys's grave nearby and to know that she and Henry are now together. A preacher from one of the local churches is conducting the service. He offered a prayer, we sang a hymn, and now he's saying a few words. 
But it's obvious from his impersonal remarks that he didn't know Henry at all. I glance around at the somber faces. Most of the people present are members of the town. To my knowledge, none of them were especially close to Henry. They're probably here mostly out of curiosity. After all, it's not every day that someone dies and people discover that they were a multimillionaire. From what I can tell, the rumors about Henry are true. I guess his gut about buying and selling stocks served him well. Too bad he was wrong about Jasper and me. I glance at Jasper, who's standing tall and stoic beside me. Even though I argued that I didn't need him to go with me to the service, he insisted. He was scheduled to work today, but switched schedules with one of the other firemen so that he could be with me. Ever since the dance, things between us have escalated from tense to downright hostile. We got into a big fight the day after the dance. Like I figured, Jasper was not happy about Wade and me ditching Renee and him. He had to beg a ride home with Bo and Presley. I'm sure that went over like a load of bricks, because Presley doesn't care for Renee any more than I do. I feel eyes on me. I look across the open grave and casket to find a distinguished-looking silver-haired man in an expensive pinstripe gray suit watching me. Jasper must have felt the man's gaze, too, because he steps closer and puts a protective arm on my spine. My senses swirl at being near him. I probably should move away, but I don't have the strength to go there right now. Jasper and I are ticked with one another, but that doesn't stop us from being together. I guess that's how it is with best friends. An image of Renee pressed tightly to Jasper at the dance flashes through my mind. Like my girlfriend said, Jasper and I won't be able to remain best friends forever. Another woman will get in the way. Who am I kidding? A woman already has come between us. A tear slips down my cheek. My sorrow over Henry's death and my frustration at Jasper blend together, pressing a heavy weight on my chest. I'm grateful that I got the chance to know Henry. I wish I could have been a better friend. I wish I could thank him for his generosity to me. The preacher brings the service to a close as the people disperse. The wind picks up, sending chills through me as I pull my coat tighter around me. Are you ready to go? Jasper asks. Give me a minute. He nods as he steps away. I go over to the casket, keeping my eyes fixed on the red, feathery rose petals. Henry, you were one in a million. I utter quietly. A smile pulls at my lips. You might find this hard to believe, but I'll actually miss your grumpiness and your keen wit. A chuckle rises in my throat. I can still see the determined glint in your eyes when you doused Lance Wallace with that water hose. Tears burn my eyes before streaming down my cheeks. I'm sorry, but things aren't working out with Jasper and me. My heart twists. I guess I'll do the only thing I know how to do. Keep breathing in and out and hope that everything will be okay. One breath at a time. I'm glad you're with Gladys now. It's good to see that true love does sometimes win out in the end. I choke back a sob. I'll miss you. Excuse me, miss. A small yelp of surprise falls from my lips. My hand goes over my chest as I whirl around to face the silver-haired man. He offers a polite smile. I'm sorry I startled you. It's okay. I look past the man and see the frown on Jasper's face. He strides toward us in quick steps. I study the man, trying to see if I can detect any resemblance to Henry. Are you Henry's relative? 
The man chuckles as he touches his wire-rimmed glasses. No, I'm his attorney. The one from Mobile? Yes, he extends his hand. I'm Arthur McMillan. I'm pleased to make your acquaintance. My eyes widen at the man's oddly formal speech. Nice to meet you, too. Jasper steps up and drapes an arm around my shoulders. Everything okay? He looks from me to the man. I nod. This is Arthur, Henry's attorney. Nice to meet you, Jasper says. Nice to make your acquaintance, Arthur responds before turning his attention back to me. We have much to discuss. We do? Yes. Is there a good time for us to meet to go over Henry's estate? You must be mistaken. I don't have anything to do with Henry's estate. I hesitate, trying to rein in my emotions. Henry was my friend. A smile fills Arthur's face. Yes, Henry spoke very highly of you. He said you were like a daughter. My throat clogs with emotion. Henry used to tell me that I reminded him of Gladys. He told me that too. I take in a breath. The emotional stress is catching up with me. I want to go home and sleep for the rest of the day. If I didn't have to go back to work, I'd probably sleep tomorrow away too. It was nice meeting you, Arthur. I give him a parting smile. If you'll excuse us. Jasper and I turn away. Wait, Arthur exclaims a hint of frustration in his cultured voice. You don't understand. We turn back around. Understand what? I ask. Arthur seems nice enough, but I really need to go home before I completely lose it. Henry left his entire estate. To you. For an instant, my brain doesn't process the meaning of his words. Then I see the shock on Jasper's face. What? I croak. You are the sole heir to Henry's estate. We need to meet to go over the details. A roaring starts in my head as the ground shifts beneath my feet. I hear Jasper call out my name. My knees buckle, and then I'm out cold. What the aspirin bottle? Are you freaking kidding me? Albany growls as she pushes aside the blinds and peers out. Those idiot reporters have been out there all morning. She balls a fist. I wish I could sock those bloodthirsty sharks in the nose. I don't want to think about the reporters gathered on my doorstep, nor do I want to think about Henry's millions and the changes the money is bound to make in my life. Heck, who am I kidding? My life is already forever changed. Ever since the graveside service yesterday, my parents, Presley, Blakely, Penn, and Albany have all been taking turns staying with me probably because they're afraid I'll flip my gourd. I guess I have been a little unhinged. After I came to with the cemetery, Jasper helped me to his truck. Arthur followed us back to my house. We sat in the living room as Jasper held my hand. Arthur explained that it would take approximately six months for Henry's will to go through probate. I understand that you'll be turning Henry's home into an activity center or outreach program for underprivileged kids, Arthur said, and that you'll build a park in the empty lot beside Henry's home. Henry mentioned walking trails. I guess we'll have to purchase a larger tract for that. That's when the synapses of my brain snapped together. Henry told me that everything would happen in good time. I just had no idea what he was up to. My thoughts go back to Jasper. 
Ever since our meeting with Arthur, Jasper has been MIA. He was supportive, holding my hand while Arthur talked. However, I could tell that the thoughts of me being a millionaire rocked him to the core. It speaks volumes that I haven't heard a peep from him in the past 24 hours. Even when we fight, Jasper can't resist coming around. Tears fill my eyes as I look at Albany. This whole thing is absurd. Why in the heck did Henry leave me his money? Albany tromps over and sits down beside me. Her expression says it all. She thinks I'm a moron. Maybe she's right. Are you listening to yourself? I swipe at my tears with my palms. I know, you think I'm an idiot. She reaches for my hand and squeezes it. You have been given a wonderful gift. Think of all the good you can do. This was never part of my plan. I have no idea what to do with this. I grit my teeth. I've scrimped and saved like a miser to earn the down payment for the bakery loan, and then Henry sent Abigail the money. I bark out a laugh. Now that was a good gift. It's something that I can wrap my head around. I throw up my hands. But this? My voice goes shrill. How in the heck am I supposed to run a bakery and an outreach program? She giggles. You hire people to help you. I chew the inside of my cheek. I guess I could. I press my fingers against the bridge of my nose. I can't even comprehend having millions of dollars at my disposal. I lift my head, swiveling it back and forth. This was never part of the plan, I repeat. That's the beautiful part of life, Albany squeals. The surprises. What would you do if you became an instant millionaire? She looks thoughtful. I guess I'd expand the store, for starters. Done, I say with gusto. Her brow furrows. No, she shakes her head. I won't let you spend your money on me. Why not? I grumble. I'll spend it on you and your store expansion. My brain ticks through the list. I'll pay off Mom and Dad's house and Raoul's college expenses. I'll pay for Penn in Memphis to build his office. I'll send Blakely on an all-expenses-paid cruise to some exotic place. That way, she can forget all about Professor Bonehead. Hold up, Speed Racer. Albany's dark eyes twinkle with mirth. While I admire your generosity, you should take some time and think everything through before making any decisions. It's your money, she says gently. You should spend it wisely or tuck it away. Didn't you say that it'll take six months for the will to probate? I nod. That's good. You need time to sift through everything. It's ironic, isn't it? What? I'm getting the bakery and more wealth than I can shake a stick at. I pause, trying to control the tremble in my voice. And yet I've lost the one thing that I want most. She gives me a sympathetic look. Don't you think it's time for you to tell Jasper how you feel? I tried, I say miserably, but it was too late. He's with Renee now, only because he thinks he can't have you. That's not true, I argue. Oh, yes, it is, she asserts. I've seen the way y'all look at each other. Trust me when I say that Jasper Donaldson is crazy about you. I wrinkle my nose. Intrigued by Albany's words. You think so? Do I dare hope? I know so, she says with conviction. Fear fans my insides. I don't know. I haven't heard from Jasper since yesterday. That's not like him. Maybe he's working. 
He's off today. I saw the look on his face when Arthur McMillan talked about the money. It threw Jasper for a loop. Albany takes in a deep breath. First poor Jasper had to compete with Wade Claiborne, and now he has to come to terms with the fact that you're a multimillionaire. It's a lot to deal with. I sort of feel sorry for him. Well, I don't, I harumph. If Jasper would have kept his mouth shut and let me tell him how I feel about him, we wouldn't be in this mess. I'm sure you're right, Albany laughs. My phone rings. I twist around and retrieve it from the table beside the couch. It's Abigail. Hello, I answer. Skeet, Abigail begins breathlessly. I just heard your wonderful news. Congratulations on your inheritance. Thanks. I guess you won't be needing a loan after all. I'll just send the down payment money back to Jasper. My heart begins to pound. What? Jasper? I tighten my grip on the phone. Is he the one who sent you the money? Abigail lets out a shaky laugh. Oh, drat, I've done it now. I promised Jasper I wouldn't tell you that he sent the money. My mind spins like a merry-go-round. No wonder Jasper looked so surprised when I told him that Henry paid the down payment. I had no idea that Jasper had any money. It probably took him years to amass that amount. And he gave it all up for me? Joy circles through my chest. This has to mean that Jasper cares. I realize that Abigail is speaking. I'll overnight a cashier's check to Jasper. No, I blurt. Confusion sounds in Abigail's voice. I, I don't understand. It'll take six months or more for me to get access to my inheritance. In the meantime, I'll go ahead and get the loan as planned. That way you'll have the money that you need to help Heather and Steve with their house. Uh, okay, that sounds good. We talk for a few minutes before ending the call. What was that about? Albany asks. I cradle the phone in my hands. Jasper's the one who paid the down payment for my loan, not Henry. A giggle rolls from her throat. See, I told you Jasper cares. Urgency mounts inside of me. I've got to call him right now and tell him how I feel. Great idea. My heart feels like it'll pound out of my chest as I look down at my phone. I don't know if I can do this. You can, Albany assures me. Swallowing hard, I punch in his number and hold the phone up to my ear. It rings several times before going to voicemail. I know I should leave a message, but I'm frozen. I just sit there, holding the phone. End the call, Albany hisses as she grabs the phone from my hand and pushes the end button. You've got it bad, she chides with a surly grin. My face goes embarrassingly hot. I know. It's okay she says in a practical tone. I'm sure the words will come when you're with him in person. I hope so, I sigh. Jeez, I'm a hot mess. My phone rings again. Albany's holding it. It's probably Jasper calling you back, she says. My heart jumps into my throat. She makes a face. It's Bo. Why is he calling? She asks in annoyance as she slides her finger over the screen and answers with a curt, Hello? This is Albany, not Skeet, she harumps with a roll of her eyes. A second later, concern masks her expression as she looks at me. Okay, she says tonelessly. We'll be right there. Apprehension clutches me in a tight hold. What's wrong? Bo and Jasper were out hiking. I make a face. Hiking? Since when did the two of them go hiking? She rushes on. Jasper took a fall. Tears spring to my eyes. 
Is he okay? I think so. Bo said it's not serious enough for him to go to the ER, but that Jasper's asking for you. I told him we'd be right over. I jumped to my feet. Okay, let's go. It'll be a nightmare trying to get through those reporters. I jut out my chin. I don't care. Nothing could stop me from getting to Jasper. Albany crinkles her nose. I really don't understand why it's such a big deal for you to drop everything and rush over to Jasper's house. What's Bo trying to pull? He's used to helping people in emergency situations. I'm sure he can handle whatever's ailing Jasper. You know what? I really don't care. Jasper's asking for me. That's all that matters. Albany grins. I guess you're right. The most important thing is for you to tell Jasper how you feel about him. Exactly, I punch out. Determination glitters in Albany's eyes. Okay, our only course of action is to push through those sharks. I sure wish you'd parked your car in the garage. Me too, I chime. But the garage door remote wouldn't work, and I didn't feel like going through the house and opening the door manually. She gives me a pointed look. Well, you can certainly fix that in six months. I suppose I can, I chuckle. I don't point out to her that Jasper normally fixes everything for me. We grab our things and head for the door. You ready? Albany asks as she grasps the knob. As ready as I'll ever be. The second we open the door, reporters charge up the walkway and steps. They press around us, shouting questions. Ignoring them, we keep our heads ducked into our chins and stay close together as we push our way to my Honda. That was gnarly, Albany says when we get into the car. Her eyes are shimmering with excitement. Albany doesn't mind all the hype. In fact, I think she rather enjoys it. For me, it's draining. I start the engine. The reporters are now huddled around the car. They are left with no other choice but to step back when I pull away from the curb and drive off. Chapter 16 Knocking only once, I throw open the door and rush into Jasper's house. I find him sitting on the couch, his foot bandaged and propped up on a pillow. He has a red scratch running along his temple. What happened? I exclaim, hurrying to his side and sitting down on the couch. I place my purse beside me as I angle toward Jasper. I feel both concern for his condition and also relief that it's nothing serious. Bo is lounging in a recliner watching a basketball game. He took a spill off the side of an embankment. Jasper grunts, throwing Bo a heated glare. I look back and forth between them. What's going on with y'all? Nothing worth talking about, Jasper growls. Albany goes over and sits down in the chair adjacent to the couch. We got here as soon as we could. It was a beast getting through those horrid reporters. I watch as Jasper's jaw tightens. Yep, just as I thought. He feels threatened by my wealth. Strangely, his reaction makes me feel better about myself and all of my phobias. Jasper faces everything head on and expects me to do the same. Sometimes it's just tough. How did this happen? Is it your ankle? I sprained it when I fell. Albany says y'all were out hiking? I'm sure the look on my face speaks to my doubt because Jasper smirks. Something like that. He throws Bo another frustrated look. What's going on? I demand. Nothing, Bo says with a blithe grin. Your boy tripped and fell. Regardless of what happened, I'm glad you're okay. My gaze locks with Jasper's. It's the moment of truth. I have to tell him how I feel. My hands start to shake as I clasp them in my lap. 
I glance at Albany, who nods in encouragement. Tell him, she prompts. Jasper turns toward me. Tell me what? Tears press against my eyes. I can't fall apart now. I suck in a breath, willing myself to keep it under control. The truth is, I care about you. Surprise flicks through his brown eyes. What are you saying? He asks carefully. Why is this so hard? My voice cracks. I know I said I just wanted to be friends, but that's a lie. I take in a quick breath before pressing on. I love you, Jasper Donaldson, and I want us to be together, for real. Now that the words are out, I watch him for a reaction. A large smile moves over his lips. You love me? I do. He looks me in the eyes. That's good to know, because I love you back. For a second, I can't believe my ears. You do? I squeak. I do. Laughter bubbles in my throat as tears spring to my eyes. I blink furiously to clear them. Come here, he murmurs. I lean in as our lips connect in an explosion of fire and promise. The only thing that prompts us to pull back is Bo's clapping and hooting. It's about time you turkeys got together. It is indeed. Albany agrees with a large smile. I scoot close to Jasper and nestle into the curve of his shoulder. My skin ripples with pleasure as he strokes circles over my arm. I angle to face him. What about Renee? He blinks in surprise. What about her? Won't she be disappointed? Yeah, I suppose. But she'll just have to get over it. His eyes hold mine in a caress. For someone who wanted to rekindle the old flame, he seems surprisingly unconcerned about Renee. What about the money? Are you okay with that? His expression goes pained. I guess so. Just don't expect me to give up my job or my truck. Laughter tickles my throat. <laughs> don't worry. Jasper's truck looks like it has been through a war, but he thinks it's the greatest thing ever. I think of something else as more moisture rises in my eyes. Hey, he says gently, touching my cheek. No more tears. One escapes and trails down my cheek. I spoke to Abigail. Wariness seeps into his features. Uh-huh. The jig is up. She told me that you were the one who paid the down payment for the bakery. He swears under his breath. She gave me her word that she wouldn't. I know. She let it out by mistake. How in the world did you get that much money? He looks offended. Hey, I know how to save and invest. My heart is filled to the point of overflowing. It means the world that you would do that for me. Concern etches over his handsome face. That's not why you're telling me how you feel, is it? No, of course not. My voice hitches. When Bo called and said that you'd been in an accident, I shake my head. I had one of those moments where my entire life flashed before my face. I knew for certain that I couldn't let another day or moment go by without telling you how I feel. Skeet, Jasper begins. There's something you need to know. Well, folks, this calls for a celebration, Bo pipes in. Maybe I'll call the crew and get them over here. What did you want to tell me? I ask Jasper. He and Bo share a look before Jasper shakes his head. Nothing. My phone rings. I pull away from Jasper as I turn to fish it out of my purse. It's Pan, I announce to everyone. Hello, I exclaim jubilantly. 
Just the person I wanted to talk to. We're all at Jasper's house. I finally told him how I feel about him. I expect her to squeal in delight or hoot and holler. I'm certainly not prepared for the long stretch of silence that follows. My throat thickens with unease. Pen, are you still there? I'm here. Is my brother there? She asks with a bite in her voice. I glance at Bo. Yep, he's there. She blows out a breath. I just talked to Memphis, and he let the cat out of the bag. I frown. What do you mean? I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but you've been set up. My brain fumbles to keep up. Set up? What do you mean? Jasper has been playing you this entire time, and my idiot brother has been pulling the strings. For a second, I sputter to get a breath. I, I don't understand. Jasper has known how you felt about him all along. He never had any intention of getting back together with Renee. He was using her to make you jealous. That's why he insisted that you and Wade double date with him and Renee. That's why he got you to show him some dance moves and why he let Renee hang all over him at the dance. I'm so sorry, Skeet. I had no idea what was going on or I would have put a stop to it. An invisible fist squeezes my stomach, making me feel like I could vomit. Henry went to the fire hall and talked to Jasper. Henry even told Jasper how you felt about him and encouraged him not to give up on you. Humiliation scorches through my veins as I mumble. I've got to let you go. I'm so sorry, Penn says again as I end the call. I whirl around to Jasper. He rocks back. What? That was Penn, I hiss. She told me about your little plan, how you played me. His face falls. It's not like that. Really? I bark as I turn to face Bo. My voice goes shrill as I point with my finger, my words raging. You did this. He holds up his hands, a sheepish grin tipping his lips. Everybody needs a little push. I was getting tired of watching you friend zone Jasper and figured I needed to level the playing field. What did you do? Albany demands. My words tumble out as I rehash everything that Penn just told me. When I'm done, fire blazes from Albany's dark eyes. Bo oh, Primrose, this is low even for you. You had no right to interfere. I was only trying to help. Yeah, like how you helped me off an embankment, Jasper mutters. What? I screech, turning to Jasper. He pushed you off the embankment? Jasper's jaw hardens. Sure did. He called and asked me to go and see a piece of property that he and Presley are thinking about buying. The next thing I know, he pushed me off an embankment. Oh, come on, Bo protests. It was just a little shove. Quit your whining. It got your woman here, and she told you how she feels about you. He sticks out his chest. Y'all should be thanking me. I have a good mind to slap you into next week, Albany fumes. I feel sick at heart. I turn to Jasper. Everything that happened was a lie. He pushes out a heavy breath, his eyes shadowing with regret. Not everything. I do love you. He gives me a pleading look. Don't let Bo's shenanigans ruin everything. You're a big boy, I fire back. Bo Primrose didn't make you do anything you didn't want to do. I can't stomach the fact that I've been made a fool of. I think of how insanely jealous I was when I thought Jasper and Renee were getting back together. It caused me so much turmoil during an already stressful time. He presses his lips together. You're right. What? I shout. You're right, he repeats dully. It was wrong of me to go along with Bo's plan. 
I had no right to play with your emotions, and I had no right to give Renee false hope that we were getting back together. His eyes hold mine. Skeet, I've loved you for a long time. I love your quirks, how you mix up your words, and how you're afraid of your own shadow. Am not, I bark. A humorless laugh drops from his lips as he runs a hand through his hair. Truth be told, I had a crush on you way back in the day we played Truth or Dare. When we kissed, I freaked and didn't know how to handle it, so I gave you the cold shoulder all those months. I had no idea my actions would cause you to develop a fear about us. A sad smile tugs at his lips. Shame on me for not being straight with you from the get-go. Shame on me for tricking you into loving me. Pain deepens his eyes. I've been lying to you and to me. I never wanted you as a best friend. I wanted you as a partner. His voice grows hoarse. I need someone who will love me fully and completely as I love her. Someone who's not afraid to embrace the future, be it uncertain. Henry did come and talk to me. I should have told you. He shakes his head, a somber grin forming over his face. He said he had a gut feeling about us. He told me to be patient, that you'd eventually come around. He takes in a breath. I'm tired of waiting, Skeet. I shouldn't have to trick a woman into loving me. You had no right to toy with my affections. Tears blur my vision as I tuck my purse under my arm and get to my feet. My head is on fire. All I can think about right now is getting as far away from Jasper Donaldson as I possibly can. I'm sorry, Skeet. For everything. I hope one day you can forgive me. I stumble out with Albany walking fast beside me. Men, she fumes as we storm out the door. Let me get this straight. You find out that Jasper paid the down payment on your loan, Blakely holds up a finger, and he told you that he's loved you for years and you just walked out? It wasn't like that. I say in defense as I look to Albany for help. Tell her. It wasn't like that. Exactly. Blakely peers over her glasses. Exactly how was it? I throw my hands into the air. You would have had to have been there. When Penn called and told me everything that happened, I kind of went nuts. Bo and Jasper had no right to play you, Pan asserts. You just wait till I get a hold of my brother. She holds up a fist. I'll wring his neck. Get in line, Presley interjects. I look at Presley. How in the world can you stand to be with a guy who's so dang infuriating? A secret grin curves Presley's lips. I'll admit that Bo's a handful but he's kind of like the bad habit you never want to break. Ew, Blakely says, her expression going sour. I guess we'll have to take your word for it. We're all camped out in my living room. Albany gets up from the couch and pads over to the window. She lifts a slat of the blinds. The sharks are still circling, she announces. She touches her stomach. Anyone up for ice cream? Penn chuckles. At the rate you're going, you're gonna turn into a carton of ice cream. Albany throws her a cheeky grin. I figure I might as well take full advantage of the situation while I'm pregnant. After the baby's born, I'll be living off of baked chicken and lettuce. You could always follow Skeet's lead and clog the calories off, Blakely smirks. I throw her a scorching look. You're just being overly sensitive because you think I'm bagging on your brother. She raises an eyebrow. If the shoe fits, Penn holds out her hand. Down, girls. Let's not turn on each other. 
we need to take an assessment of the situation. After I get some ice cream. Eagerness lights Albany's face. You have any chunky monkey? Nope. Sorry. All I have is vanilla, but we have lots of toppings. I guess I'll have to make do. Albany sighs as she shuffles out of the living room. Penn grins and says in a low tone, Anyone else notice that she's starting to waddle? Shh, Blakely cautions. She'll hear you. You don't want her to think you're poking fun at her. I lift an eyebrow. Oh, so now you're playing the sensitive card? You certainly don't mind chomping me to bits. That's because you're being so ridiculous about my brother, she sniffs. He started it, I retort. Anyone else want some? Albany calls over her shoulder. I'll have a bowl, I say as I get up and follow Albany to the kitchen. After our bowls are filled, we return to the living room. Okay, Penn begins. Time to talk turkey. She zeroes in on me. Do you love Jasper? I had just taken a large bite of ice cream, chocolate fudge, and nuts. It goes down the wrong pipe as I cough, trying to clear my throat. Yes, I squeak when I manage to make a noise. Penn nods in satisfaction. Here's the deal. I told you about what Bo and Jasper did because I wanted you to have all of the information. I put down my spoon, not sure where Penn's going with this. You have to admit that Jasper went to great lengths to prove his love for you, Penn continues. He manipulated me, I seethe. Yes, Penn acknowledges. He did, but his heart was in the right place. I agree, Blankley says decisively. Penn looks at Albany. Back me up here, Albany nods. Okay, I'll admit, it was big of Jasper to make the down payment on your loan. Don't forget that he did it anonymously, Blakely adds. He did make a grand gesture, Presley agrees. I roll my eyes, anger surging up my chest. Y'all are forgetting a key point here. All eyes watch me intently waiting for me to expound. I plunk my bowl down on the coffee table. The ice cream has lost its savor. Jasper said that he's tired of waiting, that he shouldn't have to trick a woman into loving him. I try to hold back the tears, but it's no use. They spill out and run rivers down my cheeks. Oh, good goobity do, Albany exclaims. When are you going to stop taking every peep that flows out of Jasper's mouth as his final word? My jaw goes slack. Huh? He was upset, Albany growls. People say things they don't mean. I wipe at my tears. So you think I still have a chance? My voice sounds small in my own ears. A low, throaty chuckle sounds in Albany's throat. Girl, she trills, open your eyes. The guy's wild about you. She gives me a penetrating look. The question you should be asking here is what are you willing to do to get him back? Chapter 17 One Week Later You ready? Presley asks, giving me a sidelong glance. Yep, one breath at a time, I tell myself as I look up at the sky, thinking of Henry. I guess your gut was right all along. Huh? Presley asks. Never mind. My nerves are jumping like a pack of rabbits. Every fear I've ever had is raging in my head, but I refuse to give in to them. I keep my focus firmly fixed on the one thing I want more than anything else. Jasper. Holding the white cake box in a firm grip, I force my feet to keep moving forward as I go in through the double glass doors of the fire station. If I'm to make a grand gesture, 
I figure it needs to be huge. I'm glad that Presley is beside me to offer moral support. You've got this, she reassures me. Bo said he'd meet us in the waiting area. There he is. Presley's face lights up like a Christmas tree as Bo steps up and gives her a hug and kiss on the lips. You got the goods? He asks. Presley holds up her box. Sure do. I give Bo a warning look. You'd better not have breathed a word of this to Jasper. He makes a zipping motion over his lips. It was against my better judgment to include Bo in my plan, but Presley assured me that all would be well. He motions with his head. This way, ladies. Jasper's in the gym, getting a workout. We follow Bo through the main living area where several of the other firemen from Jasper's platoon are watching TV. We say hello as we move on past. Maybe my imagination is working overtime, but from their expressions of amusement, I get the feeling that they know exactly why I'm here. Presley must be thinking the same thing because right before we go into the gym, she gives Bo a sharp look. Did you tell your buddies about Jasper and Skeet? No, he says, but I can tell from his busted expression that he did. Bo Primrose, Presley blusters. What am I gonna do with you? He eyes her with affection. Just love me, I guess. Presley turns into a puddle of goo as Bo leans over and locks lips with her. Yuck. Seriously? Bo, you better not have breathed the word to Jasper. He holds up three fingers in a salute. Scout's honor. My chest squeezes. For a second, I feel like I can't breathe. I take a breath in through my nose and hold it for a couple of beats before pushing it out hard through my mouth. I do this several times, feeling slightly better. Bo jerks his thumb toward the gym door. We'd better get her in there and do the deed before she hyperventilates. Stop, Presley warns, shoving his arm. My head swims with dizziness as we step into the gym. The smell of sweat and testosterone rolls over me. My breath freezes in my throat when I spot Jasper. His back is to us, and his shirt is off. My eyes go to the damp curls on the nape of his neck before trailing over his strong shoulders and exquisite back muscles. Even though the gym is air-conditioned, heat blasts over me. Jasper is the only one in the gym. He's sitting on a bench, lifting large barbells over his head. Hey, Bo calls. You have a visitor. Jasper lowers the barbells to the floor and turns. When he sees me, his eyes widen. By unspoken consent, Bo and Presley move away to give us some space. Jasper reaches for a towel and blots his face. He stands up, tosses the towel onto the bench, and strides over to me. I notice that he still has a slight limp, but his ankle is no longer bandaged. A goofy grin wobbles over my lips. Hey, I say in a voice that's ten times too cheerful. Skate, what are you doing here? I try not to gawk at his defined pecs or six-pack. Instead, I force my eyes to his face. Jasper and I haven't spoken a word since our fight. He looks at the white box in my hands. What's that? I square my jaw. I've been doing some thinking. Amusement rims his chocolate eyes in gold. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I sigh. I'm done with letting fear rule my life. Surprise zips over his features as I plow on. I'm tired of overthinking every little step. Mostly I'm tired of overthinking us. Remember what Blakely said about how all it takes to ruin a relationship is weddings, lace, and cake in the face? Yeah, he answers warily. Well, I figure I'd skip to the chase. 
A low chuckle sounds in his throat. You mean cut to the chase. A smile quivers on my lips. Whatever. I actually didn't fumble that word. Jasper said he thinks it's endearing when I mix up my words, so I figured I'd milk it for all it's worth. So, I say in a loud tone, in honor of making my grand gesture, here goes nothing. I lift the lid of the box. He steps closer and looks in. A puzzled expression overtakes his handsome face. You made me a wedding cake? Us a wedding cake. I lift the cake from the box and toss the box to the side. I spent all morning long decorating this. It's something. The corners of his lips quiver like he's about to burst out laughing. The way I see it, if we get the hard stuff over with now, then it'll be smooth sailing from here on out. Before I can chicken out, I take the cake and shove it into his face. What? what the crap? He blusters as he wipes the white cake and frosting from his mouth and eyes. It drips down his bare chest and puddles at his feet. I love you, Jasper Donaldson. I think I might have loved you even longer than you loved me. Tears wet my eyes. You're my best friend in the world. I can't think of anything better than spending the rest of my life with you. That is, if you'll have me. A smile stretches over his face. Did you just throw cake in my face and ask me to marry you? You betcha. Skeet Lopez, you are the craziest, most amazing woman I've ever met. I'd be honored to marry you. In a quick movement, he bends down and scoops up a big mound of cake. But first, I shake my finger. Oh, no. I try to dart out of his reach, but he's faster. He encircles my waist and pulls me to him. Then he smashes the cake in my face and rubs it in. I cough and laugh as I gulp, ingesting a large amount of cake and frosting in the process. A second later, his lips find mine as we share a sweet and sticky, breathless kiss. Wait, Presley says, stepping up to us. There's more. Jasper keeps his arms fixed around my waist. I try not to think about how I'm pressed close against his bare chest, with my hands resting on his muscular shoulders. Presley opens the lid of her box. Jasper's eyes go round as he peers inside. You bought a puppy? We bought a puppy, I say meaningfully. I told you, I'm all in. He searches my face. Are you sure about this? I've never been surer about anything in my life. His eyes sparkle with mirth. Are you scared? Petrified. I give in to the smile stretching over my lips. That's my skeet, he murmurs. A joyous expression overtakes his rugged face as he twirls me around and hoots. We're all in. He stops and peers into my eyes. I love you, Skeet Lopez. His fierce emotion gets me every time. With Jasper, there's no in-between. We'll spend the rest of our lives fighting hard and loving hard, and that's all right with me. I love you too. A crooked grin lifts a corner of Jasper's mouth. I guess old Henry's gut was right after all. I suppose it was. I laugh. Don't forget me, Bo pipes in. I'm the one who brought y'all together. Shut up. Jasper and I say simultaneously as we lean in for another kiss. This has been Weddings, Lace, and Cake in the Face, Good Girls Don't Come Last, written by Jennifer Youngblood, narrated by Lori West, 
Copyright 2022 by Jennifer Youngblood. Production copyright by Jennifer Youngblood.